It's all so jover, just come over, hop into the stream at twitch.tv slash Hasanabi. Live almost every day from sunny West LA, I'll cover daily news. So tune in now, see what I have to say. Blast off, blast off. If you're unhinged, prepare to take a week off.
Chatter get don't ban him mods. There are new pets. Show me the light and set me free from this black pill reality. Can I find hope? Can I debate for this top of the hour break? Boss makes a dollar and I only make a dime. That's why I watch the stream. When I'm on company time, boss makes a dollar and I only make a dime. That's why I watch the stream when I'm on company time like now. I'm probably in the chat right now. Everybody. I hope everyone's having a fantastic evening, fantastic afternoon, fantastic pre-noon, no matter where you are in the world, I'm Hassan Piker, and this Dawson of Rock is coming to you live from sunny but cold California, Los Angeles, that was hospitaled by Cam Carduzian. Right, folks, I'm live and alive, and I hope all the boys, girls, and MBs are having a fantastic one, because today's a beautiful day, today's a wonderful day. Folks, today's a very special day. Same time in a fucking week. It's the same time, same fucking space, same old attitude, right? It's a fucking Tuesday, lads. It's a fucking Tuesday. And you know what that fucking means, right? Because every Tuesday we gather, we get together, right? Every Tuesday. And we decide collectively, it's, it's not just any other Tuesday. Every fucking Tuesday is Tuesday News Day. But beyond the fucking Tuesdays, lads, which this one is a beautiful one, particularly beautiful, is Tuesday, January 9th, 2024. It's right in the fucking new year. We're nine days in. It's a particularly important Tuesday, though. Because today... Today, ladies and fucking gents, today we do a fucking heist. That's right. And what are we stealing? The fucking Constitution. Yeah, that's right. Donald Trump, the president, has informed me that we're stealing a fucking Constitution and we're making sure that he's God King President, yeah? We got the fucking, we got the fucking irons, right? We got the fucking blickies. I'm British, don't even know what to fucking do with this. But I got Tony Two Tone by my fucking side, yeah? And he's gonna be fucking the wheel man. He's the wheel man. I'm the muscle. We're going in, we're still in the fucking constitution, and we're taking it and we're bringing it back to fucking England, yeah? That's right. It's me, Boris Johnson, and Donald fucking Trump, yeah? That's right. It's fucking Tuesday. Anyway, what's up, folks?
Newsday Tuesday. And I'm fired up. Kind of tired. Whoa. I fucked up the camera a little bit with that. The camera was like, I can't handle all that crime. The camera was like, what are you doing then? Are you confessing to crimes again? What are you doing then, Hank? Um, you survived the purge? Yeah, I did. Uh, Twitter purge happened today. We'll talk about that. But anyway, listen. Um, not much going on in my life. Other than when I found out that the, the Hasidic Jewish community has a tunnel system. Not even a tunnel system, really, but like just a tunnel in general. And I just haven't stopped thinking about the tunnel. I'm not going to lie. The tunnel thing is so cool. It actually impacted me in a very deep way. Normally, I have like... Normally, I have takes. I have takes for everything. And this was one of those instances where I was just like, I'm so taken aback. I have no take on this. It's so fucking funny. Like... It's just the funniest thing that could have happened. Biggest news out since October 7th. Yeah. It, like, homies love going to... They love going to, to, to the synagogue so bad that they were like, during COVID, we have to go. So they built a tunnel system. And it's just like, the way that it's played itself out in New York is so funny. They were probably trafficking stuff. Like what, dude? The fucking Torah? What are you talking about? These guys don't do shit. I mean, they're like weird for sure. And super religious and, and kind of gross with how fundamentalist they are. But they're not like doing drugs or anything. They're fucking... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the fuck were they be... What were they be trafficking? I feel like, <laughs> I feel like you can say like, yeah, sure. Uh, it, it's a very odd situation, but like the one thing you can't say about the, the, the Hasidic Jewish community, uh, is that they're like doing crazy stuff, like trafficking anything. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> they're the, I mean, they're kind of, they can get a little annoying, especially like, depending on the, the the messianic ones who, like, will come up to you if they suspect you of being Jewish and will be like, hey, do you feel like converting back to, like, real Judaism? But that's, like, different. <laughs> hey, you look Jewish. You want to convert to real Judaism and not the fake one that you're believing in because you are a reformist or whatever? But, like, other than that... The real reasons are probably so dumb and boring, like the city is condemning that and then and doesn't want them getting hurt. No, that's that's precisely what it is. Yeah. Benny Safdie definitely used Hassan Piker 2022 wardrobe inspo for the curse, I think. This hurts me deeply, especially because he's friends with the Chapo boys. Which means that like, there is a likelihood that he saw my fits and found them to be gross and then developed a character and was like, I'm going to use those gross ass fits for that character. Anyway, um, we'll be talking about the tunnels. Don't worry. Okay. Um we'll be we'll be talking about the tunnels. The defense sector is coom cancer. I saw it was built like six months ago to a mikvah, a holy women's bath. Wait, what? Yeah. 
Anyway, anyway, have you read Berserk? Uh, no, I have watched Berserk though. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh my God, there's really not much going on. I just I just went on a big ass structured walk this morning. You know. Um, Kaya was being a good girl. And that's pretty much it. That's like, that's all that's going on in my life. We got dizzled last night. I don't know if you guys saw that. Some of you saw it. Some of you probably missed it. But we had the dizzler on who dizzled the shit out of us. He does a little too close to the sun, to be honest. Um, greatest interview I've ever conducted, I think. Um, better call Saul updates? Like, nothing. I got nothing. I've just been... I've just been sleeping, dude. He dizzled his way into our hearts. Apparently, it was getting too close to the women's bathhouse, and they wanted it closed off, and some kids broke into the synagogue. Oh, my God. I can't wait to learn more about the story. It's just like, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Yes, chatters. We are going to be talking about the tunnels, okay? Yes. Uh, obviously, it's a hilarious funny story it is the funniest story i'm surprised at how much i like the dizzler the drizzler yeah he was like i said surprisingly well balanced he was just uh surprisingly well adjusted Lloyd Austin was and is getting treated for prostate cancer. Aw. Okay. That's a bummer, I guess. Uh, can you talk about the farmer's protest in Germany and why the right is all over so hot for it? Because everything is aesthetics. Like, farmers... Farmers are real working class. All right? No matter what their demands are. Even if their demands are like, no, we have to be doing more climate change. Like, if we don't do some more climate change, I will fucking kill myself, yeah. Like, because I feel like that's 90% of, like, farmers' gripes is like, why am I not getting more subsidies and why cannot, why can I not do more, more of the climate change? And they'll be like, dude, what are you farming? We're German. Like, are you farming car parts? Like, what the fuck's going on? And they'll be like... Listen, you don't understand it. It is for me and my consumption only. I love to do the climate change. We need it. I am actually a farmer of the climate change. I need to do more of the anthropo <laughs> anthropogenic climate change. Yeah. Like, that's how I imagine the back and forth between... Uh, the German government and the German farmers. Like, the German government's like, no, the farmers don't do this. Don't do this. No, farmers. <laughs> Your beer too strong, farmer. Your cousin too sexy, farmer. Don't do it. They'll kill you, farmers. German farmers, they'll kill you. And then the German farmers are like, nein, I love farming. I don't know what I'm farming at all. I'm just farming the beer and sauerkraut. This <laughs> If I don't stop the sauerkraut farming, who will have the sauerkraut? No one. <laughs> yeah, no, I, is that a thing? Your cousin too sexy, I should have said. <laughs> your cousin too big. <laughs> you, your cousin too muscular and big. No farmer. Your cousin Helga too sexy. Your dick too fat, German farmer. <laughs> farmers are a part of the peasant class as a section of the working class but it has many particularities especially in relation to the proletariat in some ways they're opposites despite being equally revolutionary but in different contexts no i mean first of all farmers are a part of the peasant class is such a funny attitude to have because like we are not talking about like subsistence farming or or peasantry at all like these guys have machines you know what i mean they have capital they get a shit ton of subsidies from the government <laughs> they're not like if anything they're closer to a small business owner in many places nowadays but 
That's classic intellectual versus working class leftist infighting. Yeah, except, and I'll stand on this. I'll stand on this business, okay? <laughs> Most of, like, a Starbucks worker is more of a worker than a farmer is, okay? In the classic proletarian sense. So I apologize for those who don't know that, but, like, a lot of the big business owners themselves aren't necessarily getting down in the gutter. <laughs> like, there are workers working at the farms. It's just not usually the farmers. Like, if you think that... At least in America, when we're talking about, like, agricultural output, if you think that, like, the Guatemalan migrant workers that are fucking picking all of the avocados and shit, if you think those guys are, like, we have to do more climate change, then you're out of your mind. Anyway. Can you quickly give me the citation to the international law that allows a resistance against settler terrorists? My friend, what's happening? Google it yourself, please. Most farmers never have generational wealth and automate their farms, which is insane to think about. I mean, you do still have like a lot of business owned, owned and operated business owner farmers for sure. So. <sighs> Can you quickly prove that your moral opposition to murdering babies is supported by international law? Wait, what? Buy me a pack of smokes or you're not a real socialist. Yes, uh, there's no part of international law that says you can murder babies. So if that's what you're looking for, you're not going to find it in there. Unless we're talking about abortion. That's right. We love murdering babies around these parts. It's called getting an abortion. Plant Parenthood, very valid, very cool. We love doing baby murder when it's abortion. Not no baby murder under international law unless it's abortion. Aborabos, baby, for everybody. Remember, this community raised like 60 grand to get more people to do abortions. And it wasn't even about like access to reproductive health measures or anything. It was straight up like I'm doing the exact opposite of like the family planning centers do where I tell women, white women specifically, in loving relationships that... Uh, if they want to carry their pregnancy to term, that they mustn't do that, and they should do drugs instead and also get on welfare. That's my plan. That is what I've started. I put my money where my mouth is. That's what I've been advocating for, and I will continue advocating for it until the day I die. That's right. Anyway. Anyway, new Aaron Rodgers crank, COVID crank interview, baby. Let's go. Um, Brother, we're not even an hour into the stream. We are 29 minutes into the stream. I haven't even blasted off, and I'm popping off, okay? On that note, let's blast off, okay? Let's do it. Farmer protests, question mark. These actions will result in more fetal alcohol syndrome podcasters. I have to sneeze. Oh, God. <coughs> Holy moly. Okay. Tunnels in New York. Judge asks if president can order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a rival. Can I just say, I didn't go to Harvard. I'm not a big city lawyer, but this is exactly the argument I made yesterday. And now it's like you got judges making that argument. All I'm going to say is, apparently you don't have to be that fucking brilliant to be able to conduct arguments, okay? To craft arguments like that. That's all I'm saying. Your takes are too hot. Your reacts are too good. They're going to ban Exactly. They're going to ban me.
Bomber protests. Tunnels in New York. Okay. Um, Trump immunity case heats up. Can he kill? And more drama news. High intensity reacts. Get in now. All right, that's a good one. The idea would never bomb the Hasidic terror tunnels. And they're not the Hasidic terror tunnels. You mentioned you get regular death threats. I work in mental health care and get regular death threats, but recently got some very specific ones. And I wonder how you cope slash deal with them. Wait. You're working in mental health care and you're asking me how to give you advice on how to deal with death threats? What the fuck is going on? <laughs> Brother, you're supposed to... You're supposed to help me. No? Isn't that how that works? Do you think you'll ever blast off anywhere else? Will Twitter ever actually die? Yes, there's a high likelihood that uh, Twitter might die. Especially if Elon Musk does stuff like he did yesterday. Like last night, which we'll talk about as well. Twitter bans... Um, bans leftists. Critics of Israel plus Bill Ackman. Um, but anyway, as far as, uh, as far as helping you out chatter with the death threats is, I guess this is a kind of dumb thing to say. But, like, like none of them are real. Okay? <laughs> none of them are real. Like, most people... Think about it this way. Okay? Here's what I have to tell you about death threats. So, most people that issue a death threat online is, like, very rarely ever leaving their homes. Okay? They're... It's like the most agoraphobic type of person who's like severely mentally ill that is uh, deeply sad and 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 is like like if they were going outside and touching grass, which is like required to kill you, right? If they were going outside and touching grass, then like magically they would no longer want to do a death threat. So some of them are definitely real, lol. I just had a participant fuck up a staff and broke their occipital, uh, occipital lobe. Yes. Okay, well, that depends. Are you getting the death threats directly from people who you are in the immediate vicinity of? Um, that's usually my mentality is like, even if they are real, actionable death threats, I'm going to act like they're not real because I don't want it to fuck my day up. So I just kind of avoid thinking about it. I don't want to think, I don't want to talk about it any further without revealing stuff, but I'll just say that. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> this is a, <laughs> some chatter saw this ancient copy pasta and got very upset. Please open this dude's chat because what in the fuck? This is a copy pasta chatter. Hello, Hassan. I am an inconspicuous follower here and I've been watching you for some time. I've been a psychologist for about five years specializing in mental disabilities. You're currently in the middle phase. Like, you read this and you thought this was a good copypasta chatter that freaked out over this? Like, you read this copypasta and you thought this was a serious guy? I mean, he said middle phase. Like, what psychologist... First of all, he's not even saying he's a psychiatrist. He's saying he's a psychologist. So the person who wrote this doesn't even understand the distinction. That's number one. Number two... Okay, I guess like psychologists specializing specializing in mental dis disability is one thing, but the middle phase. What do you think the middle phase would be? It's a middle phase. 
I'm a psychologist and you're in the middle phase. It's a very real problem. The middle phase of your mental illness. <laughs> I am the German psychologist. It's a phase in the middle. It's famous. If you're not a psychologist, please don't comment on middle phases. Yeah. Anyway, um, as far as death threats goes, okay, the one thing you can do is uh, prepare yourself against possible stuff like that. You know what I mean? But more importantly than anything else, what I would suggest is not really thinking about it. Because the reality is, if it happens, it happens, and GG's. Uh, and, and if it doesn't happen, then it's better not to think about it. That's my, that, that's my unironic advice for death threats for as someone who is a recipient of many every single day. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, that's my, that's my real, very real advice. Now, obviously I'm not, unlike you, I'm not a mental health professional. So maybe this advice isn't good. Maybe it's not sound. I don't know. But for me in particular, that's what I do. I don't think about it. I don't talk about it. I usually just don't have it in my mind at any given point because I don't want to bring the vibes down. You know what I mean? I don't want to bring the vibes down. I like the vibes when I'm not thinking about it. And if I were to be thinking about it regularly, I wouldn't like the vibes at all. Not everyone was a 6'5 hunk like you. Well, that's the other thing. It's like, what am I supposed to do as a 6'5 guy? Uh, fucking, do you think being 6'5 allows you to be bulletproof? No. Anyway, typical unmedicated middle phaser waving a firearm like a maniac. Yeah. That's also another that's also another common aspect of being in the middle phase of mental illness. <laughs> All right. Anyway, blast off everybody. When Hassan asks a question, someone in chat has to answer, it's the law. Yeah. Well, or more so when I say something, chat has to at least half of chat has to be contentious. Even if they have been a ride or die supporter of that same principle in perpetuity. Like, you could have, you could have like, uh, I don't know, Jets fans in here. And I'd say something nice about the Jets and they'd turn on their own team. And they'd be like, you're actually so wrong about the Jets. Jets is, uh, they're, they're awful. You should have done an East German RP. Being a Jets fan is in the middle phase. Being a Jets fan is in the final phase of being uh, the, the worst kind of mentally ill. Like the bad kind. Not even the cool kind. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. All right. Um, where were we? Oh, Scoop. Rumble Inc., by the way, which builds itself as a free speech alternative to YouTube, is home to shows hosted by Donald Trump Jr. and Stephen Crowder, is the subject of Security and Exchange Commission investigation. Uh-oh. Joe Brandon coming after uh, brave right-wing entrepreneurs again, dude. From Chabotnik group chats. Okay, that's a, that's he's memeing. That's an ancient. Dude, dude, everyone's having so much fun with this because we have a limited bandwidth to be able to make fun of the, of the, 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 what is it? Are they, what's the term? What's the appropriate term? I don't know if it's like Hasidic. Is it Haredi? Is it, uh, is it Orthodox? Hasidic? Yeah. We have a very limited time frame to make fun of the Hasidic tunnels before all of the fucking, before all the anti-Semites get to it. And then you can no longer say it without like, you know, people unironically being like, ooh, that's, are you, what's going on there? And I feel like because it's Chabad, yeah, I feel like because Twitter is so intensely, Twitter is so intensely anti-Semitic, 
that like you can't have any fun. You just can't. You can't have any fun whatsoever. What is this? Hollaback boy. Today we released a raw footage of a military themed European cursor. Oh my god, dude, please. Okay, okay. I'm gonna start off. I'm gonna start off with. I'm gonna start off with the with the with the Hasidic uh tunnel memes because it is occupied an inappropriate uh in an in inappropriate space in my mind since I saw it. Okay. These anti the anti Semites have gotten to it. There are Twitter posts saying these are child trafficking tunnels. <laughs> child trafficking tunnels. Wait, what the fuck? From TikTok deleted all the posts? Stop. What is happening? Or did they? No. No. That's crazy. Does anyone have? Does anyone have the video? Does anyone have the juice? Please. Please give it to me. I need to watch it. And I need to. I need to to cherish it and I need to share it with you. That sucks, dude. No. You got to have this. Okay, True and posted this one. No, I need all of it. I need all of it. Oh, no. This is just... No, this is just... No, I need the videos. Oh, they have the videos. Oh, thank God. Okay. Okay, let's get started. So, uh, so earlier yesterday, the NYPD get a call. Okay? Apparently, they get a call because uh, there is... Uh, <laughs> I guess, like... There's some stuff happening inside of uh, one of the uh, one of the the wonderful uh, uh, Hasidic communities in in New York. That wait, what? See, bro, this is what I mean. Like, this is a Nazi, bro. What the fuck is this? Like, this dude is a straight up Nazi. The per oh god, gross, gross. Gross, gross, ew, 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 ew. Let me explain something to you, okay? Oh, God, immediately these fucking pieces of shit are just like, oh, these guys are rats, ugh, gross. The real rat is the motherfucker who posts shit like that, okay? So the state found out about these tunnels like six months ago and said they were going to shut them down. So there's like a couple different, uh, there's a couple different uh, things that I've heard. There's a couple different things that I've heard about like what they're for. Um, some, one of the original speculations was that it was created specifically to sneak in to the, to the, the, the Habat, Right. To sneak into the Chabad while, uh, you know, COVID restrictions are happening. So that was number one. And if you recall, this was a big deal in 2020. Like Jonah Cornblue, who now loves posting about uh, the most Zionist uh, stuff, was like the uh, original uh, Orthodox uh, Jewish journalist that was investigating and kind of like leaking uh, how much the, the Orthodox Jewish community in New York was... Uh, refusing to one vaccinate themselves and also uh participate in the uh lockdowns right so i think like originally they built the tunnels so they could sneak in there but then but then the other thing i found out is that like they actually were just like kind of illegally building the tunnels Illegally building the tunnels. I heard that someone, so I heard somewhere that they were saying that it was built six months ago only, right? So that doesn't work with the COVID tunnel situation. But here, uh, let's just read this article. The iconic wooden panels in the main shul of the 770 Eastern Parkway were torn off by aggressive Bokhurim on Monday 
in response to a cement truck being ordered to seal off their unsanctioned tunnel. Chaos ensued in the main shul of the 770 Eastern Parkway in Crown Heights on Monday afternoon, disrupting the davening and learning that take place there around the clock. Okay? The trigger, a cement truck. Is this the davening? The da, da, is that, I don't know how to say it, but this is the, the, the Talmud thing, right? Like you're supposed to, you don't read the Talmud, but you like learn it, right? Is that what it is? The davening? Is that what they're talking about? Or is this a different thing? Or is it just like praying? Like you're not. Okay, davening is basically just praying. Okay, and learning. So, uh, the trigger was a cement truck. The truck showed up on Union Street behind Lubavitch World Headquarters with the apparent assignment to fill up an underground tunnel that ran from the main shul to the now-closed Mikva building next door. Okay, Bochurim, mostly from Israel and wearing the mezikist yarmulkes and pins, responded with fury. They have been reportedly behind the digging of the tunnel, claiming it was to expand 770 visited by residents and visitors on a daily basis. They proceeded to tear down the iconic wooden panels that wrapped the walls of the main shul. Then they tore down the wooden beams that used what appeared to be a hammer to break the shul's brick wall. The result is a very visible opening from the main shul to the tunnel. Officers of the NYPD were seen entering 770 to survey the developments, but have not made arrests. The main shul of 770 has long been subject to a legal dispute between the Agudas uh, Hasidei Chabad and the Marcos Linyonai I can't. I, Hinuk and Kong. Lubovich, Inc., over who is the rifle owner of the 770-788 Eastern Parkway Complex. Bokhurim have long had free reign in the main shul, even violently barring some from entering. Update, the shul was closed after the Gaboim and Mercos both agreed to ask the NYPD to shut the shul due to immediate danger. I think they tore it down because they, like, wanted to sit in it as, like, protest. That's what I got. That's what I understood from the story. But maybe I'm wrong. I My point is this. Okay, here's what I here's what I think. I think fellas should be allowed to build a little bit of a tunnel. I think ladies should be allowed to build a little bit of a tunnel. Okay? Now some tunnels are made for bad reasons. I don't know if these tunnels were made for bad reasons or good reasons. Good reasons could be tunnels are cool. Uh or uh, camaraderie. Okay? Uh digging is a fun activity to engage in. These are all very good reasons as to why you can build tunnels, okay? Like, one of my favorite YouTubers started off building a tunnel under his house in England and then basically created, like, an entire city, like a, like a mole city underneath his house. Um, what was the guy's name? He's the guy I showed Marat, and Marat loves him too. Um, Colin Furs, exactly. Based and we're very dwarf-pilled. I think... I think it's cool. I think it's cool to build tunnels. I would like to purchase an Alibaba tunnel machine for $500,000, please, so I could build a tunnel on the side of a mountain. Yes, I am very dwarf-pilled. I think it's sick. I, I obviously, although being built like an orc, uh, I still very much, I still very much think it's sick to build tunnels. I, I think it's cool. I think it's cool when Hamas does it. I think it's cool when the cartel does it. I'm an equal opportunity tunnel guy, okay? And I think it's certainly cool when these guys did it too. Okay? Tunnel under his house so he looks like a socialist, but his mansion underground so no one knows about. Yes. <laughs> It's suspicious that being underground is the perfect temperature for humans to live. That's what I mean. Um, yes, the, the tunneling equipment that you're... Wait, where is this coming from? Uh -oh. the, this is not a joke. This is very much real. Guys... All I'm going to say is 
I think I should buy this. This is a rock tunnel boring machine, DG2200 pipe jacking machine. Unfortunately, there are no reviews on it yet, but it does seem very legitimate. I think one of the major issues is I don't know where to put it. But for the relatively affordable price of $120,000 to $600,000, I could get my very own model number DG2200QNP rock tunnel boring machine, and I can even get a 30 kilowatt four set if I would like. Now, one of the main problems, of course, is that the instruction manual and the buttons on it are in Mandarin. And I don't know Chinese. I don't know how to read Mandarin. So that is probably one of the bigger hurdles here. Another hurdle for me, of course, is how big this is. And then another hurdle is how do I power this bad boy? So... I feel like if I buy this, it should come with, like, my very own Chinese engineer. Okay? And, like, it's not like you have to ship a Chinese engineer to help with the tunnel. You could just simply do, like, an American exchange program. I could go to UC Irvine, for example. And then, you know, from there, I could hire someone specifically with the tunnel uh, equipment, though. Like it's like a it's like a program that comes along with literal jobs. Okay? Think about that. This would literally I am merging the two warring nations, okay? With my tunnel building initiative. With my tunnel building initiative. We will do soft power between two countries. We will do diplomacy between two countries. We will build jobs. Okay. With my with my Alibaba rock tunnel boring machine plan, we will be able to bring LA a subway system, okay? An actual subway system by tapping in to the heart and soul of every single citizen globally. Every single man, woman and child that wants to create tunnels will be able to get to do that with this boring tunnel machine. This way, we can all basically create a Los Angeles subway system in underneath our houses, underneath our apartments, wherever we feel like it. And then we connect all the tunnels to one another. We get public transit in Los Angeles. Everybody is super happy because they get to build tunnels. And we do it with Chinese engineers because absolutely no one knows how to speak Chinese, Mandarin, whatever, uh, uh, in order to use the boring tunnel uh, the, the boring tunnel machines, right? This way, everyone gets to, like, forcibly, I guess, due to their genuine interest in building tunnels, be able to hang out with a Chinese person and will no longer be afraid. Cynophobia combated, cynophobia defeated, okay? Taiwan reunification, 2024, we got it all. A chicken for every pot politics, but it's a tunnel for every home. Yes. Notice how they call it a rock tunnel boring machine, when in fact tunnels are very fun to build. It's a way that um, the, the Chinese mind has decided to, uh, to get the, the white monkeys off the taste, okay? They're like, we know if those... If those white monkeys learned about how fun tunnel making is, they would be constantly making tunnels. They would maybe even get high-speed rail, okay? Which is why, let's call it boring. I know. <sighs> Flying so close to the sun here. Chat doesn't know. No, I'm, it's, I'm joking. Big tunnel is behind this? Yes. If they called it the rock tunnel fun machine, this thing would be flying off the shelves. Everyone would be buying them. <laughs> and everyone would be building their own tunnel systems.
The correct pejorative is white devil. Okay. Sorry. White devil. <laughs> and Mud says, I'll buy one, but it's orange. It doesn't match anything. Guess what it will match? Your fucking sick ass tunnel. Very cool. Thank you, China, for selling this machine, which seems weirdly inappropriate to have on this website. They even put the Mercy logo, bro. They got the Mercedes Benz logo, Benz logo on it. I think. The Merc. Um, is shipping free? I don't know. I also don't understand how, like, what the logistics surrounding this is. Anyway, let's get back. Let's get back to the shul in New York. Let's get back. To the Hasidic community's very own tunnels. Now, of course, the Hasidic community did not take advantage of the Chinese boring tunnel machine. I think it seems like they hastily made their own tunnel system without one. So, kind of an L there for those guys. But hey, let's take a look at the chaos that ensued when the New York Police Department found out about these illegal secret tunnels, which are, of course, very dangerous, by the way. That's like the major reason why. That's like, I would suspect one of the biggest reasons as to why you can't kind of tunnel underneath. You can't tunnel underneath, uh, you know, buildings in New York for good reason. Felix uh, says, this is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in real time. You can see the cop wonder why his life has taken him here to be the one of the assigned officers of the weird Jewish tunnel that nobody will explain. This part almost knocked me out of my chair. Imagine you're a beat cop five hours into your shift and suddenly you have to figure out how many Jewish guys are wall hacking in real life and they're screaming at you that they deserve a tunnel. Um, I on the ball right here. They haven't filled it in yet. Go get your tunnel time while the getting is good. <laughs> this is by far the most favorable press the NYPD has had in many years. This is one of those things where I empathize with them. Like they're lost for words. How do you even say here? Can you guys stop doing your weird tunnel? Um, what is this? Android phones that remain? Okay. Oh. It's such a funny... Dude, all of the videos from this are so fucking funny. Like, the the not the chaos inside, which is funny for a different reason, but, like, this... The most Italian cop of all time having to, for the first time ever, like have this very weird conversation that he never thought he would have to have in his entire career. They know. They know. Because there was a guy wanting to go out. They, they know. There was a guy wanting to go out. No, stop, stop, stop. It's safe. I know already. Stop. I want to clear the whole shoe out. He says, I want to clear the whole shoe out. Hey, what are you doing? I want to clear the whole shoe out. That's what I'm going to do. Whole shoe? Why? Why is that? They, 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 they want to fix this tonight. They want to fix this tonight. They need the truth. And, and to... Why? We need to expand something. You got to not like this. Not safe. He goes, are you from Russia? We don't do that in America. <laughs> like, what in his mind led him... What in his mind led him to think... Like, this has got to be some Russian thing, am I right? Like, what the fuck are these guys doing? What are you fucking doing? You got a fucking tunnel over here. You can't be putting a fucking tunnel over here. It's a goddamn shoe. <laughs> no, he goes, are you from Russia? And then the guy goes, uh, I think the guy's in Israel. Oh, he says, are you from Israel? Oh, never mind. He didn't even say, are you from Russia? He said Israel. Okay, that makes it even funnier. Oh, my God. I thought he said, are you from Russia? 
He said, are you from Israel? Like, it, he's associating tunnels with Israel, I assume, because of all the Hamas stuff that he's read. In his mind, he's like, yeah, Hamas, Israel, you know, that that sort of thing. You guys fucking build the tunnels or what? You can't be doing the tunnel thing here, all right? This ain't Gaza. <laughs> <laughs> We don't got that. You can have the hummus, but you can't have the fucking tunnels, dog. <laughs> uh, or he's conflating Jews with Israel because of Zionism. Brother, at this point, like... <laughs> like, the dudes he's talking to have accents, okay? He doesn't know where the fuck they're from. <laughs> we should... <laughs> I'm canceling the NYPD lieutenant. For for doing a microaggression <laughs> at the Chabad. <laughs> ah! It's just every part of this story is so funny, dude. It's like you brought up, you, you brought together like the funniest group of individuals that could ever uh, clash with one another over such a such a New York City style story. I'm just waiting, like, the, the cherry on the top, the icing and the cherry on the top is when, obviously, inevitably, Eric Adams is going to come out and be like, this is allowed. Like, we have to, we actually, we're building even more tunnels. <laughs> like, he's going to be like, I'm taking more of the money from the libraries so we can specifically build these tunnels. And no, they do not have to have the proper uh, uh, authorization or the, the load-bearing structure is built inside of them. It's okay. Yeah, and then somehow tie it to 9-11. The more tunnels we have, the less 9-11s we have. New York, city of dreams. Oh. It's so good. Don't do that in America. <laughs> hey, what are you from Israel? I heard a lot about the tunnels you guys got over there. We don't do that in America. <laughs> it's so good. It's so fucking. I get. I do. I'm telling you, this video, like his hair, like how big of a beefy boy he is in that fucking vest. Like every part of this is so good. I think I assume is he like the is he the comms guy is he the liaison officer because I think like there are parts of New York where uh the the where the Hasidic communities are like they have like liaison officers they have like uh, different NYPD has like a different division Oh, shoot. Why? Why is that? They, 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 they want to fix this tonight. They need the shoe clear. And, and to so good. This is, there's a yearly discovery of insane shit Hasidics in New York City are doing years before uh, there was kids in Hasidic school that literally can't speak English. Yes. That was, a, <laughs> that was another banger when, um, <clears throat> when we found out. When we found out that the, the Hasidic community in, in New York in their in the schooling system that they'd created literally had uh like what was it it was like a it was like a new york times it was a new york there was a new york times article that like did a deep dive into the hasidic community in new york and how like the kids literally didn't know how to read like they were not literate and couldn't speak english and were like learning stuff in like a third grade level or something they were maxing out at like third grade level. Your mic is considerably lower than any audio on your computer will be the death of my ears. I will sue. Okay, well, I'm sorry. Let's take a look at this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, this is like a Grand Theft Auto no pixels story, dude. What is happening? Get him out of there. Get him out of there. They're having too much fucking fun. 
See, NYPD, anti-fun. They don't want, they don't want you to have a tunnel, dude. Fellas, everyone needs a tunnel, okay? Like what 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 could possibly be going on? What could possibly be going on in the situation where they're just like Remember when someone made this? Yes! Oh my god, dude. Dude, a lot of a lot of people were just they were they were right. A lot of people were saying stuff. My friend Tova sent me this video of what the tunnels were supposed to look like. Let me Why is it? It's like doom. Like, I can't tell. This only raises more questions. Is the tunnel religiously significant? Why are they rendering in the Quake 1 engine? Like... I I don't understand it. I don't understand why, like, this song is literally about building a tunnel. Stop. There is no fucking way there is a real song specifically about building a tunnel. <laughs> I think, and I say this with all sincerity, I love Hasidic Jews. Like, they're, they're so awesome. They're, it's just, it's just like so strange to be like living in 16th century style formations in 2020, in 2024, literally in the middle of like one of the most modern metropolitan cities on the fucking planet. Like, the Amish are like, yeah, we're going to fuck off to, like, you know, Pennsylvania in an area where, like, nobody lives, right? These guys are like, no, actually, we're going to do 16th century shit directly in the fucking heart of New York City, which I think is awesome. And they should be allowed to do it, and they should keep doing it. They should be doing it extra hard. Whatever they're doing, more power to them, okay? It's so sick. It's so awesome. It's so ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> At least I caught this now before all this shit turned to a massive sinkhole and killed hundreds of people. All I'm saying is I believe I believe in the the uh excellence, okay? I don't think that these tunnels would have been bad. This man must have thought he had anti-Semitic hallucinations. Yes. Oh, dude, this is the funniest thing. Okay, I saw this this morning. This guy, I swear I keep hearing Yiddish under the floor of my New York apartment. I live at ground level and we have no basement. This guy said on December 11, 2023, I am not crazy. He tweeted out, there are Jews living under my apartment. I hear them. It's like they're digging or something. For the record, I live at ground level and we do not have a basement. November 7th, 2023. This guy, in his mind, was thinking like, oh, I must be, uh, like, I'm probably anti-Semitic or something. I don't know what the fuck's going on. Dude, we are nine days into 2024. Why is so much insane shit happening? <laughs> tweeted out some of you owe me an apology <laughs> yeah this this insane woman is like the the best as well she she's also building a tunnel and and larping is a, an actual engineer but she's just like a software engineer that actual guy is anti-semitic this was fake oh god damn it Fellas, is it anti-Semitism that check his account? Oh no. I was about to say he has the phenotype of like a like a Richard Spencer looking motherfucker. Like this dude looks like a like a Nick Fuentes fan. See, no fun. 
No fun. Fun is canceled. Can't have fun. I just looked up where they had the tunnels. It makes no sense. They shut the tunnel lady down. Yeah, I saw this tweet. It was really funny. Imagine seeing a Jewish guy crawl out from under a secret sewer tunnel in New York City, not having a phone to record it, and trying to tell people without sounding like the most anti-Semitic person alive. And the thing is, if you see the original video, and we, ha I have to show you the original video, because like a lot of this chaos is kind of funny, but that video of the dude coming out of the tunnel and then like, ah, like running away and trying to push away the camera is living in my mind permanently. Okay. Like it's just, ah, it's just so good. It's so perfect, dude. Look at this. <laughs> This is kind of stupid, but hey, you can't be building secret tunnels underneath your fucking temple. All right, we don't do that in the Empire. <laughs> yeah, a lot of things are playing out uh, in, in identical historical ways as well. This is like another, this is another like weird thing uh, that is happening that is like history is repeating itself in very weird ways. Um, the, hold on. Let me see if I can find the, I want to find, I, I want to find that at specific. We're going to talk more about the tunnels, but I, I want to, I want to find the specific one where the, where the dude's pulling out, where the dude's like running out of the tunnel. Cause it's so good. God. Ah, oh, what a silly story. Um, let's see if they they have it in here. No, they don't have it in here. Fuck. No, the the account deleted all of their fucking goaded ass posts, dude. It sucks. Yeah, they chat. They deleted the the original from TikTok account. Deleted it. Which is like, so, so, oh, this is it. Okay, this music makes it. <laughs> That's the video that I was talking about. I don't know why they put this, like, Sigma grind set music over it. What is going on? Oh, Why? Why does this have Sigma grind set music in the background? fucked up it's fucked up what they're doing to these boys okay boys being boys you know what i'm saying that's so fucked up it's so fucked up Oh, you found the full video. Okay, that, that, by the way, that is the, this is my favorite video, dude. This, this video, this is my favorite video of all time. <laughs> the way he pushes the camera and just starts running. Why did he do that? <laughs> I guess there's no way to get out of that tunnel and just be normal about it. You can't just be like, oh, excuse me.
Can you stop filming me, please? <laughs> it's like a perfect... It's a perfect... Like... <laughs> it's a perfect one human-sized hole on the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> oh god oh oh my god oh fuck dude it's so good it's such a good story oh it's like dude by the way there's Every group, it doesn't matter who was building this tunnel, it would still be funny. I just want to point this out really quickly, okay? Before people go, oh my god, like, oh, is it because they're Jewish? Like, no, dude, the idea that you got, like, one, a group of, a group of individuals that are just, like, living in a totally different century, okay? In the heart of New York City, and only a group like this would be able to to pull off a feat like this. It's like if the Amish lived in New York. You know what I mean? If they just lived in the heart of New York, okay, only they are industrious enough to be able to, like, build shit like this. They got a lot of free time. I, I still don't fully understand why, like, I still don't fully understand why they chose to break it down like this, but I think it was because they wanted to go in. Wait, this is how anti Israel War Room says, this is how anti-Semitism works. A story of a simple building code violation becomes a stereotypic conspiracy of ridiculous proportion. I mean, listen, this guy is most likely anti-Semitic, Okay. Like the people that are the people that are tweeting about this and being like, "Oh, Jews! Like, what are they hiding in their children?" Like those guys are anti-Semitic. But to say that this is a simple building code violation is insane. Okay. Like this is not just a simple building code violation, dog. What the fuck are you talking about? This is funny. And is also, there's historic precedent for this being funny, especially considering that we did talk about the engineering woman who's been pulling these shenanigans as well on TikTok specifically, the engineer everything woman. <laughs> Chat, can someone please explain what's happening? I joined mid laugh at the guy climbing out of the street. Um, they found a, a tunnel in uh, one of the uh, Hasidic communities, like Chabad houses. And uh, New York City was like, we want to, obviously, this is like very dangerous. We want to fill this tunnel up with a cement truck. And then the dudes some of the dudes in the community i guess were like on board the treasurer at the shul is the one that called the city to fill in the tunnel but why did the guys who dug the tunnel start tearing apart the shul lol why are there so many of them in the walls <laughs> this report on the shul tunnel incident is the funniest thing i've ever read 
Bochurim, mostly from Israel and wearing mesichist uh, yarmulkes and pins, responded with fury. We read this earlier. They've been reportedly behind digging of the tunnel, claiming it was to expand the 770 visited by residents and visitors on a daily basis. So they wanted to illegally expand um, the Chabad house. And then, like, one of the splinter groups within the Hasidic community decided, like, no, this is our tunnel. Like, don't touch our tunnel. So then they started ripping off the fucking walls of the show. Um, which is like a holy place. You're not supposed to do that. And apparently it's the treasurer at the show that was uh, the one who called the city to fill in the tunnel. But why do the guys who dug the tunnel start tearing apart the show? Why are there so many of them in the walls? The Mos the Moshiach the Mosi Moshiachis here and the tunnels are being revealed. Moshiach time. Oh, it's the Messiah. Oh my god, this is unbelievable. We all know that the tunnels were made under Beis Hamikdash by its builders and will be revealed when it is to be rebuilt. The Beis Rabinu Shebovel, which is the version of the Beis Hamikdash, uh, while in Golas, obviously had the same made. Messiah is here and these tunnels are being revealed. This is cause for great celebration. Huge possibility <laughs> the tunnel was to have gay sex and smoke weed in. Tobias King MMA. The whole tunnel thing is just one aspect of a power struggle within the Chabad. Since their Rebbe died, conservative factions are fighting with more Messianic factions who believe the Rebbe is still alive and the Messiah over the properties and shoals, etc. etc. That's awesome. That's sick. I love the I love the 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 power struggle happening within the Hasidic community. And like for us to try and comprehend it from the outside is like virtually impossible. <laughs> More religions should do wacky fun stuff like this. I'd be into it. That's what I'm saying, dude. Dude, look, listen. Am I the only one who here is who's extremely confused? No, if you've never been to New York, or if you're unfamiliar with, like, how uh, the Hasidic community operates, okay? There's factions within the Hasidic community. I've shown you some of the different Orthodox uh, Jewish communities before. Like, you have the Netarai Karda. You have some who, are, uh, uh, who believe that, like, uh, the Messiah is going to come back. I don't know, like, what the distinctions are. There's, like, a lot of different branches, okay? But in the most reductive ways possible, let me explain it to you. The overwhelming majority of American Jews are reform Jews, right? They're, they're like uh, a lot of the people that you see in big cities that are, you know, Christian, but not really, right? So that's the overwhelming majority of Jews, both in America and just globally in general. Overwhelming amount of Jews in Israel are reform Jews. Uh, overwhelming amount of Jews in America are reform Jews. And they don't really give a shit, right? They just like, kind of do some of the stuff in the religion. They're very progressive for the most part. And then you have a specific subsect. Yes, secular Larry David types. Exactly. So that's one thing. Judaism is also not just a religion, but an ethno-religion as well. So there's like different sects like, you know, obviously you have Sephardi, Mizrahi, Ashkenazi Jews, from different parts of the world, like Jews that live in different parts of the world. But then you have the Orthodox Jews, okay? And the Orthodox Jewish community also ranges from like the Ben Shapiro types all the way to like super fundamentalist, uh, uh, super fundamentalist, uh, uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews under different sects like the Hasidic Jews. And I know that there's uh, some, some Jewish chatters in here who know even better than me um, that, that can clarify if I've gotten anything wrong. But as far as like the ultra-Orthodox Hasidic Jewish community, okay, imagine if you had, like I said, Amish people with no technological restrictions except on Saturday, okay, 
but there's also cheat codes around that regardless within the religion. But imagine if you had Amish people, like, talk, I'm talking like we want to live in the 15th century type motherfuckers, okay? Living in the middle of New York City, okay? There's, it's reductive, but there's no other way to describe it other than like, it's like if you had Amish people living in New York, okay, and had their own community in New York, and had their own schooling system in New York, had their own police system, had their own, uh, had their own social amenities and social services, okay, and they just kind of chill, and like they, it's not like they are uh, not allowed to touch technology or anything like that. They do everything, right? As a matter of fact, uh, they they even sell a lot of uh, technology, like uh, what is it, BNH or whatever, like. So you have, with the exception of Saturdays, like if you go to, for example, um, for example, if you go to, to uh, like Jewish hospitals in New York, if you go to a hospital on Saturday, it stops. The elevator will stop at every floor. That is specifically so that um, the, the uh, Jewish patients and family members don't have to touch the buttons. Okay? So it's stuff like that. Yes, uh, Lakewood, New Jersey is another uh, place as well. That's how you know that commenter is not an actual Hasidic Jew. December 23rd, 2023, 8.03. It was a Saturday morning during Shabbat. Wait, who? Which commenter? Ultra-Orthodox and Hasidic are like umbrella terms that include Chabad, Satmar, etc. Satmar, Hasidim are the ones who are anti-Zionist, by the way. Yeah. So, there's a lot of like weird, fascinating stuff that uh, they do. Uh, Mount Sinai has those elevators, yeah. So, there's a lot of... Literally right next to me on screen. Wait, who? Truanon? Who are you talking about? I'm confused. Anyway. B&H camera, Adorama, and focus camera all, all set electronics. They're owned by Orthodox slash Hasidic Jews. So, overall, uh, overall, they just, like, kind of keep to themselves. Oh, the screenshot. Oh, this guy is fake. Oh, because he... Oh, 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 I got it. Well, yeah, December 23rd. Does that fall on a Saturday at 8.03 a.m.? Unless they're dictating their tweet. Because, like, for Orthodox Jews... For Orthodox Jews, they have, uh, on Saturdays, they're not supposed to touch technology, okay? And so there's a workaround. It's very, it's very interesting. So, like, there's always, like, a cheat code around it, right? And the workaround for Orthodox Jews on Saturdays is they hire somebody. Um... They, they hire somebody to, to do this stuff for them. Like, you know, touch the electronics and, 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 um, and all this other shit. And there's like additional accommodations made as well, but that's one of them. Shabbos, uh, or no, um, Shabbat begins on Friday nights and ends on Saturday night. Yeah. It's like soaking. Yes, Judaism, or rather Mormonism, is the closest to Judaism as far as like, according to Felix, as far as like creating ridiculous rules that you can also find cheat codes around. Like, Mormonism is the closest like Christianity gets the loopholes. You've seen it's this, like right? Uh, no, I have not. But we can watch it. 
Imagine you're out there doing anti-conspiracy education, then a video emerges of a Hasidic guy crawling out from a secret network of Jewish tunnels under New York. <laughs> I mean... Obviously, this has nothing to do with... I mean, I don't know if I have to repeat this, but this has nothing to do with Jewish people at all. And it's like a very specific group. It's like... It's like thinking all Jews are like the Westboro Baptist Church or like uh, the snake charmer, like uh, I am delivered type Christians. You know what I mean? It's like looking at Christianity as a whole and thinking like, oh, no, it's all about, um, you know, getting bit by snakes and shit. It's not. It's just Pentecostals, right? Or like Westboro Baptist Church is like a specific sect. Joseph Smith literally went to all synagogues and the Catholic churches and just kind of threw all that shit together to write the Book of Mormon. Even Mormons in their history talk about Joseph exploring religions and he just jacked that shit. Yeah. Um, there's also apparently a fishing line. A fishing line encircles Manhattan, protecting the sanctity of Sab uh, uh, so Sabbath. Sabbath. A clear fishing wire is tied around the island of Man uh, the Manhattan. It's attached to posts around the perimeter of the city from 1st Street to 126th. This string is a part of an Eruv, a Jewish symbolic enclosure. Most people walking on the streets of Manhattan do not notice it at all. But many observant Jews in Manhattan rely on the string to leave the house on uh, Sabbath. The concept of Eruv was first established almost 2,000 years ago to allow Jews to more realistically follow the laws of Sabbath rest, particularly one, no carrying on the Sabbath. According to the laws of the Sabbath rest, nothing can be carried from the domestic zone to the public zone on Saturday. That means no carrying house keys or a wallet. It also means no pushing a baby stroller. For parents of young children, no carrying would mean not leaving the house on Saturday. The Eruv symbolically extends the domestic zone into the public zone. Like, this is a cheat code. Okay? It's straight up. It's so funny. Like, oh, no, the entirety of Manhattan is my house, actually. Like... <laughs> It's dope. It's so, I love shit like this. Uh, and like most people will look at a stop, will look at something like this. And it, even if it doesn't like inconvenience them at all, be like, Oh, why does this exist? Like it's fucking bullshit. And it's like, no man, I think it's fire. I, I think it's ridiculous. And it's awesome. Have, let people have fun. As long as it doesn't, as long as it doesn't harm anybody. You know what I mean? What better that than being terrorists? That's a good loophole. Islam also has loopholes. Muhammad jacked everything better that than being terrorists. What do you mean? Like what? This is what I'm talking about. Like what? What? Who said anything about terror? Whose religion is like you have to do terror and terrorism? I wonder what that chatter is talking about. Imagine a whole day cooped up in Manhattan apartment with a toddler and no electricity. You might as well be going a little bonkers because your apartment's so small, says Dina Mann. But you don't realize it's so small until you're stuck there and you can't go anywhere. Mann lives on Manhattan's upper west side with her husband and two young children. They observe Sabbath rest, uh, uh, including refraining from carrying. She says, if you're really, really, really strict, then you should not even pick up your child. Okay. I was interesting, did a video about The Wire. Uh, man and many others rely on the Eruv every Saturday to leave the apartment with their children. Luckily, Manhattan's Eruv has never been down. Rabbi Mintz, co-president of Manhattan Eruv, says, It has never been down for a Sabbath. Never. We always save it at the last minute. Mintz noted that the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade is a particularly trying time. When the, when the parade, the parade sometimes ends up fucking cutting the wire. Is that what it is? Oh, that's awesome. I have three under three and I can imagine going a day without picking up any of my kids. How would you even do that? Okay, we'll do the really eye-opening. <laughs> 
Look into entering America's most religious community. Hasidic Jews of Brooklyn, New York are the most religious and closed off community in America. What is Hasidism to you? So it's a very vibrant community, second and third generation post-Holocaust. Arguably one of the most fundamental religions, period, on the planet. This community is a wonderful community because there's a lot of nice people here. The whole system of how we relate. This guy's a YouTuber. To God and how we interact with God. This shit's cool as fuck. Um, the, the, the block thing that you put on your head and then the, the leather thing, the leather wrap on the arm does look dope. It, you look like a, like a legionnaire, which I feel like is inappropriate to say, but it does look kind of sick. I'm about to walk into an exclusive synagogue here and I'm pretty nervous. Wow. The stakes are very high for outsiders to be here, but I'm about to cross into this controversial bubble to discover the untold truth, which will leave you speechless. Don't, can you not record this part? Okay, got it. It's gonna be a disaster with cameras, but we're gonna try. What do you mean? I'm gonna rush, I have an appointment. I never thought I would feel intimidated by my own religion. There There's security go. everywhere now in this neighborhood. Pretty intense streets, very, very religious. Everybody on their flip phones because they don't use internet. 100% of the women over 18 years old are wearing wigs. What are you supposed to think or believe in this moment? So that's a really good question. Growing up Jewish, I've always enjoyed connecting with other Jews around the world, like I've done in Ethiopia, Afghanistan, the Philippines, and Yemen. I consider myself very lucky to be part of a religion that has only 15 million members, but has such a profound impact on global society. That being said, I've always been extra curious about the Hasidic Jews of New York because they seem to be different both physically and mentally from the rest of us. The Hasidism so movement physically? started just 250 years ago in Ukraine and spread to the United States right after the Holocaust. The way that Hasidic Jews dress themselves and curate their lifestyles will leave you stunned, from their big furry hats and long beards to their lack of using the internet and smartphones. Their strong commitment to family, tradition, and strict Jewish law is remarkable. Yeah, he spoke to Zebulon in Afghanistan too, I But think. let's back up a bit. Not all Jews. One of my favorite, one of my favorite Jewish people of all time is the remaining, the remaining Jew in Afghanistan who just like specifically refused to leave Afghanistan. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. You're never getting me. You're never getting me out of here. <laughs> like, no matter what. Jews are Hasidic. In fact, Hasidics make up only 5% of the total Jewish population. There are three other movements. I think he moved to Israel Reform, recently. Yeah. He moved to Israel Orthodox. after. No, he didn't and pass away. He moved to Israel. can be found scattered around New York City. He finally I left, I started my adventure by popping into a Jewish restaurant in Washington Heights, Manhattan, which is a local hangout spot for modern Orthodox teenagers studying Torah at the well-known Yeshiva University. Is it mostly Jews that come here? Mostly, yeah. We have a bunch of teachers and people from around the neighborhood that come also, and some, some regulars. These chicken shawamas. The best part is that he hated the only other Jewish guy? Yes, and they contested. Not dissimilar to the, uh, to the Hasidic Jewish uh, dispute that we're seeing about uh, who actually owns the, the, the Chabad house. Uh, there was the, the last synagogue in Afghanistan that they were disputing over. And uh, one of the fun uh, parts is that they, the last, um, so, so Zebulon was arrested by the Taliban and was put in prison. And then they released him from prison because he fucking annoyed everyone. He like constantly duked it out with everybody. And then they literally had to release him from prison, according to the documentaries and, and news articles written about him. It was awesome. He's the goat. Anyway, let's so continue. So it's homemade. We make it every day with fresh chicken. We cut up ourselves the chicken, spice it up, stack it. That looks so and cook good. It. Yeah. Are it's almost from, caramelized. Are you from Israel or no, I'm from France. I grew up in France. I, I thought I heard I, something. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're French Jew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't meet that many French Jews. Yeah, I know. Yeah, no. My workers are the best. Literally, like, really amazing, amazing workers. Speak like you're Israeli. Yeah, French guy wearing a Golan Heights shirt. Saying, this is, you know, this is my shawarma. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of the French mix it's, in uh, there. After all these years working in the Israeli restaurant, I think it literally, like, uh, yeah. imprinted me with the Israeli accent. Um, from oh, Chile the takeaway is called Golan Heights? I've never met a Chilean Jew in my entire life. <laughs> Do you, do you feel like you belong here, like with the Jews and the community? I believe the community here is amazing. I believe that all Jews belong, belong in Israel. It's not just a shirt, that's the name of the restaurant? Oh, nice. 
That is pretty tasty. Everything in a forma that I would ever possibly want, including eggplant, is in here. Very fresh. Went to this place when I asked for the Mediterranean salad, salad on my wrap. They really corrected me to do you mean Israeli Flavorful. salad. Very delicious. Mm. Oh, in that building over there. A lot of French Jews are of Sephardic Algerian origin. So yes, shawarma is an actual native dish for him. Yeah, except like, no, you, why did you say this then? Like, okay, he's Sephardic, Sephardic Algerian origin. It's not a French dish. It's an Algerian dish. There you go. That's my point. This is the whole point that I make all the time. Okay. Arab Jews and Mena Jews are Mena and Arab. Okay. They're not Jews as a, like a, sp a separate thing. This inherently comes from, and, and a lot of people repeat this without recognizing that like there is an inherent bias in it. Like, of course, Judaism being an ethno religion implies that there are a shit ton of different cuisines from all around the world, right? From all around the world. It's just that to slap it as like, this is Israeli cuisine is what is incorrect about it. Do you know what I mean? It, or saying that this is Jewish cuisine is like a weird thing to say about it because... It, it's not supposed to be Israeli or Jewish cuisine. It's whatever the the uh, wherever the Jewish person is coming from. Like that is where it 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 originates from. Not that it fucking matters. Shawarma is not Algerian. Yeah, I I know. I I'm just. Shawarma is not Algerian or North African. Yes. Shawarma is not Turkish either. No. Shawarma is the, is the, I guess, uh, what is the or origin of Shawarma? I would say like Iraq maybe. Um, Dunar is the Turkish version of that. And it's the best. Or Syrian is the Levant. It's from the Levant. Okay. Anyway, let's continue. That's like the big yeshiva. And you have like hundreds of kids studying together. Really? Tell me about this community. Shawarma is a Turkish word? No, it's not. This is what we call a modern Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. A little more um, takes the, like modern inventions and technology and incorporates it into Jewish life as opposed to a Hasidic neighborhood, which may not do so. What do you think about Hasidic neighborhoods? They're not like any more Jewish than us. They're not any less Jewish. We're all Jews and like the way, like their teachings are Oh, are Chevy Man. Like it's not really for everyone. Oh, really? Wait, Shawarma comes from Chevy Man? Wait, no fucking way. Hold up. No, I think you guys are doing, I think Turks are fucking uh, doing the classic everything is Turkish shit. Oh my God. Oh my God. It is Turkish. Oh my God. Yo, get fucked everybody in the chat. I thought Donat was like specifically Turkish and I didn't realize that. I, I thought that like, oh my God, this entire time people were like, shawarma is not a Turkish word. And I was like fucking eating that shit up, bro. All the fucking, all, oh my God, all the Syrians and the Arabs in the chat, dude, get fucking wrecked. Originated in the Levant region of the Arab world during the Ottoman Empire because this is like a meat cut into thin slices stacked into an inverted cone. Donar was invented in Berlin. No option to shawarma. Bro, if you fucking say this in Turkey, they will put you in a cannon and launch you into space. Are you out of your fucking mind? Donar was invented in Berlin. Are you insane? No, motherfucker. Donar was not invented in Berlin. No, Turks that immigrated into Germany brought donut with them and it became like an, a beloved German dish as well. That is the most insane thing. It's like thinking fucking Indian food was invented in England or something. We've invented curry, mate. What you fucking mean? I know, chicken tikka masala. I know. Turks visited Berlin in 1997 and brought Donar back to Istanbul. That's so funny. Mexicans invented pastor, the fuck? 
No, that's not true either. This, I, I'm almost certain, this actually, this as a concept originated in the Levant region, uh, right, under the Ottoman Empire, inevitably moved over, inevitably moved over to Latin America. Shawarma is an Arabic rendering of Ottoman Turkish chevirme, referring to the turning, rotisserie. But yeah, um, I think like Al Pastor is, is also, it goes back to the uh, Mexicans or Turks uh, thing that I say all the time, which is real. Yeah, see? The origins of Al Pastor can be traced back to Middle Eastern cuisine. In the 19th century, Lebanese immigrants brought the technique of spit roasting meat with them to Mexico. There you go. Yeah. Um, I've been on an Erasmus trip last year and Turks and Syrians who were on the Syrians who were on that trip argued the whole time about food, both claiming they invented it. Yeah, this is a age old tale. I do think it's funny that there is like anyone in the chat that tries to fucking claim that Germany invented it though. Okay. In Israel, most shawarma is made with dark meat turkey, commonly served in tahin sauce instead of yogurt for kashrut reasons. It is often garnished with diced tomatoes, cucumbers, onions, pickled vegetables, hummus, tahina sauce, sumac. Like, I reluctantly will admit, okay, there is a new spot that I found in Los Angeles, okay, is in Studio City, straight up. And it's an Israeli, I think it's an Israeli spot, okay? And it's actually kind of fire, okay? Like, I think that cultural uh, cross-pollination, it, it can be good, okay? I, I love tahini sauce. Uh, not tahini, tahini sauce, sorry. And this place, Avi Q, is actually fire, okay? Is actually fire. My favorite restaurants in Los Angeles are also uh, run, owned, and operated by an Israeli couple, Bavel. Not Tahin. The, tahin is the Mexican spice blend law. Listen, in Turkish, it's uh, Tahin. So that's why Tahini is Tahin. Right? Isn't it? Bavel. Bestia, Safis, all owned by the same, all owned uh, by the same uh, Israeli couple. And it's gas. Bavel is incredible. And so is Safis, really. Safis has some of the best donut I've had in Los Angeles. <sighs> Pop up specialist IVQ has gone legit in a Studio City strip mall selling shaved Wagyu pita sandwiches and more. I mean, it's pretty good. You know, fair is fair. I'll say it. So, you know, I'm not going to fucking act like that's not the case, but, uh, you know, shawarma invented by the Turks. Just saying. But the people who it's for, like, it worked for a lot of people for thousands and thousands of years. So uh, it's a really beautiful thing. I happen to be Chabad. I'm, it's different. I'm, it's Chabad different is a totally, yeah, and they're different Hasidic groups. But you guys have no beef with each other. It's all Judaism. They tend to be a little bit more insular. And for their reasons, from their religious perspective, they're trying to protect, you know, what they're doing. And um, they don't want the... I mean, this guy's dripped out the fucking wazoo, bro. This is what I'm saying. It's like... Come on, dog. He dressed up like a Peaky Blinder. You know what I mean? I mean, it's fire. To necessarily influence them. I mean, there have been conflicts. I'm not gonna lie. But like, you would not, you wouldn't go there, and they wouldn't come here. Put it that way. Uh, Yeshiva University is a little bit controversial in that sense. Like, okay. Sam Rafael would not hold of Yeshiva University. They don't. They don't go to secular college. They don't sure. go to secular university. It's really cool to see Hebrew writing all over the walls. Like, I can actually sound it out, but I don't know what it means. Now that I've got a good feel for the modern Orthodox life in Manhattan, I'm hopping in a cab to the ultra-conservative Hasidic community in Brooklyn called South Williamsburg. Unlike other Jewish communities, most Hasidics rarely, if ever, leave the boundaries of their district. Ottomans aren't only Turks, you ignorant Turk. Shut the fuck up, bitch.
Everything from schools, hospitals, and supermarkets to hardware stores, internet cafes, and bookstores are all found within walking distance. It is very much a bubble and it's intimidating to enter because A, I'm not Hasidic, and B, I'll be meeting up with Abby Stein, who comes from Williamsburg but was cancelled by her parents and her family for coming out as transgender. I was the first person who was raised in a Hasidic community, ended the 250 years of the Hasidic community in existence. This guy's sick. Come out the worst thing that happened to me... Like, I thought this guy, like, he, he, this seems like he's... When I've come back here, has been people screaming. Like, and once people threw eggs. Like, did he say canceled? Canceled is an interesting word for it. I mean, still, like, humanizing a a, a former Hasidic uh, trans Jewish person is like kind of cool. That like you don't see YouTubers taking that initiative ever. You know what I mean? Like, think about that. Think about think about a YouTuber that you got Tyler Oliveira on the one hand, okay? You got Tyler Oliveira on the one hand, and then you got a guy like Drubinsky on the other hand, who's like pretty fucking. Um, who, who, who I mean, this is like incredibly open minded. Through an egg. Through an egg at you. I'm going in with an open mind and a willingness to learn more about this. Unit. Drew has come a long way. I'm not going to lie. I filmed him in four countries and he's a good dude. Just not very informed on a lot of stuff, surprisingly. Deep culture while being extra careful on how I use my camera. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. good to meet you. you. Finally. You grew up like here, here. I, my he loves Turkey. It's in his top 10 countries. He's been to every country and it's in his top 10. Nice. I live about 10 minutes walking from here. As we cross the border into Hasidic Williamsburg from the hipster part of town, I'm noticing the people's outfits and street signs immediately starting to change. It's literally separated by a single street, Broadway, with the subway screeching right above our heads. Clearly it's pouring rain outside. We're doing our best right now. So yeah, so this is literally, Broadway was always the border. And that's very important. We're like on it right now, and you'll see in a minute, you're, there's like two blocks maybe. Hassan can't beat the allegations. What? What allegations? What are you saying? That are kind of like a mix. This is Yiddish. It looks like Hebrew, but it's yeah, Yiddish. Yeah, it looks like Hebrew. <laughs> Almost everyone here speaks Yiddish at home. But this is a hat store, so they sell Hasidic hats. The furry hats are just one of the many ways that Hasidic dude, the furry men hats stand are out fire. The rest of us, like on, uh, dude, 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 listen. Listen, real recognize real. This shit is drip, okay? Is is dripped out the motherfucking wazoo, okay? It, it's just it's it goes hard. It goes so hard. All that's all I'm saying. It's just it goes hard. Uh, sometimes there is a that like uh, Hasidic Jews have to bring it uh, with them in a box, right? Too like there's like a special box for it, not to get it like fucked up. If you ever take the hat off, I've seen that. Like, there's like a hat box. Celine hat, it, it drip is crazy drip. No, every every part of this is is it, sick. They are called strimals, not furry hats. I'm not Hasidic, but if I recall correctly, it's made out of fox fur. It's fire. <laughs> Durag and Strimal stream when at both at the same time. Another way is by having payas or long hair on the side of their heads. Women, on the other hand, dress very conservative. Like this is kind of sick, right? Um, what do I mean by this? It's like it's like showing your, like the Mormons have like uh the Mormons have the the special underwear, right? Like that you <clears throat> that you wear in temples, which is cool, but then like. You don't get to showcase it. Whereas I feel like the more the more leveled up you are, it's like armor. The more leveled up you are in religion, the more you're you show your armor. Which I think is sick. You know what I mean? This is like, yo, this is plus ten faith. Like I have a fur hat that's plus ten faith. You don't have a fur hat. You only have the regular hat. You haven't upgraded. You know what I mean? It's, it's not cosmetic. It's not. Uh, many people think like, oh, this is just cosmetic. Like, no, this is not pay to win. You have to literally level up your religious points to be able to get the specific armor. I'm just saying it's fire. 
it, it is exactly like a video game. They're playing Fashion Souls. Yeah, no, they're they're doing Faith Max build for sure. Yeah, you wear it everywhere. As soon as you get clouded, go on a mission or get married. You never take it off. Exactly. Exactly. It also shows you fuck. That's the other thing. Like, dude, dude, you see a Hasidic Jewish guy without the fur hat? That means he don't fuck. Because you get that when you fuck. So it literally is just a flex on the haters, okay? Think about that. It's literally a permanent flex. It's like, yeah, you can spot me from a mile away, dog. I fuck. Look at my fo look at my look at my hat. It was made out of fox fur. There's like 10 grand. Okay? Yeah. It's like you're flexing on the haters and you're flexing on the little virgins in the in the fucking community when they're like, oh, I don't have a wife yet. And it's like, yeah, bitch, you don't. I do. Okay. What happened in No Swearing 2024? Okay, I'm just saying, like, I don't know how else to describe this situation. Okay. So, bro, my hat was $600 that I got for starting Hasidic Rabbi College from my Rav. Shit was fire, not fuzzy. See, that's what I mean. You got to... You got a straw hat. Not a straw hat, but, you know, not a fuzzy hat. It's cool. Okay, Mugiwara. Yeah, I mean, look, every community has a signifier. Okay? Like, in this community, you can show how many months you avoided the top of the hour ad break with a subscription badge, right? Like this guy, or this lady, sorry. Uh, Six-month subscriber, seven-month subscriber, showing off the badge. Kev Rhino, three and a half year subscriber. Tier two for 44 months. Like these are the different amenities that every community has, right? At the top of the hour, there's a three minute ad break and many ad break avoiders get to showcase how long they've been avoiding the ad breaks at the top of the hour. How long they've been subscribing at the top of the hour, right? With a with sub badge. Like, everybody's got a different way of flexing on the haters is what I mean. Here's a three-minute ad break right now. By the way, you can also avoid the ad break by subscribing for $5 or for free with the Twitch Prime or by getting gifted a sub if you're lucky. All right, let's continue. Conservatively, always covering their shoulders and knees, and they also wear wigs to protect the public from seeing their true identity. Women are also seen on the streets taking care of their kids, of which having 10 or more is considered normal. They reproduce a lot. There's a lot of kids in each family, so you can see the pediatrics office right there. The line is... Okay. so long for kids to go see a doctor. If I owned a business here, I would open up a stroller shop. I have 12 siblings. That's very common here. People have huge families. Wow. We get married extremely young. I was uh, married at 18. Marriage in Hasidic families is of utmost importance. It typically happens at see? a very young age and involves the entire community. And believe me, the ceremonies are pretty awesome. <laughs> That's crazy. One of my favorite things about being Jewish is the food. See, bro, you didn't fuck. You didn't fuck for the fuck hat. Sorry. Food. And Abby is eager to take me to one of her favorite childhood restaurants called Come on, Gatos. Drew. It's important to know that all food around here is kosher, which is a strict eating code that Hasidic, Orthodox, and many other Jews follow. It's kind of similar to halal food for Muslims in that animals must be slaughtered a certain way to be able to eat them. All forms of pork are forbidden and you cannot mix meat and dairy. In the 1930s, there were over 1,500 kosher delis in New York, but nowadays that number has dwindled down to about 20 as the Jews have spread around America. Gottlieb's has been a lifeline for Williamsburg Hasidic community since opening its doors 62 years ago, and the cuisine is all derived from Eastern Europe. All right, no cheeseburger. So, should I show you? Yeah, you go ahead. Now? Go yeah, ahead. bro, you can't fucking drown. Okay, you cannot drown the, what is it, like, what's the term for it in kosher? You cannot drown the baby in the mother's milk or something. That's why you can't mix uh, dairy and meat, which is probably one of the biggest L's. Like, I think kosher, halal, not having pork is kind of an L because there's no bacon, no gabagool, none of the fucking Italian meats, okay? But, um... With with kosher, you can't like you also can't do the the mixing of the dairy and the meat, and I feel like that's a that's a major L. <sighs> Give me a rundown. Rice, rice, potatoes, mashed potatoes. Very common, very Eastern European, as you can see. It is here. very Eastern European. Here's, 
two kinds of goulash, you got sesame chicken that's very popular with that. So that's actually one of my favorite things there. This is also amazing. Oh. Stuffed cabbage is one of my favorite things as a child. One, two, three, four, five. You got six kinds of kugels just here, and it's not even Friday. I'm into Chicken everything, nuggets. so how, it's I'm, all amazing. You want to just order for me? Oh, soup. Yeah, I want to see the soup. Oh my God, it's a lot of soup, my friend. Oh yeah, there's a lot. That's my favorite. Those are the noodles. Amazing. It's not so boiling a kid in its mother's milk. Damn, I got it right, dude. I'm. Yeah, I'm okay. with it. I know uh, my shit. Everything in it. That's there's something over here. Chicken gizzards. What's your favorite? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> He's being very nice. Can I ask you a question about payas? Have you had that your whole life? Yeah, of course. Since I was three. Since you were three? Yes. But for you, it's been normal your whole life. Of course, of course. And for my kids as well. And my, I have my eighth boy. I'm going to make payas now on circus before circus. Your eighth boy. Eighth boy. How many boys do you have? I have eight boys. And girls? One girl. Are you always this busy? I'm always busy, but I'm missing one guy's making a wedding tonight, one of my guys. And one of my guys on vacation, so... Hello, how are you? Can I pick you from me? I would love to, yeah. Uh, What's your name? My name is A.B. Baby. Where are you from? I'm a Willie boy. Really? Yeah. Do, do you like this restaurant? Of course! Who doesn't like this restaurant? This community is a wonderful community, because there's a lot of nice people here. Look at Yitzchak. Take a look, Yitzchak. Take a look, Yitzchak. No, don't take a look. Take a look, Menashe. Yeah, yeah, Could you find such a guy like him? So life is good here. Life is great, especially when I meet you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. These two, they're oh, kids, they're but he said that that... that's fire. Dude, come on. Dude, you can't beat that. Like, like, it's not just... You don't just have the hat. You have to protect the hat. Are you kidding me? Come on, bro. He's got a rain cap on the hat, dog. Bad guys. Mechitzen means that their kids are married to each other. As a community, you're quite Wait. close. Oh. How long the men is this? Wow. It's, you know what it is? It's all in Hebrew. It's a Torah. Okay. It's the blessing you make after eating. I think we're both oh. just getting the two Hi. of us just put it on. Hot soup? I haven't had oh, matzo ball soup in a long time. <laughs> well, if you come on Friday, I will make It's something. also like a rainy day, so it's even, it's it's even better. It's like a fall day. It feels like a home-cooked meal. This looks extremely Eastern European, almost it's like you would find in Ukraine or Poland. Steaming off the top right there. No, not incest. Not incest. Like, uh, fucking uh, families. Like, different families marrying into one another. Mm. In -laws, it's filled with chat. meat, cabbage, onions. It's my grandmother was from from Jerusalem. She put rice in it as well. Oh uh, yeah, there is rice in there. Oh, there's rice there. It's okay. so 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 good, and it's pretty filling too because it has rice and it's like a soup. It has a starch and a protein. It's like a soup and a dumpling. What is this one? That's um, sesame chicken. Okay. I'll have some of that as well. Yeah, please dig in. This is like Asian style, no? I was well, about to say that's gotta be that's gotta be the the deep cultural ties that the Jewish community has a Chinese food, I assume, right? Very interesting. So I, I have learned recently that um, there's a lot of overlap between Hasidic food and Asian food. And I think the reason for that is actually food developed out of poverty. Mm. And they, they made you, that's why you Polish? get the Wait, really? Very popular. Chicken heart. They eat that in the Philippines. This is the Kolchlish, because it's very similar to gnocchi, kind of like the pasta, true. but it doesn't really have a... You know, it's not cheese. Mm. It's like there's nothing dairy here. Oh, I should have pointed out. Oh yeah, there's absolutely here. nothing dairy here. You can't miss. So this is this is a meat restaurant. This is a typical cuisine of Williamsburg. Yeah, meat. Well, this is a fantastic meal. Thank you for taking oh, me you here. Have, you I don't know. I'm just I'm I'm concluding oh, okay. that this part of the don't worry, it's all gonna get eaten. She's a Jewish mother. Let's the eat. only real way to insult me is by not eating food. <laughs> this is so fucking so cozy, dude. Holy shit. Oh, sir. Like having a big non political or apolitical YouTuber be this cozy and this humanizing of a trans person is huge. Oh my God. This guy's awesome. Like, straight up. Uh, is this Tyler Oliveira? No, fuck no. It's not Tyler Oliveira. Zagazin. Oh, there's a Zagazin. Be well. Be well. That's Be well, Zagazin. Zagazin. <laughs> as soon as I walked outside the door to that restaurant, I could start to feel the culture sinking in as Abby and I walked the streets. All eyes were on us, and I felt a lot of pressure to keep my camera down because it's clear that people here do not want to be filmed. Don't record this. Okay. So I'm gonna ask the people on the street right now if they want to be interviewed. Hi. Thank you. Okay, no problem, thank you.
the only people who accepted to be interviewed were non-Jews, and it was pretty interesting to hear their perspectives on the Hasidics. If there wasn't here, it would be another ghetto. But I, I feel the tension between us all my life. I went to school here, but it's peaceful. If it wasn't, if they weren't here, then it would be an, an extension of the ghetto. Hey, you on YouTube. Hey, ah. What do you think about this community? I don't consider this to be a religion. I consider this to be a culture. I've been working for them for almost 17 years. And, and every community, there's bad and good things. Hey, nobody's perfect. The only perfect is the one about. So I don't want to be a party pooper, but if he doesn't mention what women have to go through, then it's pretty incomplete. I, I suspect that there will be that element to it as well. I, hey, I respect, assume. man, respect. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm feeling like this tension building. The stakes are high. You know, Abby can't be seen. I can't be I seen. I can't be seen. <laughs> well, yeah, people just gonna look. Can I shoot from the window from the street? Yeah, well, technically, legally, they can't stop you. So I know. Yes, you can. Why do many modern New York Jewish people really dislike the Hasids? Um... I, th I mean, it's most likely because it's uh, not dissimilar. Uh, it's not dissimilar to how, like, some of the more fundy uh, Muslims behave. Like, globally, online, the, the uh, Islamic... Like, the, the Muslim Twitter will globally dunk on, like, uh, UK Muslims, for example. Because there's, like, a lot of... A lot of UK Muslims are just, like, kind of embarrassing. Like, not all, obviously, but some UK Muslims are a little embarrassing in the way that they, like, in the way that they are super fundamentalists. So it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's like that, I think, I assume. I used to to live next to a large Hasid population in Baltimore. They don't speak to outsiders in a kind of rude way to see why people don't like them slash the vibes. Yeah. I've met Wahhabis that were more progressive than the weirdo Salavas English Muslims. Yeah, there's like a lot of, uh, there, there's a lot of like weird vibes and attitudes. Big reason is that they're also anti-vaxxers. There are not infre infrequently large measles outbreaks every few years. Yeah. That's why, that's how I found out about Jacob Kornblow uh, originally, who was like, uh, he's like an Orthodox reporter who would report on a lot of like the, the you know, anti-vaxxer stuff that they were doing uh, in the Hasidic community. Like they literally surrounded his house. They were like trying to fucking kill him and shit. It was crazy. There's like, there's like a, uh, like a Hasidic Andrew Breitbart, basically, who was like leading a, a, a Hasidic mob to uh, surround his apartment. It was wild. The COVID was wild. They cause problems in the city. They're obnoxious anything, and they love Trump. They are conservatives. Yeah, they're conservative. Like, they're fundamentalist conservative for the most part. That's what it is. It's just fundy shit. This is a cinema transferred into a synagogue. Almost like they, they while out, you know what I mean? Is Libs a TikTok Hasid? Um, she's Orthodox. Everything about this community fascinates she's me, but nothing more than their restrictions to use the internet. It's a gathering to be safe from all the dangers of technology. So anti-internet. Anti. <laughs> Technology, which is, yeah, that's pseudonym for the internet. This place is called Cubicles, and it's literally kosher internet. So basically... So you go, yeah, you go in, you pay per hour, or half hour, whatever. Like an internet cafe in other yes, countries. an internet cafe, and you get filtered or flash kosher version of the internet. So it's like North Korea. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I'm gonna go in. Try to go in. Would you hold, hold this? I was not wanted in there. Let's go. <laughs> no, they just saw my camera. They're like, what, what are you filming? Let's go. I'm fully Jewish. I had bar mitzvah, everything. Last name is very Jewish. But I'm, I'm not welcomed in this community, which is very fascinating. I was told as a child that in, in school by my teachers that walking into a reformed temple is worse than going into a church. And you have to go... <laughs> That's awesome. That's so sick. That's that. See, there you go. There's your answer for the chatter who was watching. Like, why do why do a lot of like secular or reformed Jews in New York uh, 
get annoyed with uh, the Hasidic community. Well, there it is. If going into a church is a horrible thing. Yeah. Going into a reformed temple is even worse. <laughs> it's so interesting that all these shops are mostly food. You will see later a lot of children's stuff. Yeah. A lot of children, a huge percentage of the community of children. Yeah, because there's so many kids. You said people have 10, 15 kids. I, sorry, my parents have 13 kids, and it's on the bigger end, but it's not crazy large. 13 is not crazy to you? You have 10 grandkids, and you're not even that old. No, you don't have to be old. You get married at 18, you have a child every year. By the time you are 38, your son is already getting It should be said that not all Orthodox Jews are the same. The New York community is extremely isolationist. Other places are less so. Yeah, I would say that in my experience, like Lakewood, New Jersey, and this specific uh, Hasidic community is significantly more insular than the, uh, well, I guess it's not even like Hasidic, but the Orthodox communities in Los Angeles. The Orthodox Jewish communities in Los Angeles are like very, is, is much more, uh, is much less isolated Getting married. When you're 40, he has two kids and two, two grandkids. So it's wrong, it's wrong to have 20 grandkids. 20 is a joke. My father has hundreds. We are now entering the heart of Hasidic Williamsburg. Okay, let me rephrase. We've been at the heart the whole time, but until now we were in a part that also had government housing. Okay. So it ends up being a lot of people who are not Hasidic. From the BQE until Flushing Avenue, 100% of the people living here are Hasidic people. This way. This is a sofa. They write the Torah scrolls by hand. Oh, cool. The Torah is a compilation of the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, and it's written in a long scroll that all Jewish temples or synagogues have inside them. The Torah represents the totality of Jewish teaching, culture, and practice as instructed by God. When all Jewish people turn 13 years old, boys or girls, they have something called a bar or a bat mitzvah, which is a ceremony where they read a verse in the Torah to officially become an adult and be held accountable for their own actions. My bar mitzvah was on June 12, 2004, and it was a day that I'll never forget. You have a lot of nostalgia here. I lived here my whole life. <laughs> How do you feel like being here right now? It's very weird for me, actually, because I grew up here. It's a fact. I spent my I spent the first 20 years of my life here, but at the same time, I've been out for a long time. I left for many reasons, and ultimately, I um, came out to my dad with the help of a rabbi. I really spent two hours trying to talk to my dad in the most respectful and religious way. And his reaction was first to say something extremely sexist, of like, why would you do that? Women are worth so much less than men, which is something that is... Wow. And then said he was never going to talk to me again. And he hasn't. We're going to turn out to a black that I've not been on for 10 years. Okay. And there's two very interesting things for me in there. There's the synagogue that... Sofers have one of the hardest jobs in the world. Most of them have the entire Torah memorized, and they have to write the entire thing with natural ink and feather as a quill. Also, if they mess up once, they have to start all over. It's an insane job. That is crazy. Jesus Christ. Where my dad is the rabbi, the synagogue that is run by my dad. And then a bit further down, there's a synagogue run by my uncle, which is also the synagogue affiliated with the elementary school. Is this a block? This a block. So your dad's synagogue is on Ultra Orthodox do not do bat mitzvah, only bar mitzvah. Okay. It's, it's right here. Oh, it's right here. Right this, here. This. You're not comfortable. And you have to bury the mess ups, like people can't just throw them out. <laughs> How can you tell? Okay, this is uh, Abby's dad's synagogue right here. I'm trying not to stay here very long, but I respect you for taking me here. That's bizarre. So this is a big synagogue. The okay. Coming up. Yep. So this is now the rabbi of this community, now it's my uncle. Are you comfortable? No, I'm not. I'm just walking by and okay. back to that bridge. Wow, these synagogues are intense. I never thought I would feel intimidated by my own religion. It's such a weird feeling. So my family doesn't wear any wigs at all. So all my sisters and my mom and all my aunts and everyone, they shave their hair and then cover their heads with just a scarf. Wigs, oh. No, no wigs. Wigs are too much. They shave their head. Shave bald. Shave bald on a triple zero. That's the other part that I think is very important for people to realize. There are some beautiful parts, but I think it all gets wiped away by the fact that people can't choose. For people who want to choose this way of life, I will fight for their right to choose this way of life. Right. That's what they want. But right. the reality is that most people don't have a choice. It's your whole life. Why know? is there no Israeli place? They're anti-Israel. They're extremely anti-Israel, trying to say. I, I, this whole community is extremely anti-Israel. I was shocked to... I told you, like, uh, the Orthodox community, the, uh, the Orthodox community goes e in either direction. The one thing that they align on is, like, being super conservative, okay? 
this is something that I've stressed before. Like it was a bit of in anti-Zionist circles, it was a bit of a faux pas to point to the Netarai Carta, at least in like the last 10 years, I would say less so now because of like how wild uh, sometimes Netarai Carta and other sects get specifically on their anti-Israel uh, commentary. But overall, like some of the, some of the uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews are very anti-Israel because they believe that the accurate, uh, the accurate interpretation of the Torah implies that Jews are a nation. Jews are not supposed to have a nation state uh, until the Messiah comes back. And then there are, of course, other ultra-Orthodox Jews that are super pro-Israel. The tunnel guys are on our side? No, I, I don't know. I don't know which sect it is. ...to learn that some Hasidics have mixed feelings about Israel. I mean, remember the Yeshiva University student that I just met at the Israeli Grill? I believe... Yeah, it goes either way. In Israel, there's a massive ultra-Orthodox Zionist community. And in the next 40 years, they're predicted to constitute most of the population because their families are so large. Yeah, but then there's also an ultra-Orthodox uh, anti-Zionist. Like some of, the, some of the ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel also are the ones that live in Jerusalem that constantly duke it out with the fucking cops that are like pro-Palestinian and anti-Zionist. And uh, those are the dudes who always fucking duke it out with the, with the IDF and the Israeli police regularly like when you whenever you see like whenever you see a bunch of uh uh ultra orthodox uh, uh jews in jerusalem getting beat up by cops they're the ones who are uh super anti-israel right but then you also have the ultra orthodox zionist jews who are also seen as like uh weirdly contentious they have a weirdly contentious relationship because like again Israel, as it stands currently, the Israeli Jewish population is very secular. They're very, uh, like, they're, they're progressive, I guess, in many different respects, whereas the ultra-Orthodox Zionists are not. So they not only are, they not only are, are uh, uh, Zionists, they also comprise of, like, the settler population, and on top of that, don't serve for religious, uh, don't even serve in the IDF because of the uh, religious exemption that they get. So it's like very, it, it, it's like frowned upon almost. Like there is definitely, like obviously as we've talked about before, as far as like um, Zionism goes inside of Israel, inside of the Israeli Jewish population, the overwhelming majority of Israeli Jews are obviously pro-Israel's expansion or Israel dealing with Hamas or dealing with Palestinians across the board. But there are some uh, deviations. There are some uh, uh, distinct features within uh, Zionism in Israel where, uh, you know, a lot of people obviously don't give a shit about, like, leveling Gaza, as we have seen uh, from the polls. But then there also are like, but we still want to do gay stuff, for example, and don't like how uh, religious conservatism is, is, is basically taking over the government without recognizing that the religious conservatism can only take over the government because of the reactionary attitudes that the overwhelming majority of Israelis have towards, Israeli Jews specifically have towards uh, the Palestinian population. And... Uh, beyond that, like I said, it's just like, it's seen as like hypocritical that the Haredi Jews like don't serve in the IDF, which is seen as also, again, a secular institution while simultaneously uh, taking up a lot of the resources of the IDF by uh, engaging in like settlement expansion and constantly like uh, making life living hell for the West Bank Palestinians. And there are definitely, I would say, liberal Zionists or, or some Zionists in Israel amongst the Israeli Jewish population that consider the West Bank expansion to be gross and disgusting and, and see those guys as like psychos. They even, as far as I've seen, I have a very funny way of shitting on uh, those uh, uh, like expansionist uh, settler uh, uh, Jews in, in West Bank where they call them Christians. <laughs> 
Like that's like a, that's something that I've seen uh, when they when they talk about some of the some of the I guess messianic Jews or uh, some of the Jews that are uh, invested in like settler expansion, like the settler uh, uh, Jews. They they call them Christian. That all Jews belong belong in Israel. But Abby is telling me that the anti-Zionist Hasidics are from the Satmar sect who make up the majority of South Williamsburg. Zionism is a movement for the development and protection of Israel. The Satmars believe that establishing a Jewish state before the arrival of the Messiah is a violation of Jewish law. When will the Messiah come? Who knows? But until then, you will not see a single Israeli flag on these streets. We all pray every day that we should return to Israel, but uh, a holy one, like uh, yeah. one that is, that is, we want to see divine power, not some you know, just tanks and missiles. There's a school bus with Hebrew writing on it that's parked right in front of an actual school. No English, just Hebrew. Look at that security. That looks like I'm in a, like a Islamic country and there's a checkpoint. Security and, well, that's all Jews, all Jews play in New York. Yeah, because it's gone up since. Chabad schools across the world do not celebrate Israel's Independence Day. They are adamantly opposed to the national anthem. Hatikva, even waving an Israeli flag or having one in a Chabad center is frowned upon. They have lives Terrorism. since Pittsburgh, yeah. yeah. Nothing's a Pittsburgh shooting. Starting your eyes means not looking at people who are not just Oh, it's not just the idea of most of the ultra-Orthodox population doesn't work generally, which creates some political tension between secular and religious groups as far as welfare goes. There's an ultra-Orthodox conservative parties like the Shahs that are also weirdly fight for lefty economic reforms like raising the minimum wage. Yes, that is another part that I forgot. Like, uh, they, they see... They see the ultra-Orthodox population as, like, uh, welfare queens as well. Like, they, they look at... The rest of the Israeli society looks at they they see themselves as like way more progressive, and look at the ultra orthodox community as like um, as a burden, as an economic burden that they like. Why are we taking care of them? Why are we why are we funding the settlements and why are we defending the settlements while simultaneously like obviously not having that big of a problem with the IDF, loving the IDF as a secular institution that they hail as like the defenders of Israel because they're Zionists. They simultaneously. It's the land of contradictions. I don't know how else to describe it other than the very same contradictions that you see in American politics, you very much see in Israeli politics as well. It's because when left unexamined, settler colonialism will inevitably lead to such contradictions that you hold on to inside of you without even recognizing that these two ideas don't go along with one another. And then before you know it, you're like, how the fuck did this become a right-wing shithole? And that's exactly what is going on in America and of course, in America's extension, Israel. That's it. That's why it's like so similar uh, in, in commentary because you're like, on the one hand, you're like, oh, I want to do gay shit and I want to uh, like talk about Tel Aviv as like a, a place where, you know, the number one job is being a DJ and doing ketamine and having gay sex. But then also at the same time, I kind of want to do ethnic cleansing in Gaza. You know what I mean? And you can't have those two ideas in the same fucking mind. Like, you can't, you can't be like, I'm actually a, a, such a progressive guy, but also simultaneously, I think, like, ethnic cleansing is tight that's happening, like, a mile out from where I live. You know what I mean? The difference, of course, is that I think in the United States of America, at least, like, there is a more prominent... Um, I don't know. There's a more prominent like critique of 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 American imperialism amongst like the the left than there is in Israel. Also, the Haredi community is growing insanely fast compared to secular Jews. It's families with ten kids versus families with two to three kids. They don't serve. They get money to study in shul, basically, and this is what will become a growing problem. It's like the Israeli version of the migrant scare in Europe. Is the same thing with Holocaust survivors. They look down on them and a bunch of them are so poor they have to go and beg for expired food at night. Yeah, I did not know that as well. Yeah, that like I had no idea that the Holocaust survivors in Israel were treated so poorly. Um, what is this? SVPBerlin.org. Okay, well, Elant News, you sent me a, a, a German article? I don't know about that. <sighs> I 
It's in English. A culture war is being waged in Israel over the identity of the state, its guiding principles and relationship between religion and the state, and generally over the question of what it means to be Jewish in the Jewish state. The ultra-Orthodox community of Haredim are pitted against the rest of the Israeli population. The former has tripled in size from 4 to 12%. Yeah, let me tell you something, okay? Let me tell you something. To all the, to all the, the, the supposedly progressive Israeli Jews out there who, like, think, you know, we got to do... We got to keep doing the bombing campaign, okay? Guess what, dude? The more you continue with hyper-nationalism, the more the Haredim will inevitably take over and take away all of the nice little civil liberties that you thought you had, that you took for granted. And it's going to happen, okay? It's going to happen. But, of course, much love to the actual Israeli left, the, the you know, the, the tiny... A uh, group of people in Israel that are uh, protesting against the uh, anti-Zionist uh, Israeli Jews, and of course uh, the Israeli, the Palestinian citizens of Israel. Obviously, um, they see the problem, and I see them as uh, united in the same struggle because it is the same. You know what I mean? Like. It's like me trying to fucking describe to American hogs or even American, supposedly American progressives who are like, except, you know, I'm progressive, but also like America is, is kind of cool as the world police, right? Those progressives who I categorize in a similar way to how uh, supposedly progressive Zionist uh, uh, Jews operate in Israel. Anyway, let's continue with this video. Not looking at non-kosher. So they're going to help you believe something? They're going to help you guard your eyes. No, they're going to help you with advice and ideas. They're not trying to convince you to believe. They are, this community is not much into um, convincing people who don't believe to believe. It's more about people who believe, but like people who struggle, people who sometimes watch porn or like stuff like that, but they believe that it's a problem. They help you. So they think you, nobody watches porn here? No, they know that some people do, and that's exactly what this is for. How did this community start? Okay, so the Hasidic movement was founded by actually my direct ancestor. His name is Rabbi Israel Ben Eliezer. My father's father's mother's father's father's mother's father's father, father created, founded the movement. I was taught from a very young age to be very proud of it. We lived in a small village called Mezhebish in Ukraine. Okay. So the, the area that's now Ukraine had millions of Hasidic Jews before the Holocaust. Okay. The vast majority of them were killed sure. by the Nazis. So and this this community was born af right after the war? After the Holocaust, yes. They, they and, came here, they in, settled here? in many ways as a result of the Holocaust. I think it's amazing how these immigrants of Holocaust survivors are still able to practice their traditions in New York the same way that their ancestors did hundreds of years ago in Eastern Europe. Walking these streets makes me feel like I've entered into a time machine back to the 1800s. It is truly remarkable. Right now, I'm eager to step inside a synagogue and learn from the ways that Hasidics pray, but I'm out of luck in Williamsburg where the strictest rules apply to outsiders. Abby tells me about another Hasidic district called Borough Park, where the chances of me entering a synagogue are much higher. As soon as we arrived, I saw one out of the corner of my eye, but Abby chose to hang back with the cameras, so I went in alone with only my iPhone. It's not clicking. It's hard to explain the feeling of being Matt in that synagogue, was YouTube? surrounded by fuck? Hasidic Jews engaging in their most important duty, prayer. Some might say I'm intruding, but I feel like it's my duty to unlock these stories for you guys to see with the hopes that we can all appreciate diversity. On that note, I'm heading into a local shop to get myself a yarmulke, a Jewish cap made of cloth and worn by men to honor God above them. So what we would wear, and what's most common, mm -hmm. is this is called a six slice. So these are bigger, and they cover more of your head. Mm -hmm. And then like if you were considered more modern, Hassan, you said it's anti-Semitic to say Jew own everything, but how can they afford so many child? Yeah, famously, the more children you have implies the wealthier you have in modernity. You know, that's why, that's why famously all of the developing nations where they're having population problems, right, are, are actually very poor. That's how it works. Yeah.
Brother, I don't know if you know this, but like, uh, you know, having multiple children is almost always, and almost always, both historically and certainly in developed society, uh, in in developed nations, uh, a a indication that you're not actually doing all that well. It is a it it, it has a direct association with poverty. <laughs> Hassan, how come Aya Sophia look like this <laughs> and not this? You would get one of these, which is just four pieces. That's like so funny because that's also extra funny because like people will be like, uh -huh, how can you say people in Gaza are being ethnically cleansed when their population has exploded? And it's like, yeah, dude, that's not, I don't know if you know this, but that's not a telltale sign of like an exactly robust and developing country, okay? Kind of the exact opposite. Got it. You think it's too small? That's perfect. Okay. He says it's perfect. It feels, it feels right. I've worn a lot of keepers in my day. I've never done this one, so it might take me a second, but let's see. Check you going, Garcia. Beautiful, beautiful. The shofar, everyone. How many shekels? <laughs> <laughs> now do I look, do I look a little more respectable? Now you look like, you look like modern orthodox. Like you can pass as a modern or It changes like, everything. This it changes, changes everything. everything. Specifically this kind of keeper, it changes everything. So Abby and I have discovered a ton of magazines all in Yiddish. This is a weekly newspaper. Because and that's it's three sick. of these. It's about the same Wait, size. So most people don't have internet, they just use this. Yes. Instead. And it's big. And then you got like, okay, so some of these are monthly magazines. Like these are monthly magazines. These are weekly. This is also something that can only exists without the internet. Well this looks like It's just photos. It's literally just photos. It, it's page six. Yiddish is an offshoot of German that was started by Ashkenazi Jews in the 9th century in Central Europe. Sadly, the language was nearly extinct Would you blow due to a show the Holocaust far? Fuck yeah. when 6 million Jews were murdered by Nazi Germany from 1941 to 1945. These murders were carried out in pogroms, riots, and mass shootings, as well as forced labor and gas chambers a, within concentration camps. It's a wild change of pace that he just dropped into the middle of, like, otherwise a kind of fun video where he was just like, and here's the Holocaust. Auschwitz, which is the saddest and darkest place that I've ever been in my life. Some 85% of all Jews killed in the Holocaust spoke Yiddish, or roughly 5 million people. And today, that number is a mere 600,000. If you ask me, it is surreal to hear Yiddish being spoken in the United States today. This is like really common. People will just come and buy a magazine yeah. and take it we home. Buy, we used to buy like one of those newspapers several things every week, yeah. Look at this. I feel like... Did Hasan obviously see Sam Cedar saying he wants to work out with Hassan? Are you kidding me? That's incredible. I would love to do that. Um, but also, uh, as far as Yiddish goes, like from what I understand... This is another like weird cultural thing with uh, the the Zionist nationalism project, where like the revitalization of Hebrew was uh, obviously it, it's like a phenomenal feat in linguistics, okay, in language. Um, except it, of course, would be as a standalone thing. It would be seen as a as awesome. You know, but it came at the cost of uh, a lot of ethnic cleansing, which is not so awesome. However, from what I understand, um, it also kind of uh, it also kind of eliminated Yiddish. I don't know if it's like it, it goes back to the same like we don't want to be associated with Germany in any capacity attitude. I don't know if it's like seen as an extension of the same thing that we talked about before within like Zionism and the cultural, uh, the, the cultural forces within Zionism treating Holocaust survivors or Holocaust vi like victims of the Holocaust is like weak and that Israel is strong and it will never happen to Israel again. That's why Israel has to be like very militant, which is of course, uh, ahistorical and wrong and kind of gross really. But, uh, from what I understand, it's like Yiddish is, is seen as, a uh, not great. Like the 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 revitalization of Hebrew came at uh, at basically a suppression of Yiddish. Hassan, this is borderline Holocaust denial. The revision, the revisionism of Yiddish mainly, and obviously came from the Nazis killing most Yiddish speakers, and not the Zionist project. 
no, obviously that played a significant role in it. But as far as I understand, there's a reason why a lot of the Yiddish schools and like a lot of the Yiddish being spoken globally now is done in America and not in Israel. Oh, sorry. How you doing? Obviously, the video just uh, mentioned that. You I didn't say, say that, that like... Part? I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, dude, I love that the chatter is yelling at me, but it's like... It's like considered... The exhibit, Palestinian Yiddish Chronicles, the integration of Yiddish with Arabic and its literary rise and violent suppression in pre-state Israel, but then also, like... um. As far as I understand it, like uh, David Ben-Gurion, who would soon become Israel's first prime minister, then spoke to the crowd in Hebrew. A comrade has just now spoken here in a great and foreign language, he declared. <laughs> Ben-Gurion's shocking remark was a part of the pattern of denigration expressed by advocates of modern Hebrew within the Zionist movement during the pre-state years. It aimed to delegitimize the Yiddish language using violence, intimidation, and propaganda. A year after its establishment in 1948, the state of Israel banned Yiddish theater and periodicals under their legal powers of control material published and presented in foreign languages. Where's that? I know I'm not, I'm trying to do better by not yelling at chatters, which I'm not going to, but it's a, it's a ridiculous thing to state that uh, I am engaging in borderline Holocaust revisionism when talking about something that I've read about, uh, Zionism and its uh, distaste and, and potential association with the Holocaust in and of itself. The other thing that I also mentioned, the other thing that I also mentioned specifically uh, with, uh, with, with, the, with Zionism and its like, uh, and its reinforcement of like being militant and and being strong like the invocation the the myth making of like being a strong and oftentimes militant nation also comes at a cost oftentimes the cost being that uh there is a a very weird association of like holocaust survivors and also victims of the holocaust that is borderline ahistorical as though they did not resist, as though they were weak, as though they uh, knew that they were going towards their deaths, marching towards their deaths, and just like kind of let it happen. That's the other side of the militant uh, Zionism. It's very, it's very messed up. But it is something that I've seen. Roll the video back 10 seconds to see something funny. Oh, <laughs> Wait. How you doing? You know what it says inside? I'm trying to figure that out. Anything emergency happens, people don't call 911 at all. People always call them. I memorize their number. It's uh, 7183 at 71. So it's like the. See? Shoreham Search and Rescue. Ambulance. It's like an that's emergency. That's what room. people call. Yeah, that's what people call. So. Is it like a trust issue? Like they want to be with other. It's a mix of a lot of things. It's a big mix of trust. It's um, They are. They, they usually arrive faster. They don't charge. Oh, really? It's free. Okay, okay. now Wait. I understand. Behind me, there's a Hasidic mother and a Muslim mother next to each other, pushing their kids on the playground. That's cool. What's it like to live in this like Hasidic community? It's rough because it's kind of a closed community, but it's got its beauty, it's got its innocence. It's uh, really different than the whole world, but it's, it's really cool. I'm Hasidic. I'm sorry, So dude. yeah, it's all good. So yeah, I grew what? up Hasidic. So why? Why this? Because <laughs> it didn't work for me, obviously. And uh, I went on my own. I went on my own path, my own journey. But there's nothing like home. There's nothing like coming home. And uh, there's literally long-term community members who are, I think, former Hasidic Jews too, right? Isn't there one a lot in of here love. right now? There's an awesome community, but it's it's definitely got its 
got its rough red like parts. Later in the day, I met up with Barry Weber, the most famous Hasidic musician who shared some pretty cool insight about his people. So the real meaning of the word Hasid, which means someone who does more than what justice demands from you. The movement of Hasidim started off with uh, Rabbi Sroel Bashem, and the purpose of that is as an ex Hasid, I really appreciate you showing all this to chess so people can actually learn instead of either being anti Semitic or Zionist bullshit people that think. Just to yeah. reveal the presence of godliness into the world, instead of us always trying to find where the holiness is, you become part of that. Your body is the vessel of your soul. The sun is getting ready to set, and Abby wants to take me to a legendary Judaica bookstore from her childhood. It is so impressive how these old-fashioned bookstores are still thriving in this day and age. I am 99% certain. What if this makes people more anti-Semitic? What? Bro, what do you mean? Who are you going to call Jew busters? And then you turned around and said, what if this makes people more anti-Semitic? I guess you were talking about yourself. Chatter, answer for what you said. Chatter's like, what if this makes me more anti-Semitic? Which, you know, I, I'm already bordering on it uh, currently with this... With this a joke. That's a couple who got married in the last week. So they're still week. getting to know each other. You can tell, Bo, by the way, they're walking Just apart a bit from of each other. Okay, take a, take a day off. Think about um, that. Rethink your the priorities. Night, after the night of the wedding, you're not allowed to touch for seven days until they go to the oh, mikveh. And it's a long story. So these are yeah, it's like, yeah, I watched a YouTube video up that, like, uh, dives in, in a very, like, humane way into a insulated and fundamentalist uh, religious community and I became more anti-Semitic as a consequence of that, which, you know, I already was. I, oh, I think he was joking around with the local ambulance group. I know. That's why I took, that's why I only give him a day off. Pick children's books, all of them in Yiddish, of all kind. English. You're proud of Yiddish. I'm very proud of Yiddish, but it's like, these things are made today for people who read it. Is this really the 21st century? TV special for $1.99? I can see through the window that the bookstore is busy and intense, and I'm debating whether or not I should go in with my camera. Luckily, the owner came outside and invited us in to learn about the books and the items that are sold here. Right now, I'm in the largest bookstore here. It's fascinating. Um, it's really beautiful in here. We have all different kinds of books, all in Hebrew and Yiddish. It's interesting because they don't have internet on their phone, so they come here to learn, to study, read books, magazines, newspapers, CDs. That's fascinating. Morty Getz, I grew up in Bar Park. So when I grew up, this is where I spent most of my time. This was always like the book central. It's not a library by the full description of what a library is, but it serves as a sort of library for children. How would you describe Bura Park and this Hasidic community? So it's a very vibrant community. It's just a second and third generation post-Holocaust. So the rebirth is amazing. I think the younger generation is not as aggressive as the first generation, but the first generation felt it as an obligation to the rebirth. You know, six million white dead, they felt they have to rebuild that. Do you know the significance of this? Significance of payas. So the commandment is to have, to leave some here on both sides of the head. That's a biblical and political commandment. It became more of a tradition of having us remember that we're part of this community. So it became more symbolic than the biblical uh, commandment. It became more of a symbol of a dress code. What's it like to live here? I love this place. Nobody ever sleeping. It's always stuff going on here. Do you uh, have any siblings? Yeah, eight. Eight. Yeah. Wow, so you come here to get all your information yes. for stuff? So this is a, this is a shofar collection? Yes. Is this so from a, a deer? One. A ram? A ram. So this one, uh, people from the Middle East, uh, like Yem the Yemen, they have large, large ones. Ashkenazi Jews mostly have the smaller ones. Why do Jews blow shofar? So it's a commandment in the Bible that at the beginning of the year we should blow. Yeah, I was wrong about calling what you said Holocaust revisionism, but I feel like, like we're not putting enough focus on the Nazis. The suppression of the Zionists wouldn't have gone that easy if not for them. I've seen a lot of people focus more on Zionists doing this than the Nazis. Wait, what? Because everybody understands that what the Nazis did was like the worst crime of all time. And it's more so shocking for Zionist Jews to do that to other Jews. That's that's what it is. Also, we're specifically talking about the evisceration of Yiddish. Notice how these guys in New York care about rebuilding. And that's why you have like Yiddish cultural centers and stuff in New York and in America. Because they wanted to combat uh, an evisceration 
of of an entire culture and language. Like Israel could have done that too, but they I feel like they have a distaste for Yiddish, possibly because of his German roots. I don't know. Or possibly because they see it as like something that goes against um the the uh social cohesion that they wanted to instill within the nationalist project of Zionism. You know what I mean? Because Israel, or at least Zionists, want, in my opinion, to kind of erase a lot of the other 2,000-year historical artifacts of the global, international Jewish population from all different, all different parts of the world because they want to turn it into one singular nation-state mythos specifically Israel, okay? That's the same principle behind, like, saying this is Israeli food, right? And not talking about the different uh, cultural roots of said food, right? Like, that's what it is. It's like uh, a lot of, uh, at least from what I see, a lot of the... KKK Hassan can't post links, but yes, it is a negation of the diaspora. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, it almost feels like if you are, if you have any, any sort of roots to anything other than like what benefits the Zionist project, like 2000 years of history, 2000 years of Jewish history is great. As long as it culturally plants you in Judea and Samaria. Okay. As long as it's culturally like you'll find a coin or something and be like, see, this is my, you know, family's ancient coin that they found in a cave. And that's why I, Benjamin Netanyahu, belong here, right? Like, that's fine. But if you're talking about like your Hungarian roots or your Hungarian culture, it's like that's, that's almost like frowned upon and, and not seen as a, as a good thing. Does that make sense? Blow with the sofa. Is Hungarian make sense though? No, Benjamin Netanyahu's family is Hungarian originally. It's like a, it's a, it's, it's nationalism. It's hyper-nationalism. I feel like the coin example was a really bad chosen one. Why? Like coin or fucking swords or shit like that. And no, the coin example is not a really bad chosen one. It's a specific one that like Benjamin Netanyahu has done before. It's like, uh, it's artifacts of being like, look, this is, my family's original roots. Now, the irony, the irony, of course, is that like, and I've said this before, if you look at the Palestinians, right? Like a lot of the Palestinians that are, that still consider themselves to be Palestinians that are Muslim or Christian have been in that region for a very long time. Some of them can trace back their roots all the way to like the original Christians too. However, the other thing is like, there's plenty of Palestinians there that like converted. You know what I mean? maybe the hundreds of years ago, but like they are the, like a lot of the, the same Palestinians that are being slaughtered by the Israeli state are unironically the, the Jews that remained. Some of which converted. Yeah. The coin thing was literally something BB did at CPAC. The Talmud explains it as if to wake up people from the dream once a year to do tshuva, <laughs> repent on their sins. It's a wake up call. It's a wake up call. In those times, that's how people used to, like, armies used to be reminded, like, wake up, so it was a wake up call. Like, you know, I was even tough, man. Like, you know. 
This video isn't complete until I experience a Shabbat dinner inside of a Hasidic household. For those who aren't aware, in Judaism, Shabbat is a day of rest that happens every week from sunset on Friday to sunset on Saturday. During Shabbat, it is prohibited to work, to drive a car, to use your phone, and even to turn on the lights during these holy 25 hours. All of the activity takes place at home, talking among family and friends, praying in the synagogue, and eating a massive meal. While I don't keep Shabbat on a regular basis, I do love to participate and I always enjoy this peaceful day of rest whenever I get the chance. However, bro, he didn't even fuck and he's got the fuck hat. I'm just saying, that's a little- For filming a Shabbat dinner no, inside of a Hasidic home is nearly impossible because it goes against the principles of not working. Let's just say that it took me four months to get permission from a rabbi to film the Shabbat dinner that you're about to see. He that's approved my mission valor. to document in good faith and share the beauty of Hasidic culture the only one hat? if I do the 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 fuck hat like when you when you get married or go on a mission but when you get married you get the hat the the furry hat the fuzzy not touch hat. or address the camera beyond sunset after several failed attempts is a way to flex on the haters my friend Shlomi, who is a fellow traveler and YouTuber about life as a Hasidic Jew, invited me into his own house, which is located outside of the city. How you doing? Hi, man. Good to see you. Hey, how are you? That's the girl. It's approved on this channel now, but Twitch Automods stops people from saying stolen valor by default now. That's so funny. That's a boy and the baby's a girl. My name is Shlomi Zayans. I was born in Borough Park, Brooklyn, New York. What is Hasidism to you? What does it mean? It's a very, very good question, a very deep question. I think Hasidism means a lot of things to a lot of different people. There are some people who are very focused on the inner Hasidism, which I, which I believe is the most yeah, important. Yeah, that's the plain guy that everyone was yelling at. And then it came out that he was like, kind of, you know, he was being kind of aggro about Israel, but people immediately yelled at him, not because he was being aggro about Israel, but because they suspected him of being aggro about Israel. Since part of it, there was somebody named Yisrael Baal Shem Tov. He lived in the 1700s in Ukraine. He felt that Judaism was getting a little bit dry. People weren't doing Judaism with enough passion. So he reinvented the whole... <laughs> Bro, I, that, that part is crazy to me. Like, 2,000 years? Bro, 2,000 years of tradition and then you just kind of have a guy who's like yeah we got to really spice it up a little bit and then it takes so much like it, it takes hold and people are just like completely aware that this is a, a a newer revisionist uh this is a newer revisionist it's like protestantism look at christian evangelicalism i guess yeah christian evangelism is like very very similar whole system of how we relate to God and how we interact with God and how Jews live. And, and many people would say that the Baal Shem Tov and the Hasidic movement saved Ashkenazi Judaism because there were so many people who would have fallen out if not for this new invigoration of life and excitement into the, into the Judaism. Interesting. You should make woke liberal Islam. That's literally what America thought it could do with Fethullah Gulen. That's not even a joke. Like, America was like, we kind of did, we kind of invested a little bit too hard into the, into like Wahhabist sects. So now as a counterbalance, we should literally tap into like Fethullah Gulen and try to create a network of schools in the exact opposite direction where it's like more tolerant and more liberal. And that was also a failure. Um, and you know. So it didn't, it didn't work out at all. I've seen your YouTube channel, you're doing a great job. Thank traveling you. as a Hasidic Jew and what you're learning from it and taking us through your life, which is awesome. Keep it up, by the way. I'm gonna um, try. Is that controversial among the community? I have some very open-minded rabbis who feel that it's important for people to understand what Shabbos is. And therefore, it's not like we're doing this every week. On a one-time yeah. basis, yeah. we brought people in with special permission from rabbis. And that's what we're doing again this week. Yeah, and it's very important to say that. So I just want to make it very clear that this Shabbos video that we are going to do today uh, was done with the permission of a rabbi. And anybody who's considering doing anything similar should please talk to their local rabbi. Bro, put a windsock, homie, what's happening? To make sure that this can be approved in a way that it goes in accordance with halacha, with Jewish law. I am about to do tefillin, which is a very... They are full of it like evangelicals do. Hasids are often found in strip clubs, sex clubs, brothels, etc. in New York City. Wait, really? No shot. Do they wear the drip? Like, do you take the... You don't take the fox hat to the strip club. You know what I mean? No shot. 
because that that find that I I find to be strange if you're like doing that level of sin, doing that level of sin while still like riding for the religion. You know what I mean? Very special experience in Judaism. I've done it maybe ten times in my life. I'm following oh, wow. the leader here. He's showing me what to do. Okay, so first of all, please lift up your left sleeve. Repeat after me. Baruch Atah. I, what what is it? By the way, can someone explain what this is to me? I'm sure they will explain it actually, because like it does look kind of strange. It looks like a little mini Kaaba. I don't know. I don't I don't want to come across as insensitive. It's a box with the scriptures. Tefillin is a prayer that involves a black leather box with leather straps containing I mean, scrolls sick. from the Torah. And then like this. And then this. Yes. And now we got it. All right. Okay. So, guide me. So, Shema, Shema Yisrael, Adonai, 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 Echad. Now, I would just suggest if you want to say, you know, think about your family, yeah. pray for your loved ones, and just have a moment. You can close your eyes, leave them open, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. It does look like the Kaaba. I'm not even kidding. By the way, we have to take the obligatory tefillin selfie. Sure. We call them telfies. And, uh... <laughs> But I'm gonna, I have to tell everyone that I wrapped Drubinsky. Yeah, of course. Please. Okay, so. I have a feeling what's in this box, and I feel like it's a hat. This is a hat. It's a very special hat. It's I a told you, chat. See? Chat. I told you. They got cool-ass boxes for the hats, too. Hats are... Those hats are expensive, okay? Stramo. Stramo. Yeah, Stramo. 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 Perfect. This is a hat that Hasidic men wear on Shabbos. Oh my they are goodness. very expensive. This one, I believe, was five and a half thousand dollars. Legend has it, back in uh, the 1700s, or possibly even earlier in Poland, there was a king or a count or someone in power who told Jews that they couldn't wear fur. But he made one exception, they're allowed to wear fur from a tail. Supposedly the lowest. The only time, the only time I've ever seen a hat box was when I was on a plane and I saw a Hasidic Jewish man with a hat box. I did not know that there were such things as hat box. This disrespectful, sure. cheapest part. So the Jews went and they made hats, completely made out of tails, and beautiful hats. They rock them like this, and every Shabbos, they try to put us down, and we lift ourselves up with a stramo. Cool, now, I have one for you, too. You have one for me? I'm going to put it on your head. Yarmulke stays on? I'm going to crown you. Yarmulke stays on. Okay. Yeah, what animal is it? Um, I think it's sable. You only wear this leading up to Shabbat, or do you wear it throughout? No, the you night? wear it throughout, like yeah. So, day. so I make kiddush, which is the blessing on on the wine. I'll wear it. Make hamaytzi, which is the blessing on the bread. I wear. It. I feel like I've seen, dude. I'm not gonna lie. I feel like I've seen this hat not on, uh, you know, Shabbos or whatever. I feel like I see it on like, on a Wednesday. You know what I mean? Some of these dudes are fucking rocking this to be like, listen, I fuck. It. A lot of people will wear it for the entire meal, but it gets kind of heavy and kind of hot. Yeah. So like usually when I start eating soup, that's when my body heats up and then I take it off. You got a nice little like lean there. Is mine yeah. straight or is Your it? strip club is real? Yeah, I heard that uh, someone in the chat was also saying like strip club installs mechitza to attract orthodox clientele. I did a little research on their lifestyle and we're moving forward with what I learned. New York, a local gentleman's club has erected a barrier to separate female patrons from the males in order to cater to Jewish males who adhere to stricter standards of modesty the most. I can't tell if this is a joke or not. Yeah, dude, this, this seems like, no, this is, a, this is like the onion or something. I feel like you just sent me like the onion. Look. In New York City, is never a joke. No, I think it's a, it's a joke about I, it, it's, I think it's probably a joke making fun of like the actual phenomena of Hasidic Jews going to strip clubs. There's a straight. I, I kind of like the curve. I like it too. It's like, it's, it's like the hood way. Hasidic, you know? <laughs> We're hood Hasidic. <laughs> Take me to your right hand. Yes, sir. Ooh. That no, jacket is sick. Yes, you are. Oh, wow. Looking good. What is this called? It's called a Bekesha. Bekesha. Now what's, now what's interesting is that it goes right over left. Oh. Okay, so... In Hasidic thought, the right side represents kindness and the left side represents judgment. You always want to have the kindness over the judgment. Make sure that there's more kindness than judgment. So we wear our clothing right over left. I like that. Good night, Shabbos.
You don't have payas, but because you have the beard. I bought the I bought the Pope version of that. That jacket. You kind of look like a new age modern chassid. If you didn't have a beard, then it would be harder to. Then people would be like, "Who's this guy?" But with the beard, yeah, you could pull it off. We're talking about all these um, things that happen on Shabbat, but for those who aren't Jewish or maybe don't know, Shabbat is a time that happens sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night. So twenty. Yeah, see, I had neighbors who were Hasidic. They would let me pay. Uh, they would pay me to flip the lights on for them during Shabbat. It's called Shabbos Goy. Yeah. Twenty-four hour period. Every twenty-five hours. Actually. Twenty-five hour period. Every single Friday to Saturday, no matter what, for existence, no matter what. Yeah. And during Shabbat, it's a time of relaxation, a time of family, and you don't, you're, you're not allowed to work. No cooking, no, no watering no the grass. Cooking, no watering. Like just chill. Just chill. How yeah. much do you get Shabbat paid for that? I don't know, but it's like it's it's I'm great. It's a cheat code. Not. That's what I'm saying. You just feel the presence of Shabbos. Can there. you shower? No. Can you shave? No. Can you brush your teeth? No. When you take a toothbrush and you put toothpaste on it, and most people put it under water as well, what's happening is that you're squeezing out water from between the bristles. And that's, you're not allowed to squeeze water out of anything on Shabbos. That's the problem with the teeth. It's not a hygienic thing, it's the water thing. So there's somebody who invented something called the Shabbos toothbrush. Rubber bristles, where the water doesn't get converged within the bristles, and then when you use it, you're not squeezing out. Do you see what I'm saying? Is all, there's so many cheat codes, it's awesome. It's just like, it's just, it's just so, like it's so strange from the outside looking in where you're just like what the hell is going on but yeah hold on let me see if i can find the entire eruv is basically a chico how do we get here is a question that many people might be asking themselves okay uh, maybe at the top of the hour, as a matter of fact, where there's a three-minute ad break. Um, and that three-minute ad break, of course, is coming to you. The cheat code against that three-minute ad break is not by getting a Shabbos Goy, however, by subscribing for $5 or for free with a Twitch Prime, by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account, where you get one free Prime subscription a month, or by getting gifted a sub. Here's the three-minute ad break now. Um, but the way we got here... Okay, the way we got here is this story. The story of this uh, the walls of the shul coming down as the treasurer of a Chabad uh, uh, decided to plug the hole that was illegally crafted. Okay, and then a different sect within the uh, ultra-Orthodox Hasidic Jewish community uh, being angered by the secret tunnel's uh, existence, or rather not existence, but the being angered by the secret tunnel being taken out. Anyway. At what point does it stop being cool, quirky, and unnecessary to borderline concerning like this? I mean, I, I love tunnels. I don't have an issue with that at all. I respect Hasidim and Orthodoxy, but the rules and hacks are so funny to me. Like, you cannot break the rules, but they're... But the rules were made like a thousand years ago and the enforcement of said rules in modern era is just like vibes. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're basically describing a lot of like a modern interpretation of religion. It's pretty funny. It's, you know, it's whatever. As long as it makes people happy, I don't give a hell. I don't give a heck. I was trying not to curse. I don't care. Okay. Yeah, let's get I have to pee.
I think there's nothing cooler than standing for something. Okay, in this day and age, men have forgotten that there is a divine right to building tunnels. Okay? And if big government comes down and tries to take your tunnel away, you should stand for your tunnel. All men should have the right to build a secret tunnel. Okay? It's very cool. It's a cool concept in general. Okay, just a place to hang out with the boys. So when big government, the nanny state, comes down and tries to take your tunnel away by force, some boys will turn into men. A second bar mitzvah, if you will, when you stand against big government, the nanny state, taking your tunnel away, you have become a man once again. That's all I'm saying. Not everyone has the capacity to stand against tyranny like this. Shout out the tunnels in general? Yes. Anyway, are we going to spend all day in this? No. We're going to finish this video about Orthodox Jewish communities. And then we're going to move on from the tunnel stuff. Which, by the way, as far as I understand, the tunnel is being sealed off. Which is kind of messed up, in my opinion. They're already taking certain parts of the tunnel away. which is messed up. We went down a rabbit hole? No. We went down the tunnel hole. Not a rabbit hole, but a tunnel. That's all I'm going to say. All right, now, let's continue. Do you have a shot this toothbrush? I do. Yeah. Okay, good. You travel to all these countries. What if a flight gets canceled on Thursday and rebooked to Friday night? What do you do? I'm not going to be on that flight. Yeah, no chance. Flight. Only if it's a life or death situation. Death. So God forbid, like if I had medication that could save someone's yeah. life at the other end of the world, I'd get on a plane yeah. and bring it to them. Anything short of life or death, Shabbos comes first. My, my baby was born on Shabbos. Really? Now, we went to the hospital before Shabbos because my wife was in labor earlier, but if we had to, yeah, we would just get in the car and go to the hospital. Yeah, you got to... You gotta have a baby, you gotta have a baby. <laughs> you can have a baby at home, but, but most women aren't into that. So, it's Shabbat. This is a, a very meaningful time of the week. Is it usually just your family, or do you have guests come over? Um, so, we actually travel a lot, so like... Oh, you travel with him? Some of the time, yeah. Like, if it's like a really dangerous place, then I wouldn't go. You wouldn't go to Afghanistan or anything? No, I have three kids. Do you connect with other Jews on the road? Have you done that? Go to like Chabad's or any communities? For sure, we always go to Chabad. We kind of like rely on Chabad for like it's, restaurants. It is a lifeline. Like, I've yeah. done the same. Yeah, like they're they're amazing. They really are. First of all, I hope you're like absolutely starving and did not eat anything today. I'm pretty hungry. <laughs> okay, good. So we have some baked asparagus, Hasselback. Wow, that looks fantastic. Um, some sweet baked chicken, sweet potato pie. We have some rice to go with the fish. This is. Chillant. Yep. Like a beef stew. Yep, yep, I've had chillant. Chicken soup. Sorry. Wow. And here we have the beef wow. lasagna with wow. vegan cheese because we don't do milk and meat together. Right. We have the teriyaki salmon barbecue I ribs. This is insane. There is an unlimited. I'm telling you, dude. Chinese food is so important for Jewish people in America, okay? It's just like, 
It's so funny. It, it literally, it, it is. It is. It's just like, it's tradition. Like on Christmas specifically. And before you say teriyaki is Japanese or whatever. No, like specifically Chinese food. Okay. Limited amount of food here. We got some grilled cauliflower. <laughs> Wait, why? Uh, Chinese uh, restaurants are open on Christmas. Literally. Roasted eggplant and vegetables. And we have hot apple pie and... Potato Kugel. Wow, you've outdone yourself. Thank you. And some desserts. Over there. I'm kind of speechless. Most white Americans if won't deny or think about this. It's so integrated into Christmas that we just accept that question. Food is also the reason. Is it always the same dishes? That's a very good question. So basically, what we do is. Uh, also, Chinese food doesn't have a lot of dairy. Has. We start off with wine, then fresh baked challah bread, then usually people will go fish, soup, and some kind of main dish with side dishes. Um, but you can be kind of like, you can freestyle with what kind of fish. And this goes without saying, obviously, everything is kosher, always, yeah. everything. Yeah. Kosher is just a, a certain, it's kind of like halal, Muslim, it's similar. Yeah, so it's, basically what it is is um, kosher is any animal that is slaughtered, has to be slaughtered by a rabbi who took specific training to try to eliminate the suffering of the animal while yeah. it's being killed. Um, we don't eat milk and meat together. We don't eat pork, pork, we don't eat shellfish. I'm so in it, I never miss anything else. Thank God we're eating very well over here. We are just seconds away from 5.47 p.m., the exact time when Shabbat begins, which is actually the moment when you can identify three stars in the night sky. We are all dressed up in our Shabbat clothes, including Shlomi's lovely kids. You can really begin to feel the spirit in the air. Shabbat officially begins with the women of the house lighting two candles, marking the division between light and darkness. From this exact moment onwards, I will not be touching my camera nor addressing it to show my respect to the family. I have hired a non-Jewish camera operator who is present in the room and will be documenting from <laughs> his camera. You got a shop is going. I'm gonna bless my children. Loophole. When Shabbat starts, it's customary for the man to say a prayer or a blessing to each of his kids, and it's a beautiful sight to witness. <laughs> Wow. So we're gonna go into the kitchen and then wash the bread. Okay. And then we're gonna continue. Jews always wash each hand twice for ritual purity and actual cleanliness before reciting blessings and reciting Torah. Then they sing. <laughs> After that, they recite some prayers and take the first sip of wine, which everyone in the room drinks from the same cup. This big fluffy Jewish bread called challah always kicks off the it's Shabbat so dinner. Good. As far as like, I'm not like a big matzo ball soup guy. But freaking challah bread is so good. That I think is the most OP. Um, that is the 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 most OP like Jewish food item. I think it's so good. It, it's then very very good. Keeps on coming. If there's one thing that all Jews have in common, it is feeding you until you cannot breathe. That's a good glass of wine. Oh, thanks. There's some left. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not afraid. How many days did it take you to cook this? Um, Definitely more than one. All of yesterday. All of yesterday? Wow. Drinking alcohol is a big part of every Jewish dinner, and Shabbat is no exception. First, the of Shabbos? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Good job. Cheers. 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 Cheers.
Mayor, you're gonna have some water, okay? On a regular night at 8 p.m., what would I be doing? Maybe I'd be eating supper with my family, maybe I'd be putting the kids to bed, but I wouldn't have the clarity and peace of mind to just stop everything and be in the moment. With my boss is on my phone, on one phone, there's a second phone where someone else wants me, and everything's just all up in the air now. Like peaceful, relaxing. Oh, chocolate babkas are sick too. That's another great one. The food kept on coming, but soon after, I cut the cameras out of respect for Shabbat. I ended up staying at Shlomi's house a few hours into the night, and it was a wonderful experience to say the least. As a Jew and someone who has celebrated Shabbat in many countries around the world, I must say that this one was the most special, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to take you guys along on my. Wait, was that in the permanent hell? Hold on say that this one was the most special and who has celebrated shabbat in many countries around the world oh my I must god say that this one was wait is he in front of the is he in front of what i think he is in front of in that photo the the never ending fire pit uh what is it called the hell's gate gateway to hell that's such a funny photo soy facing <laughs> uh, soy facing outside the gates of hell Chat, this is, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, what was this, like a coal mine or something? And they thought they could just, like, blow it up and then light it on fire. And then it, the, the fire would uh, take out all of the natural gas. It was a natural gas deposit. And then it never stopped. So, this is a hole that has been permanently on fire for the past like 70 years. Oh, not 70, since 1980, I guess. On the world, I must say that this one was the most special, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to take you guys along on my quest to learn all about Hasidic culture, the good and the bad. As uncomfortable as it may be to witness how women and LGBT folks are treated by this community, or how sad it is that most kids do not practice speaking. I think um, he specifically did a video on women in, uh, in Hasidic culture English too. At home, nor have access to a well-rounded education, it's important to remember He's right, though. Like, the education part is, like, really crazy. Apparently, they have diverted funds away from public schools um, directly back into, like, uh, these, like, Jewish community schools, like, Hasidic uh, schools specifically. And, and it seems as though, according to the New York Times, yeah, no mention how they steal $1 billion in New York City public full, uh, school funds and barely teach their kids English or any core subjects is Yiddish. 1,000 kids took state standardized tests and 100 of them failed, 100% of them. It's borderline, a borderline cult abuse shit. Nobody talks about it. Important context so people don't think it's just some harmless insular community. So that is like, that is definitely one of the uh, genuine, insane uh, aspects of the uh, Hasidic community. He, th that chatter is aggro, but he's 100% right. Okay, there is no, there's no two ways about it. And the way I'll describe it to you is by um, making a comparison to Christian schools. This is something that happens with Christian homeschooling as well. Betsy DeVos literally was the secretary of education, if you recall. This is basically what she did in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Michigan, right? Like, it's identical. It is identical. And it is completely unacceptable, completely inappropriate, absolutely ridiculous. In Hasidic enclaves, failing private schools flush with public money. New York's Hasidic Jewish religious schools have benefited from $1 billion in government funding in the last four years, but are unaccountable to outside oversight. So, it's really, really, really bad. And it's it completely, completely unacceptable. It's also really hostile towards women who want divorce, suffer from domestic abuse, especially since the lack of resources in the community backing successfully remove themselves from their household. Yeah. So, you know, as, as like, uh, there's definitely the, the other side of this as well, is what I'm saying. There, there's definitely uh, the, the uh, negative side of this as well, for sure.
So it's not all just like haha fun stuff uh, and and crazy. But the tunnel thing, on the other hand, well, tunnels are cool. Remember where Hasidic Jews come from and how they came to be, which explains why they hold on to a lifestyle that seems so backward to the rest of us. In many ways, Hasidic Judaism can be looked at as a miracle. For a group of a half million... <laughs> this chatter has been saying this nonstop. The tunnels are a cover-up for the truth. The earth is hollow and you know it. You know what, chatter? You might be right, okay? You might be right. I think the Hasidic community uncovered a deep, dark secret of the earth, which is that the earth is hollow. Jews who are direct descendants of Holocaust survivors to have such discipline in preserving their traditions and identity for over 250 years is unbelievable. As the world keeps evolving- Isn't hollow earth like some esoteric Nazi shit? Come on, dog. Like- no, dude, it's not like, I don't think this chatter is really advocating for that, okay? Jesus, Lord, mercy. Yes, the Nazis believed in a whole bunch of nonsensical, esoteric silliness, okay? Because they were deeply embarrassed by the fact that their cultural mythos did not feature anything but mud huts, beyond a certain age so they had to go back in time and like dig up stuff and basically make up things about uh you know in order to instill some kind of like german mythos all right yeah that's why they desperately like they identify themselves with like runes like nordic runes and things of that nature but that person is not talking about it like that they're just making a joke Wait, Jules Verne was a Hasidic Jew? Are you joking? No. Were there any Hasidic Jews in France? What the hell are you talking about? Oh. I thought you were being serious. For a second. This is a joke is on. Yeah, before we get to Matt Pat, so you know, let's wrap this up. Like I said, uh much love to those who want to make tunnels. Make love and make tunnels. Okay. Aaron Rodgers popped off with COVID denialism again. COVID truther nonsense. But before we get to all of that good stuff, let's take a look at Donald Trump. And his and a judge and a federal judge making arguments on presidential immunity that are, if I do say so myself, completely identical to the argument I made yesterday. And I'm no constitutional scholar. Here it is. Because it's so, it's such a poignant moment that Judge Florence Pan asked of this very court. She had a litany of things, including selling military secrets, selling pardons, and ending with this huge type of- Instead of MatPat, can we talk about the equator state of emergency? Chatters, not MatPat, look into the equator. It's a cartel takeover of the country. It's going on right now. So, Chatters, what do you want me to do? Like, I, I don't, like, I, I need to learn more about what's going on before I can give you information on it. If there was breaking and developing news on Israel, well, that's in my wheelhouse, okay? Situation here in Equator is Ecuador, am I saying? See, I'm saying it wrong. I'm not even saying it right. It's Ecuador. I am ESL. Okay? It's just like my point is I can't I can't cover everything. You're getting bullied, son. I know.
maybe a couple minutes with the Congo. Oh my God. Here it is. It's just very sad. I'm sorry. No, I mean, I'll look into it. I'll look into it and, and cover it. Um, later after I read a little bit about it. Okay. feels like I'm living through hell. Yeah. I need the. I don't know enough. You can do the ethical journalist thing and read us a Wikipedia on stream about it. Yeah. I'll just read the Wikipedia page for uh, Ecuador. All right. Let's continue with the judge asking if a president can order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a rival. Hear Trump's lawyer's response. Now, one thing that's interesting about this is that, uh, like I said, I made the exact same argument, Okay. I made the exact same argument yesterday. Pathetical. Listen to this. Could a president order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival? That's an official act in order to SEAL Team 6? He, he would have to be and would speedily be, you know, uh, uh, impeached and convicted before the criminal what prosecution. If you weren't? What if he weren't? There would be no criminal prosecution, no criminal liability for that? Chief Justice's opinion in murder against Madison and... Uh, 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 and the, our constitutional tradition and the plain language of the impeachment judgment clause all clearly presuppose that what the founders were concerned about was not. I asked you a yes or, yes or no question. Could a president who ordered SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival who was not impeached, would he be subject to criminal prosecution? If he were impeached and convicted first. And so, so your answer is, is, no. is My answer is qualified yes. I mean, I'm, we all, at that point, we all in the room kind of sat back for a second because, first of all, to make a concession of any kind, it's, it's major. But when you hear that, trying to go through the hypotheticals, trying to follow that thread of common sense and logic, what struck you about that moment where he essentially has a qualified yes that a president could actually order an assassination, and if he's not impeached or convicted, immune? I think he's really making the argument for Jack Smith. This is exactly what Jack Smith has been worrying about, that are we a country of presidents or a country of kings? And I think what Trump's lawyer effectively argues is that we are. Bro, I literally made the argument yesterday and you said it was insane and not realistic. Socialism equals theft. I'm a raging capitalist now. No, I made the argument as well about like the president can't call a, call a hit directly. I simply stated that using that as an argument rather than in the public's eye rather than the kingship is silly i used the argument of of the president calling for an assassination i literally said the president well not calling for an assassination i said the president can't just simply during the state of the union during the state of the union can't just you know take a gun out and kill someone something along those lines but as far as like presenting it in court, yes, I do think that this is ridiculous that this is even being discussed. None of this is a unique thought, of course. But the reality is that the fact that this is genuinely being deliberated on, okay, genuinely being deliberated on, oh, oh also Chatter, you said, what if Trump did that? Okay, as in like Trump could potentially do that. If you pull the clip, you will realize I was responding to the likelihood of Trump doing that, not necessarily using it as an argument in court. You literally said, what if Trump becomes president and then turns around and actually, you know, uh, assassinates Democratic Party members? And I said the likelihood of that is low. However, I personally had also brought up how ridiculous it is that this argument would extend to Donald Trump being able to technically, in a state of the union, execute someone with a gun and then turn around and say, well, this is technically within the presidential rights. Are a country of kings that the president can act and now it's in it's a matter of of record that like trump's 
lawyers are unironically arguing that you can do that. As he wants, as he chooses, whether it be violence. Uh, you know, we had violence on January 6th, but he's saying the president can take it a lot further. The president himself can direct that violence openly uh, using official government resources, and that's fine. And I think what it does, it establishes how dangerous this presidential immunity argument truly is. And to your point, Ellie, you know, we could have had the kind of the original argument that spoke about the so-called outer perimeter, which saying, hey, I was just doing my job and to protect me and to protect the institution, I should be given some coverage. The same way presidents get civil immunity. What they've done is say, let's go further. That the president, even when he effectively is not upholding and effectively executing the laws, in that scenario, he's still covered. When he's breaking the law, he's still covered. That no one gets to sit in judgment over a president, and I think that danger was seen by the court today. Well, and there was skepticism, a, a lot of it, from which we expected, though, from the judges, but I think in a real way. I mean, Judge Henderson, who is the senior judge uh, out of these three, the Republican, who was appointed by a Republican president, said at one point, I think it's paradoxical to say that his constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed allows him to violate criminal law. But what Judge Pan also noted is that that is not the understanding that, that senators have, because when Trump was actually impeached and then it went to the Senate, a lot of them, including Senator Mitch McConnell, said this is something for the courts to take care of. This is something that he should be handled in a criminal prosecution. There's something really strange about, like, the way that Republicans have usually responded to stuff like this. Because on the one hand, Donald Trump is literally making the argument that, like, maybe as president he could murder people. Like, his, at least his lawyers are making that argument. While simultaneously the rest of the conservatives in the Republican Party have to be like, oh, no, you don't get it. He's just joking. And then Trump is consistently like, no, I'm not joking. It's very odd. It's kind of, it, it's no, it's, it's not dissimilar to the way that like Israeli politicians in Hebrew will be like, I'm doing genocide. I love doing genocide. Palestinians are dogs who deserve genocide. And then like the defenders of Israel in the Western world have to turn around and be like, you guys, what, what do you mean genocide? Come on. They're not being serious. I mean, I don't think this is the international, you know, court of justice. I mean, <laughs> that would be ridiculous. I mean, if you do, I mean, come on. It's not, it's not really it's like putting their defenders in a weird position All over and over again. Yeah, kind of like how Kanye was on Alex Jones, where Kanye was like openly saying insanely anti-Semitic things. And then Alex Jones was trying to stop him to be like, oh, come on, uh, you just mean like rich people, right? Like, you mean like, uh, come on, you mean like the rulers of society is like, no dog, I'm talking Jews. <laughs> like, <laughs> come on, that's not how we, uh, <clears throat> listen up, Kanye, we're not supposed to be saying stuff like that. Or that could be handled in that way. Yeah, it's a great point. There's obviously two very different talking points. The problem with the argument that Trump's lawyers just staked out, there has to be an impeachment and a conviction before there could be a prosecution, is it leads to absurd results that cannot be the way this works. We all know impeachment is entirely different. A judgment about, about whether to impeach could be political. It could be based on any number of factors. That is just a different ballgame altogether than a decision whether to prosecute and eventually convict somebody. And the thing, the thing I keep coming back to is they had an easier way. Trump's team had an easier way. They briefed a better way. They just made the traditional argument of what he's charged with doing here was within the scope, within the outer perimeter of his job as president. And if they stuck to that, I still, I still think they probably would have had a losing argument, but they wouldn't have had a preposterous argument. And I think they would have had a stronger case to make. Well, first of all, I mean, just think about this. What that would suggest, as long as I can hide my behavior long enough to be in office and avoid impeachment, I can get away with anything I want. All I have to do is not have transparency or eyes into what I'm doing, because the only way to have an impeachment is if, one, I know about your behavior, right? If the House is going to bring the impeachment articles, if then we'll actually have the actual moment to conduct an actual trial. So all I got to do, if I'm the President of the United States, is just bide my time. That's part of that argument. But there is a moment here, too, when the council, I mean, the... Um I think it's pretty funny that they're talking about this as a hypothetical, but, like, that's kind of exactly what Donald Trump did do. Because Republicans, every step of the way, 
Republicans every step of the way were like, uh uh-huh, impeachment? Mm, this is a political argument. Um, actually, why don't we leave it up to the courts, as a matter of fact? And then now that they're like, okay, well, we impeached you. We didn't convict you. You said you would leave it up to the courts. They're acting like, they're acting brand new. They're like, well, what do you mean it like that? Don't bring it up to the courts. The courts are fake and gay. And also, the courts famously, notoriously hate Republicans, red-blooded patriots who were hot and shouldn't be punished in courts. We were just kidding about the court thing, actually. We hate the rule of law. It's also pretty much Watergate if Nixon didn't hire the most incompetent folks to do the operation and remembered he had voice-activated recording devices in the Oval Office. Yeah. It's so funny. Like, the Republicans collectively said, in an identical parallel that can be seen on January 6th that I covered briefly, on January 6th, they went from, oh my God, I can't believe how, you know, unruly this is. We have to do the rule of law thing. Stop rioting, please. You're not Antifa. To... Actually, these are patriots that were uh, harmed and are being held hostage by the American government three years later. Same energy between, um, let's just, uh, this impeachment thing is a sham. It's a mockery. Let's actually, let's actually have the court settle Trump's uh, insurrection, like Trump's dealings. Let's have the justice, the criminal justice system deal with it. And then when the criminal justice system is dealing with it, they're like, absolutely not. That's unacceptable. We, that's, how dare you? How dare you do such a thing to our beautiful boy? Okay. I guess you just don't want, you know, a Republican to ever be prosecuted, which is ding, ding, ding. Exactly. That's the goal. The special uh, counsel from DOJ um, spoke about this issue, but I want to go back for a second to the lawyer for Trump, because in this soundbite here, he talks about the idea that the notion for of criminal immunity not existing is a shocking holding. They are standing tall and saying, look, there has got to be some level of immunity because they're talking about President Biden and other people. Listen to this. To authorize the prosecution of a president for his official acts would open a Pandora's box from which this nation may never recover. Could George W. Bush be prosecuted for obstruction of an official proceeding for allegedly giving false information? Oh my God, I can only get so hard. It's like inappropriate if I keep listening to this. I might nut on camera. Oh my God. Oh. Oh, oh God, dude, don't, don't do it. Don't threaten me with a good time, King. Don't do it. To Congress to induce the nation to go to war in Iraq under false pretenses. Could President Obama oh. be potentially charged with uh, murder for allegedly authorizing drone oh. strikes targeting U.S. citizens located abroad? That's the political question that Trump was raising. And we played that clip earlier about the threat, so to speak, and what would happen next. That's the heart of the matter. If you open this sort of Pandora's box politically, Trump will suggest, well, then everyone is fair game. But the argument uh, that James Pierce made and re- as a rebuttal to that was if you can't, if you do go by what the prosecution or what the defendants or, or the Trump's attorneys are saying, that then it would open up presidents to being able to commit a whole host of criminal acts and to get away with it. Yeah, exactly. Both sides have this slippery slope argument mm-hmm. that they're putting forward. But I think you know, an important argument from, uh, from the Jack Smith side, speaking about history here, there's a whole lot of talk. Okay. What do you mean slippery slope? No, the Republican argument here, the Trump attorney argument is a slippery slope argument. The other argument is not a slippery slope argument. It's an application of the law. And also, in, in, like, one is talking about stopping an active prosecution from, or, or an active criminal, uh, criminal uh, prosecution from, from continuing. The other is fantasizing about potential crimes the other is fantasizing about potential crimes that that uh, previous presidents convi- uh, could be convicted of now. On that, if you consider that to be a, a slippery slope, then yes, every application of the law is technically, uh, you know, being thought about 
on the basis of like who it applies to. And that's always going to be a slippery slope. I think it's, I don't know. I think it's ridiculous uh, to, to be like, oh, both sides' arguments are, should presidents be above the law? Okay? And one is saying, like, well, what about all the other stuff that presidents have done at the behest of, like, the American government and, like, American foreign policy and the continuation of, like, America's interests globally? Um, should they be prosecuted for that? And the other side is saying... If we don't prosecute presidents for doing stuff that's not at the behest of, like, American foreign policy, but o only on their own, um, you know, for their own personal gain, like what Trump did, and we don't prosecute him for that, then presidents can do whatever they want. And the real standard not being talked about here is whether or not something is being advanced for American global interests. You can do whatever you want as long as you are doing it under the umbrella of advancing America's foreign policy interests or America's interests in general. But the moment that you flip that script over to selfishly trying to preserve your own power, all of a sudden, you can't make that argument. That's basically it. If there was oil, for example, that Donald Trump could have you know, found by somehow... Uh, ensuring the continuation of his presidency, then it would be fine. But there is no oil to be found in the continuation of a second Trump presidency. Talk of what's happened in the past and the example of President Nixon, right? President Nixon engaged in his conduct, and what did he do? He accepted a pardon, right? He talked about we have special, we have the Iran Contra. And it, uh, investigation, right? We have, and Ronald Reagan, no one there thought that he could not be prosecuted. So I think the slippery slope argument, I think there's something there on both sides. But importantly, that is the nature of all prosecutions. We've both been prosecutors. For our system to work effectively, you have to have prosecutors that are acting with a sense of justice, that are using discretion appropriately. And that is true in every scenario, for everyday Americans and for former presidents. So that faith in our system, we have to have that for our system to make sense, no matter who the defendant is. So I don't think it's an especially strong argument to say someone could abuse this. We have courts that will review indictments. We have uh, standards of uh, burdens of proof, of reasonable doubt. You have to do a trial. So we have other fail-safes that's not just uh, you know, a rogue prosecutor can go after a former president without any recourse. So I do think, Jack... Um, first of all, but they should, and that would be sick. I'm a fan of that in general. It would not be a rogue prosecutor. It would be someone who's you know, considering uh, the extrajudicious killing of an American citizen to be illegal. I think there's a decent standard to apply. Okay? Yes, in the words of, in the famous words of Noam Chomsky, you could prosecute every president here. You said that if the Nuremberg principles were applied, every post-World War II president would be uh, indictable. It's probably true. Can we run, uh, run down them real fast? What did Eisenhower do that you would indict him for? Well, Eisenhower uh, overthrew the conservative nationalist government of Iran with a military coup. Uh, he overthrew the first and last democratic government in Guatemala by a military coup and invasion, leading to years of it. Uh, in Iran, it led to 25 years of brutal dictatorship, uh, finally overthrown in 79. In Guatemala, it led to massive atrocities, which are still continuing. That's after almost 50 years. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, this wasn't known until recently, but he conducted the uh, major clandestine terror operation of the post-war period up until Cuba and Nicaragua in an effort to break up uh, Indonesia, strip off the outer islands uh, where most of the resources are, uh, and uh, undermine the 
what was then considered as a threat of Indonesian democracy. Uh, Indonesia was too free and open. It was allowing a uh, political party of the poor to participate. And they were gaining a lot of ground, so that uh, uh, Eisenhower supported and helped instigate a military rebellion in the outer islands. Uh, this is just for starters. Now, these are all indictable offenses. What about Kennedy? Kennedy was one of the worst. Uh, Kennedy, first of all, invaded South Vietnam. Uh, during the Eisenhower administration, uh, they had blocked a political settlement in 1954 and instituted a kind of a Latin American style terror state. He's like, D he's like, don't get me started on that, dude. Which had killed maybe 60 or 70,000 people by the end of the Eisenhower uh, period and had... Indonesia has repeatedly been fucked over by imperialism, humanity, and mother nature. One thing that I found out on Twitter, it was a TikTok posted on Twitter, is that Indonesia also is ginormously long. As a matter of fact, most of the world is like at least one or maximum two Indonesia lengths away from Indonesia. Which is crazy because on when you look at like when you look at the map, when you look at, like, the world, right, it doesn't actually come across like that because of its positioning and the way that, like, uh, uh, the, the flattened out maps basically favor, like, countries that are away from the, the equator. Look at Indonesia. Indonesia is a country that is shocking that it hasn't been balkanized. Okay, time for my favorite nightly routine of taking Indonesia out Indonesia. This is all just to show you how absolutely warped the Mercator projection is and how it favors countries further away from the equator. Like, you know, the Netherlands. How's I been learning about map projections? Dude, it's crazy, the dude. US. It's like one okay, America. here we are in Europe. Dude, look yeah, at that. It doesn't even fit in Europe. It goes all the way to Afghanistan. I mean, look how puny the Netherlands is. Indonesia, which was a colony of the Netherlands, you could fit 45 Netherlands inside of Indonesia. <laughs> and now let's use Indonesia to cross over the Atlantic into the U.S., Love an Indonesia bridge. And now here. I love that she's done this so many times where she says things like love an Indonesia bridge. We are in the U.S. Looks like it doesn't fit. This is the crown jewel of Indonesia maps. This shows you no matter where you are in the world, how many Indonesias you are away from Indonesia. And there are very few places on the planet that are more than three Indonesias away from Indonesia. Like, look at how tiny that map is. Most places on the planet are only one to two Indonesias away from Indonesia. Clearly, only a small sliver of countries and places in South America are three or more Indonesias away from Indonesia. You can pretty much count on being only three. This is why Barack Obama is actually not Kenyan, but an Indonesian man. I rest my case. Less Indonesia's away from Indonesia. So that is a comforting thought. That's my new theory. A lot of Americans dropped the ball when they said Barack Obama is a Kenyan Muslim. Turns out... Barack Hussein Obama was an Indonesian Muslim. Specifically because he does kind of look like he could be related to the former presidents of Indonesia. I'm just saying. Indonesia, incredibly large. Indonesia, incredibly vast. Turns out Barack Obama, more likely to be Indonesian. Than Kenyan. What the world map should look like? The map of the world is a lot stranger than you think it is, especially this map. You've probably seen it a lot in classrooms or office buildings, but this map is extremely, very badly wrong. As we can all hopefully agree upon, the Earth is a sphere, and that means that it is impossible to accurately depict her surface on a two-dimensional map. 
Why is real life lore seven years ago putting this from the uh, filming this from the bathroom, dude? Each other, we get more and more. Okay, okay, come on, just show Madagascar me the Madagascar and New Zealand. Next door to New Zealand is Australia, and the UK looks so small just off the east coast in comparison. And Australia, in fact, is much bigger than most people believe it to be. Alright, let's get to the, the Czech Jews, Republic. which is like Africa, okay? Because as far as I understand, this like greatly favors countries. Yep, there it is. This greatly favors countries that are away from uh, the, the equator and also, uh, you know, specifically like North American uh like i mean not not north america sorry like uh northern hemisphere nations as well it favors the global north argentina scandinavia and the uk and still have some room left over russia is another place that looks pretty big at the top of the map but dropped down next to africa she also seems much smaller than what our map was telling us beforehand while we're still here in africa the democratic republic of the congo the irony is that it doesn't mean that Russia is tiny. It just means it should mean how uh, it should show you how massive Africa is because Russia is not a small country. Like it just shows you how massive the continent of Africa is. Congo used to be a colony of Belgium, but Belgium in comparison looks like this. Finally, we need to look at a few other places on the map to the north and the south. Let's start with Sweden, which looks big, but comparing it to Madagascar again, we see that it actually isn't. Iceland also seems like a large island, but it's actually roughly the same size as Tasmania, just south of Australia. And finally, we have the white elephant in the room of Greenland, which towers like a behemoth at the top of the map. Greenland masquerades as being a continent in her own right, looking bigger than Australia, South America, and being comparable to North America. But in reality, Greenland is much, much smaller. The globe reveals Greenland to be the island. What is the freaking music playing in the background. It's funny enough, funnily enough, not based on EU hegemony, etc. It's literally that the Mercator projection preserves angles for navigation. It is outdated, is never meant to show scale. It's silly that it's still used. Island that she pretends that she isn't, and we get a much more accurate depiction this time when we compare her to Australia, South America, and North America. And of course, we can't forget about the most shy continent in the world that everybody always forgets about, Antarctica, who spends her time hiding away at the bottom of the map. Most people don't truly have a good understanding of the size of Antarctica, which could probably go either way between being larger or smaller than you think, but the truth is Antarctica is a huge continent. It is much bigger than Australia. It can stretch all the way from Kiev to Uganda, and incredibly can be placed between the southernmost tip of Texas in the United States and stretch all the way into the northernmost islands of Canada. There are many more examples like this, but you've probably understood the point by now. Anyway, yeah. Um, how do we get here, dude? How do we get here? Oh, oh my God, we were talking about Noam Chomsky talking about the crimes of US presidents because we were talking about Donald Trump being indicted. Oh my Lord. Welcome, folks, to the Hassan Ibrahim broadcast. I do this every day. I run the top of the hour ad break, and this is this is it. If you want uninterrupted wall-to-wall -wall coverage, non-stop. If you want literally every moment, every ADHD slammed moment of this goddamn broadcast, then you best subscribe, baby, for five dollars or for free with a Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account, or by getting gifted a sub. God damn, dude. My brain is so broken. Dynamic jab 13. Thank you for the five tier one gifted subs. Allowing five people to no longer see the ads at the top of the hour. Let's get back to the crimes of presidents. Cab Calloway. Calm like a Tom with a 10 gifted. Gage against the machine with a five gifted. Harkin Watch with another five gifted. Here it is. Instigated uh, uh, a response, a reaction. Uh, Kennedy recognized that it couldn't be controlled internally. So he simply invaded. Uh, in 1962, uh, about uh, a third of the bombing missions that were carried out by the U.S. Air Force in uh, uh, South U.S. planes with South Vietnamese insignia, but U.S. pilot. Uh, they author he authorized napalm. Uh, he began the uh, use of uh, chemical weapons to uh, destroy food crops. Uh, uh, they began programs which uh, 
and drove millions of people into what amounted to concentration camps. Now, that's aggression. Uh, in the case of Cuba, it was just a massive campaign of international terrorism, which almost led to the destruction of the world, led to the missile crisis. Uh, and uh, we can continue. Again, these are all uh, indictable offenses. What about Johnson? Well, Johnson expanded the war in Indochina to the point where he ended up probably leaving three or four million people dead. I feel like this is Oliver uh, Stone's, he, like, uh, uh, biggest L. To block, uh, He's like, I feel like he rides for JFK a bit too much. You know what I mean? Which is like, I, I feel like that's a very common thing that a lot of boomers do. They fantasize about JFK because he was hot. It's like what, I would say this. I think Republicans now do the thing for JFK that Democrats now do for Ronald Reagan and even George W. Bush. JFK slander incoming? No, I think, like, people want to fantasize about a good president, and it's not, I don't know, I, I mean, it's not, it's obvious that you're fantasizing about a good president because he's hot. Because Noam Chomsky is correct. A cap for cutie, thank you for the five gifted, and Rojo, Tor Rojo Tortuga, thank you for the ten gifted. What looked like a potential democratic revolution there uh, supported uh, the Israel. Having said that, yes, Untold History of the United States is uh, Oliver Stone's best work. Yes, I agree. Early uh, occupation in its early stages. Uh, again, we can go around the world. Uh, pick your, take, them, take, say, Carter. You know, I'll, I'll get there, but Nixon's okay. next. Uh, Nixon, we don't even have to talk about. <laughs> we, we can skip that one, okay? <laughs> but uh, uh, Ford, then Ford. Well, Ford was only there for a short a time, but long enough to uh, endorse I the, the Indonesian gifted? invasion Where? of East Timor, uh, which became about as close to genocide as anything in the modern period. Uh, they pretended to uh, oppose it, but secretly supported, in fact, not so secretly. Uh, the, uh, the U.S., uh, dip, uh, for, uh, immediately after the invasion, the U.S. did join the rest of the world and formally condemning it at the Security Council. But uh, Ambassador Moynihan uh, was kind enough to explain to us in his words uh, that uh, his instructions were to render the United Nations utterly ineffective in any actions. It Which is very different than how we operate with Israel, for the record. Totally different. Oh, wait, it's not. That's exactly the American... That is the American playbook, folks. We do that all the time. Might take to counter the Indonesian in great, uh, invasion. And he says... And then when I say stuff like this, people go, Oh, Hassan, all you say is America banned. How dare you bring America into this? Why do you do this? Why do you do such a thing? America not bad. America small bean. And it's like so strange that it's always the same. It's always the same thing. I don't know how. It's proudly that he did this with considerable success. Uh, his next sentence says, uh, in the next few months, it seems that about 60,000 people were killed. And then he goes off to the next topic. Uh, that's the first few months went on to probably hundreds of thousands. Uh, six, uh, formally, the U.S. Uh, announced a boycott of weapons, but secretly it increased the supply of weapons, including counterinsurgency equipment, so that the Indonesians could consummate the invasion. That's just a short period in office, but that's indictable. Seriously, in fact, that's a major war crime. Carter? Carter uh, increased, as the Indonesian atrocities were increasing, they peaked in 1978, uh, Carter's flow of weapons to Indonesia increased uh, when Congress imposed. No, it was on the new liberal line is that it was the Cold War, so it was different compared to post-1991. Uh, Wait, 
What do you mean? So they think that that was like appropriate or inappropriate? I don't understand. Are they saying that to say that like post-1991 actions are appropriate? Or are they saying that it was inappropriate in the Cold War and they're appropriate now? <laughs> Hazy, my dude. You, f <laughs> you freaking CCP dick riding bitch. How dare you say America bad just because America is bad. Does stating the facts that America is a great Satan make you feel good? I don't care that it's true. It makes me feel bad. I somehow, however... I'm very different than the conservatives that I make fun of. I'm a liberal after all, which means I like to read books. I know that this guy's being, uh, you know, he's, he's memeing. But that is the, there is this, uh, this, this weird ethos in, in liberal circles where they're like, uh, my dude, I am not like a reactionary conservative at all. I make fun of the Republicans while simultaneously agreeing with them when it comes to American foreign policy. Because might is right after all. However... Unlike the Republicans who tell you that, like, they want to do American imperialism for racist reasons, I'm going to also say that America needs to do imperialism for racist reasons. However, I will try to intellectualize said racism. That's right, my dude. America is supposed to be the leader of the world. It's like... Yeah, a certain class of liberals buys into the JFK conspiracy as he was going to destroy the military industrial complex or expose the deep state or something. Dude was just a syphilic rich kid. <laughs> yeah. Did Chomsky mention the massacre of one million communists in Indonesia with the, first of all, one million communists in Indonesia with the U.S. giving lists of targets to the killers? Uh, yes, he did. Um, of course he did because that's a huge uh, a part of America's imperialism. Uh, but um, the thing about that is that uh, they were not one million communists. <laughs> they were women, college students, people with weird haircuts, trade unionists. And it was not actually, you know, uh, communist. Which, by the way, even if they were, that's still completely inappropriate it's just that they also weren't even communists. They were mostly just like it has happened in every other fascist coup, whether uh, that we backed, supported, facilitated, or uh, uh, anti-communist coups, uh, fascist coups that occurred everywhere else. Uh, it's, uh, it's just whoever they consider to be communist. So, yeah. The American intelligence apparatus goes after even center-left people. They call everyone communist because it's sexy. Yeah. A lot of Indonesian Chinese basically forcefully assimilated to Indonesia. Why are they indicting Trump instead of all the war criminals they're running through uh, other than the fact that they're mostly dead? Well, I mean, that's one of the reasons. They are dead. Um, the other reason is because of what I described. What I described to you was this. As long as crimes are done at the behest of American empire, that's fine. That's okay. That's permissible. Not even permissible. That's actually supported and encouraged. American presidents are supposed to do war crimes on a regular basis as long as it is to continue America's empire. American crimes, however, of presidents are totally not valid and not permissible if it's done for their own personal interests. I know Twitch laid off 35% staff. This is breaking news. I don't know anything about it. And I don't even think the Twitch staff knew anything about it. We will cover it in a second. I'm literally talking about the Jakarta method and America's war crimes in Indonesia. Can we please stay on message for a brief moment? Why are people saying F? It's making me feel like Twitch is... Actual servers are falling uh, right after I said that, even though you guys are saying press F for respects for the Twitch staff that have fallen. Wa Indonesia wa. 
That's crazy. Yeah, dude. One million people killed. <laughs> Suspected communists. Wah, wah. A human rights restrictions. By then, there was a human rights movement in Congress uh, to block the flow of uh, uh, advanced weaponry to Indonesia. Uh, Carter uh, arranged through Mondale, vice president, uh, to get Israel to send U.S. Skyhawks to Indonesia uh, to enable Indonesia to complete what turned out to be near genocide, killing maybe a quarter of the population or something. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East, uh, Carter just won the Nobel Prize. Uh, his great achievement was the Camp David Agreements. Uh, the Camp David Agreements are presented as a uh, diplomatic triumph for the United States. In fact, they were a diplomatic catastrophe. Uh, at Camp David, uh, the United States and Israel accepted, finally, Egypt's 1971 offer, which they had then, the U.S. had rejected at the time, uh, except that now it was worse from the U.S.-Israeli point of view because it included the Palestinians. Uh, in order to accept, get Israel to accept Egypt's 1971 offer, after a major war and atrocities and so on, uh, Carter raised uh, aid, military and other aid to Israel to more than 50% of total aid worldwide. Israel used it at once in exactly the way they said they were going to do, and as every sane person knew, uh, as an opportunity to attack their northern neighbor, first in 1978, then in 1982, and to increase uh, integration of the occupied territories. Uh, and that's for starters. We can continue. Reagan? I don't think we have to talk about that one either. I mean, Pretty much all the modern powers have done genocide and whatnot, China and Russia too. That delayed reaction is copium. Because, yes, all modern powers have contributed to violence around the globe, but to compare it to the hegemonic superpower is another way of, of Americans that engage in some level of, like, liberal cope to be like, well, everybody does it, right? And it's like, not to the same level or severity. Nothing comes close to it. If anything, you can talk about, like, local powers doing mini genocides in their own backyards, but almost always that comes from the... Uh, that almost always comes from America allowing it to happen or sometimes directly facilitating it. Like, the closest we can get to... Like, people, people always point to, like, the Hungarian... Uh, the, the Hungarian uh, USSR actions, right, in, in uh, Hungary. And it's like, what you're describing there is marginal in comparison to what America did all around the world. Like, it's just... I don't know. I, it just is frustrating. And then we turn around. Um, and, and we turn around and, and you know, run the uh, whole hypothetical argument of like, well, what if hypothetically Russia or China was a global hegemonic power? Then they would do the same thing. And it's like, yeah, but that's hypothetical. Like you're, you're looking at you're looking at the the hypothetical possible violence that other world powers would genuinely engage in, right? By pointing to, uh, you know, the need that America has to keep doing what it's doing currently in order to stop this hypothetical genocide in the future. Okay? Very frustrating. And it's unfortunately a very commonplace, uh, it's a very commonplace argument specifically for Israel. Crazy Chomsky didn't mention that Carter's actions in the Middle East, i.e. funneling weapons of the Mujahideen and allowing CIA to prop up and promote Islamist fundamentalists. By the way, I think he didn't because it hadn't come out yet. I don't know when this interview was done, but I think Brzezinski openly admitted that in... Uh, on a on a French newspaper in like 1997 or 
or maybe later. I don't know. If this interview is in the 2000s, maybe uh, he could have brought it up. But I'm pretty sure, like, um, Zbigniew uh, Brzezinski, Mika Brzezinski's father, uh, didn't reveal that bit. Uh, before, uh, uh, before, like, it was before 2001, before 9-11 happened, but it was, like, close to 9-11 happening where he was flexing about how they are the ones that, that brought Russia into Afghanistan uh, with the hopes that Afghanistan would turn to Russia's Vietnam by uh, arming the Mujahideen. Is the great leap forward not as bad, brother? That's th that is an incredible co like that is an incredible thing to compare. You understand that? Like, you're looking at no one, and I mean no one, at least as far as I know, in the history of the planet, looks to the Great Depression and points to it as though it's like a a phenomena that was brought about. Like we don't even if even if on the most communist, most leftist circles you look at like uh the mass amounts of wealth consolidation, it's still understood as like something that happened, like famines that occurred as a as you know, partially a, a natural mechanism of the economy operating. Okay. The problem is the way we the way we look at famines under communist rule is directly a byproduct of deliberate and systematic murders rather than a, a negative consequence of like oftentimes well-intentioned uh, uh, policy failures that legitimately create massive crises. Sometimes not so well-intentioned. It's, there's a difference between the, uh, the, the systematized machine of death and destruction and ethnic cleansing within the, uh, within the uh, Holocaust or the systematized machine of, of the extraction of labor through violent means in the form of chattel slavery or what uh, the, the Belgians did in the Congo and like countries trying to move away and collectivize within their own means after being uh, uh, victim to colonial violence and not being able to industrialize uh, adequately. To flatten all of that, to flatten all of that and, and uh, reduce it to this is uh, this was conducted. This was done through. Uh, this was done specifically uh, for for violence, for the sake of violence purposes. To look at it from a black and white framework is ridiculous, and it's a way to engage in copium, like countries doing it to themselves for one reason or the, or another, is still going to be different than America doing it to every country on the planet. It can right. So I think some people deliberately bring me to this conversation so they can like say, oh, you're immoral or your perspective is broken. Look, it's, hypocrit uh, it's hypocritical. It's hypocrisy. There is no such hypocrisy. And I will always duke it out on those terms if necessary. But of course, yes. I mean, these are, these are abject failures. The USSR had its own version as well. I understand and can contextualize why it happened. I can describe why it happened. How, however, having said that, yes, of course, it's bad. Famine is bad across the board. It is an abject failure, right? Yes, millions of death. Not good. Well, not millions, but still. The interview was from 2003, and the Brzezinski interview was from 1998. Chomsky just straight up failed to mention it. Yeah, big L for Chomsky. Reagan is the first president to have been uh, 
uh, condemned by the International Court of Justice for what they called the unlawful use of force, meaning international terrorism in the war against Nicaragua. Again, that's just for starters. Uh, they also, the Security Council, uh, endorsed it in two resolutions, both of which were vetoed by the United States. Bush won. <sighs> well, uh, for, we can begin with the invasion of Panama. Uh, the invasion of Panama, which, according to the Panamanians, killed about 3,000 people since it's never in. China and Russia have also done major imperialism. That was pretty much the whole point of the Cold War and not some ideological battle. Um, China's actions in, in every part of the globe was directly trying to either squash what it considered to be a rebellion or help ideologically aligned governments. It was a major misstep, Afghanistan being the gravest example of such. Okay, But there's a difference between saying, you have weapons of war, we're coming, and we're going to take all of your oil, for example, and the Afghan communist government being like, please come help us purge the Muslims because they're going crazy because we keep purging the Muslims personally. Even after the USSR is like, hey, maybe you should dial it back on the religious repression a little bit. People are getting really fucking violent. And then inevitably going in to the communist Afghan government uh, to the to the communist Afghan government and, and, you know, helping by then also, I think they were the ones who executed the, the leadership, right? There's a difference between that and being like, oh, we're just going to go in because we, we are at odds with the regional operation. We are at odds with whoever is running the country. And, and with the express purpose of like going in and securing material wealth. Um, securing the natural uh, uh, wealth, for example. And that is the difference between these actions. Did you mean to say China? No, I'm talking about Afghanistan. I'm talking about Russia's involvement in the USSR's involvement in Afghanistan, which was still bloody, brutal, violent, major, major problem. It led to the, the, the dissolution of the USSR, right? This long conflict that we're drawn into. That's the, that is the difference, though. The USSR being brought into the Afghan war was the CIA's aim. The CIA then also blew up areas in Central Asia and the USSR to scare them further. Um, as far as Prague Spring, the Hungarian counter-revolution and the Russian actions, the USSR actions against uh, the, the uh, Hungarian rebellion, I guess, if you want to call it that, that is, once again, maintenance of your own interior domestic affairs. It's still different. It's unacceptable. Okay. I agree. But it's like you're 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 covering matters matters of like domestic affairs at that point and comparing them to you're you're covering matters of domestic affairs at that point and comparing them to to uh you know going into a, a country completely irrelevant to the United States of America. And all of this still stems from, this is not a real intellectual conversation to have about whether or not I consider those to be good actions or just actions or moral actions. I'm not even saying any of those things. I'm simply telling you that there are differences, right, between those things. And the only reason why we even started to have this conversation about uh, USSR's foreign policy, which is completely irrelevant to what I'm talking about in this regard, because you wanted to deflect away and successfully got me to deflect away from America's crimes. Right? Like, Russia's violent actions does not justify America's current violent actions. USSR's violent actions does not justify America's current violent actions. If you want to talk about, like, irredentist actions versus imperialist actions and what, like, the, the mechanisms of extraction look like and how unequal exchange works, that's an entirely separate conversation that we can have, and I usually do have that conversation, and then people mistake that for saying, oh, Hassan finds this this to be completely permissible because he hates America and he loves the USSR. He thinks everything that the USSR does is good and awesome and in support of it. He's in support of all of that, but he hates it when America does it, even though 
most of the people that say that are actually saying that specifically because they want to deflect away from America's actions. I'm an American, okay? I can't go back in time and stop uh, the USSR from, from sending tanks into Hungary, okay? I can't do that. I can't do that just like I can't stop Nazi Germany from existing, right? I can't do any of those things. Ultimately, however, our opinion on historic events are completely irrelevant when we're talking about current ongoing imperialism and America's crimes, ongoing crimes, as it becomes uh, the, the dominant hegemonic power. Okay? America does, however, love utilizing its former conquest against Nazi Germany as the standalone singular force of good, which allows its current and ongoing imperialism to continue. We always love pointing to Nazi Germany, okay? You know who else also did a very profoundly good thing during uh, World War II? The USSR. Russia did that. Okay? By the way, thank you, John Nilla, for the five get the subs. Investigated. We don't know if that's true or not. Uh, this was done in order to uh, kidnap a uh, disobedient thug who had been supported by the United States right through his worst atrocities. Noriega. Noriega. He was brought to Florida and tried for crimes that he committed mostly on the CIA payroll. This is a this is the 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 peak of like the USSR tried to ally with the Nazis is the peak of the historical revisionism because Molotov Ribbentrop is the same principle behind appeasement okay except you're I mean you're you're dropping that as though like the USSR was unique in its uh, alignment with the with Nazi Germany Especially because what happened after is significantly more relevant. Appeasement wasn't good. I agree. Appeasement was shown to be wrong. However, both, of, both the Western powers and the USSR engaged in that same exact thing. Do you understand? So this reeks of the same kind of historical revisionism or the reactionary attitude that Republicans have, okay? What does that mean? It is no different than sitting around and saying, I'll have you know, the Republican Party is the party of abolition. Uh can you tell me what Abraham Lincoln believed in? What party was Abraham Lincoln a part of? That's right, silly liberal. You just got wrecked. And it's like, but we're not living in that era, right? It, it, it feels so silly to bring this up. It feels so stupid to bring this up when, when what happened after is infinitely more important. Okay? So why would you make that point unless you have an agenda? And that agenda is to somehow make it seem like the USSR was actually pro-Nazi, even though, ironically, the Nazis hated the USSR and communists significantly more than they hated Western powers, which, especially when it comes to England, for example, This is often forgotten. It's just pure historical revisionism. You are basically repeating uh, false history, right? And you feel as though... You feel as though maybe because there are other people who also agree or are motivated by the same uh, a blinding... Uh, other people who are also equally blinded by ideology that they like kind of agree with what you're saying so it makes you feel good at the time but it's just not historically correct
This is how reactionaries operate. Okay, that's aggression. Uh, we could go into the details of the war in Iraq, uh, but uh, there were plainly opportunities for, they might not have worked, we don't know, but there were opportunities for diplomatic settlement, which the Bush administration refused to consider, and incidentally the press would not report. It's entrenched in so many liberal minds, though. One of my friends, one of the smartest I know for many reasons, but this is his exact take on the USSR. Well, have you ever approached him about, like, what I just said? Like, if you were to, if your intelligent friend, if you, if you uh, were to talk to your intelligent friend and talk to them specifically about, like, what you think is more important, like, appeasement, which was wrong, and the USSR did it just like the Western powers did, um, what do you think is more important to the, to the, the, uh, the rest of the world history, global history as we understand it. Also, the illusion of being able to impose a new European order blinded Stalin to the danger of Germany and his misdiagnosis as well as his permanent distrust of Britain led him to deny evidence presented to him by both his own and the British Secret Services. <sighs> Why do you never react to Lee Kuan Yew comment? Is democracy good? Yes, democracy is good. With a single exception and Long Island Newsday, which did report the whole story throughout accurately and is the only newspaper in the country to have done so. Uh, the uh, uh, Bush administration then did attack, and uh, the attack was uh, carried out in, uh, in a manner which is criminal under the laws of war. Um, they attacked uh, uh, infrastructure. I mean, if you attack New York City, and you destroy the electrical system, the power system, the sewage systems, and so on, that amounts to biological warfare, and that's the nature of the attack. Uh, then came a sanctions regime, which uh, it's mostly Clinton, but began with Bush, which is, by conservative estimates, killed hundreds of thousands of people while strengthening Saddam Hussein. That takes us off to Clinton, which that's the beginning, but that's by no means the end. Clinton. Run through it. Well, we can run through it. that one case suffices. All right. But there are plenty of others. Bush I mean, too. Well, let's take. Let's go on with Clinton. Okay. I mean, one of Clinton's minor esca minor escapades, very minor, was sending a couple of cruise missiles uh, to the Sudan to destroy what they knew to be a pharmaceutical plant. There was no intelligence failure, according to the only estimates we have from the German ambassador and the. Uh, uh, director, of, regional director of Near East Foundation, who does field work in uh, Sudan. Both of them estimate several tens of thousands of deaths from one cruise missile attack. It was pretty serious. If somebody uh, did that to us, we'd regard it as bad news. And again, we can continue. Uh, during in the Middle East, for example, the uh, 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 Clinton began by declaring past UN resolutions uh, in the words of his administration um by the way i mean this is 11 minutes of of facts right except because you can't address these factually accurate takes all you can rely on is being like well what about the ussr what about that okay so i think the most productive thing one can do is regardless of what your position is, even if you have, uh, even if you have full knowledge over uh, over the differences in violence, okay, to rarely ever engage in this discussion, because this discussion is only brought about by those who want to deflect away from the main point of contention: America's wrongs. Okay, that's it.
That is the only reason why people say, well, what about this? What about that? I'm not Russian. I'm not Chinese. I'm an American citizen. I'm talking about the United States of America and its actions that are being done supposedly with my best interest in mind. Okay? My goal and my responsibility is to try and change the minds of fellow American citizens, fellow U.S. citizens, and to, to change the course, to change our trajectory, to change the course of our history. Okay? There's a good take that Noam Chomsky has for this as well. It's like, um, it, it, he says, he says something along the lines of like, uh, asking you to condemn the crimes of like Russia or China is like, Asking you to condemn the crimes of, uh, I don't know, like medieval Germany, okay? Like the medieval German uh, uh, tribes, okay? It's ridiculous. It is, a, it is a thought experiment simply conducted to deflect away from the main point of contention. Like, how am I supposed to? Like, what, am I, what, what say do I have in this? I have a say in America, Right? That's it. It's like asking me to condemn Attila the Hun. Exactly. Anyway. obsolete and anachronistic. Okay, so we're finished with that. No more international law. Uh, then comes a, poly uh, a period called a peace process. Ex By that logic, we can say nothing about Israel? My friend, if you think that the United States of America has nothing to do with Israel, please go to my YouTube channel. There is a tremendous amount of videos that you can watch on this same, this very subject. Okay? Now, I'm not even saying that you can't talk about other countries' histories. Of course you can't, okay? But one must ask why or uh, when these, uh, these, these questions get brought up. They don't get brought up on their own in a vacuum. They almost always get brought up when I'm talking about America's uh, actions in becoming the hegemonic superpower of the world. And the bloodshed that it, the the bloody the bloody cost of uh, said goal being achieved. You know what I mean? Smith side had the better of the argument there when it comes to the slippery slopes. There was this huge moment, and I mean, maybe some people might have lost it because when I hear the words ministerial or discretionary, <laughs> I was probably like, just say what everyone's thinking, official or unofficial acts, whether a president can do it or they can't do it. That's important because the crux of this matter is going to come down to whether his actions around January 6th and leading up to it were officially presidential actions. They were talking about it in the form of ministerial versus discretionary, and they talked about this thing called the take care clause, which essentially... Okay, this person keeps talking about colonialism over and over again. Colonialism is still colonialism. Russia did it, America did it, same difference. The USSR did not need to invade them because they were already colonial entities. The Russian Revolution just replaced Moscow and Petersburg elite and installed communist leaders in the colonies. One of the major problems within the, the uh, USSR was the Russification that was conducted. For sure. 100%. Okay? There is still a difference here. Okay? There's still a difference between going to other... Uh, going to completely separate other countries, random irrelevant countries, and taking over that land through violence and then maintaining dominance over them at the behest of simply stealing their natural resources and enslaving their local population. Okay? 
the difference there, and there is more truth to the Polish conversation here than the other places that you're uh, pointing to, but there is a difference between America going into Iran or America conducting a coup in Iran or America going and invading Iraq, Afghanistan, America bombing Libya with the actions of the USSR as, as, uh, as what would be considered internal domestic affairs. They're still wrong. There's still plenty of mistakes, okay? But the idea is still very different you're talking about like you're you're taking for granted i guess all of the settler colonial violence that had taken place already and taking that for granted and saying well that's in the past let's look at that right now let's look at the the violent actions that are being uh, conducted the violent actions that are taking place here okay Immediately following the revolution in the very Soviet republics were actually supported in nationalism and their central committees were made up of the national identities of each republic. Stalin squashed this because he was a monster, but he, after he died, they brought it back. Russification lasted roughly 30 to 40 years in a brief period, in the abbreviated periods. Okay, but that's a, a very long period of time. And also, there's a lot of people moving. There's a lot of populations moving around in that time frame. And... um. And, and it doesn't matter. The impact of that is still not great. So. I guess, I don't know. I don't know how we got here. I mean, we were talking about America's war crimes and how every president, we started off talking about Trump's crimes that should be prosecuted. And then we moved on to how every American president could be prosecuted for war crimes. And then we moved away from that to uh, what about all the other countries that have done crimes as well? And I just got completely stuck. And I guess it's yet another great example, okay, as to why it should not be said at all. And now, beyond what I've already said about uh, the USSR's many mistakes, there are still people who are stuck on stop glorifying USSR to make a point then. There is no point in time where I said forced deportations was appropriate. There is there's no point in time where I said that like uh, a, a forcible suppression of countries that wanted to, even if it was reactionary, uh, wanted to gain autonomy away uh, or, or uh, wanted to maintain some level of independence, squashing that violently was appropriate. I never said any of those things, Right. But you're basically saying that because you don't, I guess, want to have a conversation about America somehow, and you think the USSR is a good, uh, a, a good place to to talk about. My point was that America's America's crimes are egregious. Does America still have, you know, some positives to point to? Of course, that's why I choose to live here. Right? I mean, I take advantage of, of the bounties of imperialism. I live in the imperial core. And it's just like, unfortunately, um, it unfortunately always just like uh, is, I think, directed with a, with a real reason. The, the whole, what do you think about? I'm with you. However, you say the USSR's mistakes and the US's crimes quite a difference. Yes, I do. Because I don't consider like the dust bowl to be a crime. Okay? I consider that to be a mistake. 
just like even though technically you could make the argument that like global famine under abundance, okay, under a, under a global capitalist organization of the economy, we have an abundance of food supply, and yet still 9 million to 14 million people die every year due to diseases related to famine and directly a consequence of famine. That's before we get into imperialism, right? Now, do I say that that's a crime? I don't. Because that is a byproduct of the system, okay? The difference, however, is that when you are pro-capitalist and anti-communist, you look at mismanagement of resources under communism as a direct crime against the ideology, and yet every death due to famine in a concept where we already have, in a global system where we already have an abundance of food production, you consider that to be a byproduct of personal responsibility and the failure of personal responsibility. Sorry, child growing up in Indonesia or anywhere else that you, uh, if you die to uh, famine or famine-related diseases, sorry, child in Yemen. You didn't pick up yourself uh, from your bootstraps. You just didn't do that. Should have tried harder. Okay. <sighs> anyway. So, Stalin is as communist as I'm a giant sentient muffin. That's also cope, man. That's cope. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sure it's yes. Stalin didn't. Stalin didn't create a maximum anarcho communism or whatever you believe communism is. It's crazy. No, these are all attempts and failures. Okay. But like, it's it's maximum copium to just be like, no, that's not real communism. It's not. Of course, it's not. But you can't just like uh, shoo away because it doesn't it doesn't fall in your in your neat de uh, designation. You can't just like push it away in the same way that I used to do it for optics reasons, in my opinion. Like I used to do this as well. Like the, the idea that like, oh, real this is not real communism. Yeah, of course it's not. That doesn't mean it was not like an attempt at a. A, a, a transitional socialist state. Okay, why do we believe another attempt won't fail like the USSR others? Well, the reason why is because there are inevitable inherent contradictions built into the class structure within capitalism. And capitalism, if uh, without any sort of outside intervention, is destined to implode due to those contradictions. Okay? So it's not so, it's not so much that uh, socialism is like forcibly being brought about, but it's an understandable and necessary evolution from capitalism. This is what I believe in. I believe that, yes, for a time and place, capitalism is very good. I believe that capitalism has also outlived its usefulness. However, those in positions of power do everything it can to maintain it as long for as long as they can. This does not mean that um, attempts at changing that structure will, will lead to, you know, death in the future as well. I'm sure, I'm sure there will be possible to change, uh, the entire, the, the entire, uh, way that the, the economy is organized without, you know, people dying, people die every day, all the time. It's just that they will point to what I have to say here and go, look, he's violent. just like 
violence is an inevitability under every political structure, and violence certainly exists under capitalism. All I am saying is that social democracy under a capitalist organization of the economy inevitably goes back to barbarism, fascism, and we've seen this happen, in especially so in the last 30, 40 years in all of the, the uh, global north, specifically in, in Western nations. We saw it happen. We're watching it unfold in places like Canada, we're seeing it in Europe, we're seeing it, we saw it in the UK. America was already always a proto-capitalist country before capitalism, before the Industrial Revolution. It was so perfect for uh, capitalism. It was the most capitalist nation on the planet. Why is communism in Turkey so unpopular? Cold War. Turkey is America's lap dog. Anyway. We're covering. Donald Trump sounds off after immunity hearing. This is the real threat to democracy. Capitalism was tried and failed many times in city-states across Europe for hundreds of years, but capitalism was an inevitability, and the internal contradictions of feudalism gave birth to it. Socialism is just as inevitable and necessary as capitalism is. It is a line of human development like Marxism 101. Yeah. Also, the notion that capitalism currently doesn't fail is pretty funny but i guess like what are your metrics for success in that circumstance because the same exact dynamic that i mentioned like famine if we have famine under abundance in my opinion that's a failure if we have famine when there's no abundance when famine is commonplace that isn't that is still a failure but it's nowhere near as big a failure that you can attribute to the systems that's the way i see it When your only frame of reference is the middle class suburb in the United States, I'm sure it can seem like it's only successful. Yes, because nobody associates African nations that have been ravaged by American forces, by Western imperialism, to be another beautiful byproduct of capitalist, uh, capitalist nation states. Nobody ever thinks about fucking uh, any of the other... It, it, nobody thinks about Rwanda or Congo or any of these other countries as, like, capitalist nations. It's just America. That's the, that's the only country that's capitalist. But then again, America's also Americans have horse blinders anyway. They don't even think social democracy exists. So it's stupid. It's stupid to have these conversations. Um, you know what's not a stupid conversation to have though? Trump talking about uh, his immunity here. Covering all of it. When the president steps up and look at that, here he is. Okay. The former president talking all, today about being in court. Let's listen in even before he starts as they do the setup here. Sitting president has decided to prosecute his major opponent who's leading in all the polls in the country. The issues that the court had to deal with today were momentous. Whether or not a president of the United States could be prosecuted for carrying out his responsibilities, doing his... I love the framing of like... You know, doing an insurrection is the literal responsibility of the president. Like, your honor, I'm sorry, he had to do it to him. <laughs> he just, he had to do it to him for the one time. You don't get it. His job as president. We can't have a country where every four years there's a cycle of political recrimination where one administration attacks a prior administration when in fact that candidate is leading in the polls 
and will be the next president of the United States. As our legal team, as our appellate team made clear, that would be a disaster for our country. That would be a direct attack on democracy, and that cannot happen. What was very significant today, and I'm sure you all caught it, is the special counsel conceded that if it was President Obama who was being prosecuted for a drone strike, then they'd have to consider immunity. But when it's not, when it's President Trump, then they're taking the position that there's no immunity for President Yeah, first of all, this is such a funny take because Donald Trump also literally, I think, killed a direct rel uh, relative of the person that Obama killed, the American citizen that Obama extrajudiciously killed. Donald Trump also facilitated in a raid which ended up killing that person's sister. So the idea that like, oh, this is a specifically Barack Obama thing is so silly. Why is it silly? Because clearly you're not up there for that reason. You killed an American citizen extrajudiciously as well, literally directly related to the, to the uh, person that Barack Obama had killed prior, okay? Ain't nobody's making a big stink out of that, dog. You want to know why? Because that's America, baby. That's America enforcing its might around the globe. And that's precisely the reason why nobody cares about that. Nobody is going to prosecute for that. They should. In a just world, you should be prosecuted for that. The difference is they're prosecuting you for an insurrection, okay? You didn't do that for the continuation of American hegemony. You did that for the continuation of your own power, and that, you can't really do, right? That's it. Also, the other duty he'd kill with the marshals, even that doesn't count. Even that is not considered to be inappropriate because that's like, you know, that's still the president sending the marshals, like using, utilizing the actual, uh, the, the actual existing power structures against a criminal who has already given up their rights, obviously, innocent until proven guilty. But if you're a socialist or if you're a leftist or whatever and you killed a fascist, then, you know, you're not you're no longer innocent until proven guilty. You're guilty until they kill you and then you're extra guilty. So. You know, that's something to consider. That is not up for contention on this day. Okay, your crimes today are of the top of the hour variety. Okay, forgetting to run the top of the hour variety, the biggest crime of all time, because at the top of the hour, there's a three minute break. If I were to forget that, even though apparently 35% of Twitch's staff has been laid off today, I would lose my job. I wouldn't, but I'd be void of my contract. But if you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or free with a Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account, where you get one free Prime subscription a month. Use it on your favorite broadcaster. Hopefully, that's me. Here's a three-minute ad break now. Boom. Hey, Hassan, did you know 30 billion percent of the Twitch staff was laid off? Presidential acts that were required when a president is carrying out his job responsibilities. If we adopt what the special counsel wants, if we adopt what President Biden wants, then we open the Pandora's box. Leftists would greatly benefit from divorcing socialism and communism from Leninism, Stalinism, Maoism, and Marxism. <laughs> Stop. Okay. Heard that, Kaya? That's a dumbass. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Thank you. Thank you, man. No. Leftists should be divorced. So, f what what is supposed to be leftism then? What do you mean? Here we go. This is a bit, right? There's no way this is real, bro. Why don't you make your own thing then? I, I don't understand. What what is what is it supposed to be? 
like, I've heard Stalin and Mao before, right? I have heard Stalin and Mao before, but like once you put Lenin in there, you're broaching, you know, libertarian socialist territory, which is already on tricky ground. I've never heard someone also say Marxism before, though. That was new. Like Noam Chomsky will also be like, oh, I'm an anarchist. Uh, like, yeah, Lenin, he was bad. Whatever. Okay. Okay. Go hang out with Jeffrey Epstein. Whatever. Right. But like, I've never heard someone also say Marxism should be removed from Lenin. Then what is it then? What, what is it? to political prosecution after political prosecution after political prosecution. In fact, Joe Biden could be prosecuted for trying to stop this man from becoming the next president of the United States. We don't need political prosecutions. We need political process. I'd like to introduce President Trump. Well, I want to thank you all, and we had a, I a very momentous day in terms of what was learned and what they've conceded. They conceded two major points that were, uh, they were right in doing it. I don't think they had much of a choice, but they're very, very big, very powerful points. And I think we're doing very well. I think it's very unfair when a opponent, a political opponent, is prosecuted by the DOJ, by Biden's DOJ, uh, so they're losing in every poll. They're losing in almost every demographic. Uh, numbers came out today that are uh, really very mind-boggling if you happen to be Joe Biden. And I think they feel this is the way they're going to try and win. And that's not the way it goes. That'll be bedlam in the country. It's a very bad thing. It's a very bad precedent. As we said, it's the opening of a Pandora's box, and that's a very it's a very sad thing that's happened with this whole situation. Uh, when they talk about uh, threat to democracy, that's your real threat to democracy. And I feel that as a president, you have to have immunity. Very simple. And if you don't, as an example. It's simple. It's so simple, dude. As president, they should let you do it. I don't understand. It's that simple. It's sick, man. That's that's awesome. Come on. You're opening up the Pandora's box. So like, okay. So what if Biden also maintains that same immunity and does an insurrection after losing the election? But this time, he just continues being the president. H how would that work then? What if Biden currently utilizing his presidential immunity sent a hit squad to execute you. He's got immunity, right? You can't charge him for that. Let's, let's, let's think about this for a second. Yeah, why doesn't Biden just send out an assassination squad right now to wherever Trump is and kill him? He can drone strike you. He's got presidential immunity. You can't do a crime when you're the president. And you want this man to be president? Wait, when... Where did this come from? I've never been like, I hope Trump becomes president. I'm so confused. Biden isn't going after him. And also he literally ran on locker up. Yes, he's saying Biden's DOJ is going after him. That's it. Example, if uh, this case were lost on immunity, and I did nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong. I'm working for the country. And I worked on uh, very hard on voter fraud because we have to have free elections. We have to have strong borders. We have to have free elections. Those two things almost above all. And we found tremendous voter fraud. We have a list of it. We have some findings if you want it. The press doesn't like reporting it, but we found tremendous voter fraud, determinative voter fraud. But we worked on that. That's what I was doing. And uh, they were talking about after. Well, nothing has to do with after I left. It was during the time. And that was what they really focused on today during the appeal. 
and they concede that, and everybody concedes that, and if it's during the time, you have absolute immunity. So uh, we'll see how it all works out. Uh, we have uh, a great argument. We have an argument with they conceded two major points today. In fact, I think it's probably a concession you have to have. Well, what do you mean? Where does this come from, dude? You joke about loving Trump all the time, of course, and branded liberal haters are going to see clips of that and think you're a hog lover. No, because liberals love, like, getting the respect of Republicans. That's the thing. Like, it, so if they genuinely did think I was a Republican, they wouldn't despise me as much. They would actually come in here to try and, like, convert me. Liberals are, like, constantly in a I can fix him paradigm with the, some of the dumbest, most reactionary losers on the planet. So if they did truly think I was a conservative, they would be trying to win me over. Liberals will spend so much more time trying to convert conservatives to vote for the Democratic Party than actually get their politicians to at least capitulate a little bit to like good policies that a broader leftist coalition would also benefit from, themselves included. So technically, if I was someone that they considered to be a conservative Trump lover, they would actually come in here and tell me like, Hassan, you're such a good guy. You're such a good idea. We I feel like we agree on a lot, but uh, why do you want to vote for Trump? You should vote for Joe Biden instead. They wouldn't come in here with the same level of disdain that they currently have. Disdain that they only have for the left. That's, the, that's who they hate more. Yes, the lawyer is tired if you'd like to talk about it. But they conceded two points that I think were, uh, by normal standards, if it weren't me, that would be the end of this case. But sometimes they look at me differently than they look upon others, and that's very bad for our country. Uh, you had a very big event yesterday, as you saw, in Georgia, where the district attorney is totally compromised. The case has to be dropped. Uh, they went after, I guess, 18 or 20 people. They wanted to go after a lot of other people. They wanted to go after senators. She was out of her mind. Now it turns out that that case is totally compromised in fact they say she's in far more criminal liability than any of them <laughs> there that's what they're saying guys from moving real intensely here and, and it, Marla, this vehicle is, are we moving? Are we turning here? Looks like we're going to this parking garage. Obviously you can see the Whole Foods below. Okay. Oh no. Oh my God. Turn around. U -turn. Big U-turn. A Pretty stolen U-Haul? The size of the U-Haul. So 2024 Alex, baby crime is so back. That Better this than ever. Suspect is wanted for petty theft and felony evasion, uh, in addition to the stolen vehicle. So this isn't just a stolen vehicle pursuit. Crime is back. This person behind the wheel wanted for petty theft, felony evasion as well. Seal Beach. We were just seeing the black Ooh. and white right there. Ooh. Crossing. Oh, the another U-turn. Let's go. Another U-turn. Yeah. And you wonder. I, I feel I like this is the worst the, kind of car the, to try to escape cops. Aren't right in. on them. But um, now you're starting to see that they are getting closer, um, perhaps uh, frustrated by the aggressiveness of this driver and concerned, uh, especially the way this driver is just going through intersections uh, that somebody unsuspecting could, you know, get hit mm -hmm. as this person as this is person not is obeying it. really any of the rules of traffic. So now this driver sort of boxed in. Looks to be a male driver. And you can see him head sort of on a swivel trying to see, can I get through here? Can I get through here? And yes, he can get through here. So we just saw on our air that U-Haul, he has pulled this move a couple of times. We do have some video to show you of another incident in which another moment when he did pull a U-turn precariously. There we go. So you see on the uh, bigger frame there on your screen, he it's just flipped tape. a, a U-turn there. Yeah. Now, the live picture is the top left side of your screen, the smaller box. Um, and we're going to take that live again uh, as we are weaving through traffic. Remind me, what did we settle on? Crime here. is good. Yes, um, crime and, is good. And the chance that, that a driver could get hit. <laughs> crime or is so a good. Somebody walking their dog. Um, you know, not hard to imagine given Dude, the we literally that we're have going a and the, the sort of lack of care. That we literally have now, now a song for it. 
plowing through that another intersection, and, and eventually, Marla, all these uh, traffic crimes will be. We have crime up, music uh, on this as broadcast. They go back through this tape and do their, you know, instant replay of this, and they will. Um, all these are additional crimes. So Belmont Shore area now we just saw uh, some of the uh, the harbor there. The people that know this area near Long Beach. Um, animal, very animal, busy, yeah. very busy. Giving Come song. It's 414. Uh, the smaller streets here, uh, thinner streets, narrower streets. That's the word I'm looking for. Down this alleyway, blowing through. through able to get by there so uh, this is all in the belmont shore area a light see the pet food express there still able to make its way through this alleyway this back ain't alleyway. nowhere to go in belmont shore and, i have no you know, idea where belmont shore of, is they go to areas that they're familiar with is that the case here we don't know of course uh, th there's a lot of unknowns we don't know how many people are inside we did seem to think that there were certainly more than just the driver uh, we don't know uh, if there are yeah you know, someone's furniture inside the U-Haul, okay. this See? packed U-Haul. There was a, a bicyclist right there, and, and sort of the danger to all the folks that are out on the road right now. Uh, we're joined now on the phone by Kevin Takumi of Fox 11, who spent years in Sky Fox, uh, narrating so many pursuits. Oof, another close call at an intersection there, Kevin. Uh, and, and this driver, really reckless. Yeah, this has been really wild from the start, from the get-go when they first started this pursuit. Uh, reportedly a theft suspect of some kind. We don't know if it involves a U-Haul or it was just a suspect involved in a theft that was putting things into the U-Haul. You can look as we get a good look there into into the into the vehicle. It does still look like there's two people in the vehicle, driver and possibly a passenger in that other side we had a better look at that a few minutes ago but speeds 45 60 miles an hour here in and out of this is a very small area here within within the area you can see how they're just kind of going in circles looking together up, it looks like okay they're gonna up. pull over maybe somebody's gonna bail out here yep. it looks like pulled over on it pulled over uh -oh. East Pioli way nobody's getting okay Park. now driver's getting no. out and just wait there ain't no cops around passenger is getting out to pretend like like, oh my uh, god they're just, they're just kind of walking away it looks like my ghost maybe, um no black and whites were directly behind this but you just got the airship above this and they're watching the two v two people walk away from this. bro but, they're casually uh, splitting like the, up that's so the sick the cars were so far back it looks like whether it's right oh, it looks it. like a park there obviously yeah. and then right butted up against the nice neighborhood there in, in belmont so the, park yeah the other belmont driver Shore. looked to move towards those homes there you wonder if he has some sort of connection to that place or not. So the two Bro, this dude is literally out. pulling out. He's going to make it harder. Obviously, he's pulling out like no pixel strats that I used to do can, back in the day. The CHP helicopter is right Run, dog. Them, what so are you doing? They're keeping an eye, and they're trying to keep an eye on both of those suspects. But the one that got on Maybe the he doesn't he realize that there's, like, there. actually our, choppers our on him or something. We're, staying oh, with we're, the seeing, driver. we're seeing the black and white pull up right now. Yeah, but... Yeah, the black and white's pulling up. There's two black and whites there. Okay. The um, officers we're... are running toward the trees. It's it's now maybe that person is just right there. He couldn't have gone too far. He was never running. No, there's a there was a fence. There's a fence there as well. So we'll I see mean, he's he's under the trees. It oh, there like he goes. Sprawled out. Sprawled out on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So we have one person who will be in custody in just a matter of minutes. You can see officers with their guns drawn. Three of them there going up. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. What is happening? So drivers, are getting, drivers are going in custody here. The passenger, we don't know about yet. If Why didn't he just run? To uh, get somebody on the other side of it. They might just let the passenger go. Usually they're wanting. Well, oh. it looks like the passenger the is just still kind of walking, walking <laughs> down the slowly. sidewalk there. <laughs> wow. Sort of blending in. Uh, yeah. And, and you wonder the nature of the theft. You know, is that passenger armed? Could could that person potentially carjack another vehicle, um, or not? We, we don't know. I mean, he wasn't even that. the driver, dog. Um, what do you mean? Just let him go. Let him again, go. Come we on. We don't know exactly the circumstances of how. Uh, the police got notified of this of theft if it was property that was taken or if it was a u-haul that was taken but you can see the one other passenger suspect here that's just just kind of casually walking down the street here and officers have not caught up to that person yet but they their main priority usually is with the driver of the vehicle hmm. yeah sort of meandering along um and 
we often comment on, on demeanor. Yeah, you can see this person on the phone. Bro, this um, is like reporters should let so him go. Close. You know what I mean? At that point, like, stop snitching. Stop snitching. He got away. But stop snitching. He got away, dog. It's interesting. Why are you putting the camera on him? We uh, see some stuff that they don't. It's see cheating. It's cheating. It's cheating. Their own helicopter and, and they're watching our broadcast right now as well. Wait, uh, a cop is like showing up. up the street right now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, they. Got What's he gonna do? Message. So uh, let's see what happens here, and if this person is is taken into custody. Or oh my god! Oh my god! Yeah. Yo! No meta gaming. No meta gaming. No meta gaming. Cop is goaded. No meta gaming. Yeah. Do you see that? Cop was like, "Yeah, I can't meta game." Well, we, we like Chad Hoppers told me. Chad Hoppers told me that you're the criminal, but the I didn't see you get out of the car, so I suspect that you're not. This passenger is um, just being allowed to do his own thing on. Okay, okay, somebody. news. News guys are criminals it's for doing this. Bizarre situation. Yeah, I don't know if he's carrying a blanket, um, but using the crosswalk to cross the street. This is East Apian Way and Monrovia Avenue in Belmont Park. Looks like just finished a phone call. You know, just on the other side, the, the driver of that U-Haul is now in custody. There were plenty of officers there. We just saw a Seal Beach uh, PD cruiser roll on by and you see Rogers Middle School there. Um, it's hard to know what's going on in the uh, greater perimeter here. And we don't know the, the nature. Oh. Okay, here we there go. Oh, uh, dude, no, and, no fun. And, and no, that's here. messed up. Uh, yeah, just doing as, as he's told, apparently. That's crazy, dude. Yep. And they're placing him into uh, handcuffs there. So uh, the good news with this one, uh, nobody has hurt, um, no serious damage, despite the fact that that U-Haul was driving pretty wildly. And um, another con pursuit concludes here in Southern California. That sucks. Yeah, we'll have uh, more. Reporters cook them, dude. Reporters are always chat hopping. They're always backseating. They're always chat hopping. They literally have no respect for RP. They, they literally break metas all the time. They metagame all the time. They're stream sniping. It's unacceptable. It's messed up. Like, it's messed up because, like, obviously, obviously, what should happen in this situation is you let it play out. You let it play out. You let it play out so that, like, there's more role play that comes after it. Okay, there's more role play that comes from the failure of the cops. Anyway, um, maybe you should show them how it's done right now instead. Okay, guys, stop. Um, so uh, I want to talk about what is. Uh, oh, I, I've been meaning to to cover this. Can monarchs commit crime thing? Because, like, we're not done with the Trump stuff. The people she's looking at. So and I think we that still have, when you And we still have Matt Pat. Look at what happened where they pay a lawyer with absolutely no experience $700,000 who happens to be her lover or her boyfriend. And uh, then they go on trips and vacations together, very expensive vacations together. And the reason they paid him so much because he was after me. Because this way they can afford to pay him a lot more. It probably passes a certain test. And that's a very sad thing that happened in Georgia. And I would imagine that case is going to be dropped. Um, every legal analyst that I've spoken to, every legal analyst that I've read have said that case is so compromised now it has to be dropped. Uh, very good people were very badly hurt by that case. It's a shame. Very good people. People did nothing wrong. Uh, they did nothing different than what Democrats have been doing for years and years and years, whether it's slates or anything else that you're talking about. But they were very hurt, and it turns out that uh, she profited tremendously in that case. It's illegal. What she did is illegal. So we'll let the state handle that. But what a, uh, what a sad situation it is. I want to thank everybody for the fairness. We've been covered very fairly. Most people agree that uh, we're entitled as a president to immunity. If you didn't have immunity, as an example, uh, Joe Biden with the prosecutor, we're not going to give you a billion dollars unless you get rid of the prosecutor that's after 
that's after the company or his son or whoever it is they're after, but he wanted that prosecutor gone and he's on tape saying it. Or you could say the horrible job he's done at the border where our country is being destroyed or the horrible situation that took place. The lowest moment, I think, in the history of our country was Afghanistan, the way we withdrew. Not that we withdrew, but the way we withdrew. With, with shame, we surrendered. Uh, people killed, 13 great soldiers killed, many unbelievably, horrifically hurt, wounded, hurt. And hundreds of people died on both sides. Hundreds of people died. He could be prosecuted for that. So you can't have a president uh, without immunity, you have to have, as a president, you have to be able to do your job. But if this didn't work out, if I wasn't given immunity, then I like the presidents, when we talked about today, uh, President Obama with the drone. I like the idea that, like, he had to do an insurrection as a part of his, like, presidential duties. This is very funny to me. Like, you don't understand. Like, I had to do January 6th because, like, it's... It's just a part of my job. It's a part of like it's similar to how Biden pulled out of Afghanistan, which was also my idea that he followed through on. But like, I would have done better. But he did it worse. Strikes, which were very bad. Uh, they were mistakes, terrible mistakes. And uh, you can't put a, uh, you really can't put a president in that position. So I think most people understand it, and we feel very confident that eventually, uh, hopefully at this level, but eventually we win. A president has to have immunity. And the other thing is I did nothing wrong. We did nothing wrong. Uh, the investigation of the election, which was a rigged election, everybody knows it. And just if you just look at, they didn't use state legislatures. And they didn't, uh, they went to the FBI and you look at FBI and Twitter, the Twitter files with the FBI, all of the horrible things, uh, Pfizer. That's my favorite thing is like the Twitter files and the FBI people constantly talking about Twitter files, Twitter files. And it's like a suppression of the truth by Twitter or whatever. And like none of those guys are talking when Elon Musk just like bans people randomly for um, putting forward a tracker of his private jet or banning people randomly because Bill Ackman decided that like, uh, you know, his wife can't take it no more. Right. Like Elon Musk operating at the behest of billionaires and like, and, and his billionaire buddies and just like banning whoever willy nilly, like, where is the Twitter files on that? Where is the free speech on that? Ah, doesn't exist. Doesn't matter. Who was the leftist who went crazy over it? He wasn't a leftist at that point, but it's Matt Taibbi is who you're talking about. Hey, you just said the words, can monarchs commit crimes? I wanted to share a video with the name of that. Yeah, that's the whole point of why I said it because it's right here. I do want to watch a Historia Civilis video on it, and I'm going to watch it. We're just Isn't watching the this for group, now. The signed documents, uh, the lying to Congress, and the stuffing of the ballot bo boxes all on tape. Stuffing of ballot boxes all on tape. Government tape. And most of the information, as you know, will give you some of the findings that just came out. But all of that information, as you know, was gotten from mostly government sources, government tapes, government files and government stats so it's uh, very sad when something like that happens you know you wouldn't have inflation but much more importantly you wouldn't have had the ukraine situation with russia you wouldn't have had the attack on israel russia you'd have a much different economy right now you'd have a great economy and russia you russia all, we russia all we were just three years ago sorry so I want to thank everybody very much. And I love the way he says it. And we, uh, we think we had a very good day today. And the concession of these two major points was pretty amazing. And uh, honestly, I'm very glad they did it. I think they did the right thing. Thank you very much. Mr. President, you just used the word bedlam. Will you tell your supporters now, no matter what, no violence? So it was very interesting to hear the president compare his situation in terms of immunity as commander in chief to that of Barack Obama when, you know, back in 2015, the headline in the New York Times was drone strikes reveal uncomfortable truth. U.S. is often unsure about who will die. Uh, and he called what happened. Trump did the same thing. Shut up. Which, by the way, they should both be prosecuted for in a just world. However, 
This is something that's a little bit different. All right, let's watch Historia Civilis. Can monarchs commit crimes? I want to talk about based, one of the most... This is a based in labor-pilled leftist historian channel that a lot of people are very upset about. Why are they upset at him? Because he did the history of work and the history of labor uh, recently. And a lot of people were like, how dare you do that? Get this communism out of here. But apparently he also did something on can monarchs commit crimes? So let's take a look at Historia Civilis's Can Monarchs Commit Crimes? Important trials, human trials, in the history of the planet. It took place in January of the year 1649, before a newly created body called the High Court of Justice. This dude is not a communist by any means. Um, I think this dude is a leftist, for sure. The charges? Tyranny, treason, and murder. The defendant? The King of England. This trial helped to write the legal doctrine of popular sovereignty, which is the idea that political legitimacy emanates from the people. It's a simple idea, but it stood in stark contrast with another legal doctrine, which argued that political legitimacy emanated from God through the institution of monarchy. This was called divine right. Generally speaking, these two ideas stood in opposition to each other. Popular Reload. sovereignty was bottom-up, divine right was top-down. This theoretical disagreement over the source of political legitimacy resulted in several centuries you can of execute uh, me, troubles, me Lord. and one You're of these allowed. troubles was the thing called the English Civil War. The capstone to the English Civil War was that thing I want to talk about, the trial of Charles I, King of England, Scotland, and Ireland. Trial of the century doesn't begin to describe it. This would be the trial of the millennia. Microf, me lord! But in order to fully appreciate what was to come, some context is required. The English Civil War is notoriously complex. Some would say boring, but I would say complex. I promise to be brief. King Charles I, separately and simultaneously the King of England, Scotland, and Ireland, believed that political legitimacy emanated from God and manifested through the crown divine right. A consequence of this belief is that Charles saw other sources of political power as a diminishment of his own royal authority. He therefore did everything in his power to reign without ever consulting with Parliament. This was tricky, because without the consent of Parliament, you couldn't tax the people of England. To compensate for this, the king raised revenue in a number of creative ways, such as diverting money that was intended for the navy, as well as arbitrarily demanding loans from the nobility, and throwing them in prison when they refused. This was exactly as popular as you might think. In time, Scotland rose in rebellion. At last, after avoiding Parliament for 11 long years, Charles was forced to, in his eyes, diminish his royal authority by asking them for funds to raise an army. Parliament was furious. Instead of giving the king his army, they went right for the jugular. They outlawed his creative means of raising revenue, and then charged some of his closest political allies with treason. A short time later, Ireland rose in rebellion. Parliament then took things up a notch, and tried to take control of the military away from the king. For Charles, this was the final straw. He ordered five of the most radical members of Parliament arrested. Parliament refused to give up their own, and there was a standoff. When they asked the local militia to seize the capital, the king fled north, and England was engulfed in a civil war. The fighting dragged on for four years, leading to an unprecedented level of mobilization. The English Civil War became, and remains, the deadliest conflict in English history, twice as deadly as World War I on a per capita basis. An entire generation of men and women were profoundly radicalized by this event. Charles was eventually forced to flee up into Scottish-occupied territory, where he was captured and then handed over to Parliament. The king escaped and fled to the Isle of Wight, where he was captured for a second time. From captivity, Charles was able to convince a sympathetic Scottish army to invade England, setting off a wave of royalist uprisings across the countryside. Classic. Let's pause here, because this would become an important 
Classic Scottish L. Important point. After the people of England suffered World War I-sized casualties, the King of England turned around and asked another country to invade. To the already radicalized English people, angry doesn't begin to describe it. Their own king had just stabbed them in the back. At great cost, the parliamentarians fought what was basically a second civil war, eventually defeating the Scots and quelling the uprisings. That brings us up to September of the year 1648. Parliament had just won two civil wars, and the king was imprisoned on the Isle of Wight. The problem was that nobody knew what to do next. Parliament was made up of two distinct bodies. Classic Irish Commons W, Classic Scottish Lords. L. And unsurprisingly, as it pertains given to the British the Empire of the Civil War, the House of Commons had been the ones driving the agenda. The Commons was split into two factions. The larger of the two was the moderate faction, who favored squeezing some religious reforms out of Charles, reducing his political power, and restoring him to the throne. The Independents, on the other hand, named after their desire for independence from the Church of England, wanted to go much further. They had a long list of demands, including a call for a brand new electoral system, where poor people were actually given the right to vote. A radical Boo. idea for the time. Boo. You might notice that like there that. was no royalist or conservative faction. The Civil War had seen to that. So the Commons were split between the Moderates and the Independents, with the Moderates running the show. But the really interesting dynamic is that the English army was also split. The officers generally favored the Moderates, while the rank and file, radicalized by the Civil War, mostly favored the Independents. This made for a complicated political situation. But of course, there were heterodox views within each of these groups, especially within army leadership. Lord Fairfax was the commander-in-chief of the army, firmly in the moderate camp, favoring a negotiated settlement with the king. Oliver Cromwell was Fairfax's second-in-command, and kind of had a foot in each faction. He sided with the independents when it came to their radical religious reforms. He was quite religious himself. But he also sided with the moderates when it came to forcing political reforms upon the king and restoring him to the throne. Or at least that's what he had believed. The experience with the Scottish invasion had changed Cromwell, and he was no longer certain that the English people could trust their own sovereign. Henry Ireton was another high-ranking general, and Cromwell's son-in-law. Ireton favored radical political reforms, which made him an independent. He was a firebrand, and he wasn't shy about speaking out against the monarchy and the nobility. One contemporary described him as having, quote, the principles and temper of a Cassius. <gasps> Cassius? We actually know what that means. But nothing's that simple. Despite being broadly aligned on policy, the independents in the commons kept on denouncing Ireton for various philosophical disagreements. For example, the most radical of the radicals argued that private property was an invention of the Based! crown, and so we if hate that. the Sorry. crown went away, private property should return to the hands Gross. of the people. Ireton disagreed with this. Yeah, I disagree with it too. I'm, I think uh, it's good. Very good. Which led to him perpetually being cancelled by his closest political allies. But for the time being, this fighting among the independents didn't really matter, because the House of Commons was controlled by the moderates. They decided to send representatives from each faction to the Isle of Wight to negotiate with the king. This team of negotiators was initially quite successful. They got Charles to agree that Parliament had gone to war in its just and lawful defense, which meant that everybody who had fought in the Civil War would be immune from prosecution. A big win. They also got him to agree to a whole host of political reforms. Parliament would be fully autonomous, with the ability to pick the king's ministers and Isn't property in the hands of people private property? No, they're saying that private property the concept of like private ownership of property is inappropriate it's like enclosures they're talking about enclosures they're saying that they shouldn't exist 
It should be personal property and the rest should be commonly used by all. Implement their own policy. These were huge concessions. The independents wanted radical political reforms and it looked like they were going to get them. The moderates wanted to restore the king to the throne in a reduced capacity, and it looked like they were going to get that too. A settlement seemed within reach. But then, the negotiators made a key discovery. The king was an unreliable partner. He would make a big concession, and the next day he would take it back. They were forced to go over the same points again and again and again. The king seemed to be playing for time. When it came to religion, the two sides could not make any progress. The negotiators, particularly the independents, wanted the Church of England to get rid of bishops and become more egalitarian. This the king would not do. He would agree to a partial set of reforms that would expire after three years, he was but nothing still a more. In him. This wasn't enough for the independents. A less hierarchical Church of England was central to their ideology. As discussions dragged into their second month, the negotiators began to lose hope. At one point, two of the moderates got down on their knees and begged the king to just give in to their demands. If these negotiations failed, they said, the army, full of bloodthirsty radicals, would have no choice but to intervene. They might not bother negotiating. While this was going on, Ireton was urging the higher ups within the army to break off negotiations and arrest the king. Ireton and others worried that the rich people in the House of Commons were going to sell out the poor people in the army by restoring the king to power. Ireton found some support among the officers, but Fairfax, an aristocrat himself, remained steadfastly moderate. In frustration, Ireton began going around and gathering public support for a long list of radical demands, which included putting the king on trial, abolishing the monarchy, and replacing the House of Commons with something else that better represented England's poor. He was quite successful. Public opinion began to shift, and the idea of putting the king on trial became quite popular, especially uh -oh. within the army. Fairfax and his moderate allies uh -oh. started to become nervous. After several days of debate, they decided to speed things along by presenting their own list of demands to the king. What they wanted was basically a military dictatorship, with the king's eight-year-old son on the throne as a puppet. Charles did the right thing and flatly turned them down. This was a big deal. Fairfax had just stabbed the negotiators in the back. When news broke, the House of Commons and the army were immediately at each other's throats. Events were moving quickly now. If the House of Commons came after the army, things might devolve into a third civil war. Caught between a rock and a hard place, Fairfax did the politically savvy thing and publicly threw his support behind the radical independence in the House of Commons. The moderates were now caught between the independent minority and the army. They agreed to vote on some of the more radical independent demands, like putting the king on trial, but then they delayed and delayed and delayed again. It quickly became clear that the moderates were playing for time, <laughs> and negotiators on the Isle of Wight were days from an agreement. On December 1st, Fairfax made his move. A bunch of soldiers showed up on the Isle of Wight with orders to bring the king to the mainland. The negotiators protested, but they had no means to resist. Fairfax had seized the king. On the next day, the army marched on London. When the House of Commons learned what was happening, the most moderate of the moderates packed up and fled the city. Fairfax had a tiger by the tail here. He was personally a moderate, but his army was out for blood. He believed that if he moved quickly and forced a harsh settlement upon the king, he might be able to save the monarchy. Maybe. If not, the nobility might be next. Revolution was in the air. Kai is back. Within days, Fairfax had occupied the capital. On the morning of December 6th, a bunch of soldiers, led by a guy named Colonel Thomas Pride, posted up just outside the House of Commons. When members of Parliament started showing up, 
Pride checked their names against the list and refused to let any of the moderates inside. Things got out of hand pretty quickly. Some of the members tried to force their way into the building, at which point they were arrested by Pride's men and taken away. This event is known to history as Pride's Purge. In total, over 200 members were expelled from the House of Commons, including 45 who were arrested. Many of those who were turned away saw the writing on the wall and fled the city. This new purged House of Commons was less than half of its original size. People were terrified, and many feared that the purges were not over. In the weeks that followed, most people stopped showing up to the Commons. A legislative body that had once had approximately 500 members. I feel like this seems way better than January 6th. Now met with sometimes as few as 40. The army had pulled off a coup d'etat. Critics of this new legislative body called it the rump parliament. And the name I guess stopped. the difference is like, you gotta have the army. You can't be pulling a January 6th with a bunch of HVAC business owners and, and petite bourgeois. You gotta have the army on your side. But here's the thing, Fairfax did not order Colonel Pride to do this. Pride was acting on Ireton's orders. Fairfax was furious. This was not what he wanted. His plan had backfired. When Cromwell, Fairfax's second in command, voiced his support for Pride's purge, Fairfax had no choice but to follow suit. He had effectively lost control of his army. The Radicals were running the show now, and they were looking to Cromwell and Ireton for leadership. This new rump parliament, finally free of moderate influence, immediately got to work. On January 1st, 1649, they passed a bill establishing a new 135-member tribunal called the High Court of Justice. This body would be empowered to put the king on trial, with its members acting as both judges and jury. Fairfax, Cromwell, and Ireton were all appointed to the tribunal, with the rest being split between radical independents from the commons and officers from the army. The legislation also called for a Lord President of the High Court of Justice, who would be responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the trial. They first went to some of the top legal minds in England, who explained to them that what they were proposing was almost certainly treason. They later found a local judge by the name of John Bradshaw, who openly favored abolishing the monarchy, and appointed him to the role. But there was a problem. The house- They found a phony- They found a phony Jack Smith! <laughs> Brother! They found a, a Trump-hating clown, okay? Another classic Biden judge, okay? That's what they did, but his wife did a... I bet his wife at the time did documentaries against the king. I bet she wrote manuscripts on papyrus paper that went against the common divine rights of the king. I do declare quite shocking behavior. This is treason. Parchment paper. My, by God, for shame. House of Lords, which was made up of prominent members of the church and the nobility, refused to ratify the creation of this tribunal. On January 4th, the rump in the House of Commons passed a resolution declaring that all legitimate political power flowed from the people which meant that the House of Commons had- Derek Evans is storming the castle. The right to exercise full sovereign authority over all of England. Popular sovereignty. Now things were really cooking. According to the rump parliament, the House of Lords and the King were politically irrelevant. Anything passed through the Commons became law. When the King learned what the Commons had done, he said in utter disbelief that no law existed under which a king could be charged with a crime. He was right, but it didn't matter. They would put him on trial anyway. Wow! On January 8th, the it's cool. It's cool that Donald Trump, January 8th, by the way, two days after January 6th, just saying, 
it's cool that Donald Trump is trying to reverse that, you know? Couple couple centuries of tradition. Donald Trump's like, actually, you should be able to have the divine right of kings if you are elected as president. Just saying. High Court of Justice met behind closed doors to discuss bringing charges against the king. By now, it was clear that Fairfax had lost control of his army, and from this point forward, he rarely attended meetings. Cromwell was in charge now. King Charles had asked a Scottish army to invade England, and so the tribunal started things off by throwing around the word treason. Nike socks. One member named These Sidney caused a bit of a panic when he explained to the group that a king Almost could fell. not commit treason because the technical definition of treason was violence against the king. And even if that wasn't true, the High Court of Justice had been established illegally without the consent of the House of Lords. Cromwell, when he heard this, burst out in anger. I tell you, we will cut off his head with the crown on it. Sidney responded, I cannot stop you, but I will keep myself clean from having any hand in this business. Bitch. The tribunal pushed forward without Sidney. It was not immediately clear what kinds of crimes a king could be guilty of, and over several days they discussed every conceivable scenario. They considered charging the king with the murder of every person killed over the course of the Civil War. They considered charging him with gross incompetence for the mismanagement of the English Navy. They considered charging him with the murder of his own father, the former king. This was a totally made up thing but it was convenient for their purposes because it actually met the technical definition of treason. After agonizing over these questions, the tribunal agreed on a specific set of charges that accused the king of being a tyrant, a traitor, and a murderer who sought to subvert the fundamental laws and liberties of the nation. As an olive branch to the moderates, the tribunal agreed to limit themselves to actual crimes that had taken place during the Civil War. Nothing about the king murdering his own father. Huh. These charges hinted at some fundamental questions. Could a king commit treason against his own kingdom? Where did political legitimacy come from? If the people rejected their king, was he still a king? These questions will be answered with the trial of King Charles I. Chat, why did you guys send me this and not like the actual video of the trials, man? God damn, that's a 20 minute video. I'm never doing this again. I mean, I love Historia Civilis. He's great, but I'm literally never watching this again. I'm never listening to anything that you silly Billy send me ever again, dude. That is insane. A 20 minute build up? Like, this video isn't labor related? No, not this video. This video is supposed to be about. This video is the build up to Can a Monarch Commit Crime? The Trial of Charles I, 1649. It's supposed to draw a parallel to Donald Trump being a god king. Why not wear shoes on a treadmill? I would get blisters. Yeah, well, guess what, dude? I'm above that. It's all kind of important. Context is important. Yeah, whatever. Okay. Okay. All right, Matt Pat is leaving the internet. Let's take a look. On March 9th, I will be hosting my last theory episode, at which point I'll be handing off the channels no! to someone else. No! No! There it is. That's it. Send tweet. We're all done here. That's all you need to know, right? Oh, wow. Forgive me, by the way, if I... Uh, I'm a little bit more disorganized than usual. Uh, normally, I would want... I feel like he has YouTuber voice on when he's, like, supposed to be emotional right now, and it, like, blow... I, I don't know how to... I don't know how to cope with it. Like, does he actually sound like that? Like, the... That's just a theory. A game theory. Like, while he's talking about normal stuff, like, when he's asking his wife, like, 
can you hand me a coffee? Just a coffee. Like, is that what he sounds like? Normal? That's his voice? Wait, really? I want to script out something like this pretty precisely. But with an announcement like this, I wanted to bring it back to just us. There, there's no one else in the room. There's no teleprompters. There's no nothing. It's just the way that this whole thing started. It's a conversation between us. And uh, sorry that I keep getting emotional about this. Um, I, oh, what's happening? Like, that other guy is quitting too? What is it? Tom Scott or something? Oh, no. Every, like, elder Gen Z, younger millennial uh, with neurodivergency is, is going going down tom scott matt pat what's next if markiplier says he's quitting that's like you've taken out an entire generation of kids grown on that grew up on youtube to me i don't really i didn't grow up on youtube so i this doesn't do anything to me I, I'll, I'll try not to but but it's a big deal no i'm not saying matt pat is neurodivergent i'm saying an entire generation of younger millennials and elderly, like older Zoomers, grew up on these guys. Deal. You know, like, if you think about it, this channel is Steph and my first child, really. Before we had Ollie, before we had Skip, Catbat, like... It was this. This was our baby. This channel has been going for 13 years. I How think in total it's, it's somewhere around Bitch, like... I grew up in Turkey. I was growing up slapping rocks. Growing up using uh, uh, airsoft rifles on one another. Shooting each other with BB guns and shit. That's what I was doing. Like 1,200 theories. <laughs> and um, only half of those are FNAF. Shocking. I know, we actually did stuff that wasn't FNAF related. But this has been a literal third of my life. And I'm going to miss you. I'm going to miss this. I value what we have here. I value this conversation, this openness, this relationship that we share. And I'm sad that I won't be able to see you every week. Which then I guess prompts the question of like, I don't understand. Like, why doesn't he just keep making videos, but just like dial back the content a little bit? Like what? This is heartbreaking, Lamau. I, I don't, I, hold on. I got to stop this. I can't take this seriously while I'm on the treadmill. Okay. I, Hassan, you better cry when you bounce, dog. <sighs> YouTube punishes you for that. Not saying that at, he's like at all like Spacey, but this feels like Kevin Spacey doing that video in character. What? Why is everybody so cynical, dude? Sometimes there doesn't have to be a sinister reason. Like, that's crazy. Why does it feel like he's getting ahead of something? It doesn't feel that way. You're saying that because you're brain broken. God damn, chatters. Perhaps this is the reason why he's quitting, okay? Because a fella can't even quit without people speculating that he might have, like, harmed children or something. Jesus Christ, the internet is so awful. Oh, my God. Like, why? Why am I doing this now? Why am I making this announcement today? Why am I walking away from the channels? Well, to be honest, um, he's quitting it was Tom too? Scott. You can blame Tom Scott. Tom Don't just did his farewell video, and I'm like, huh. Who is this well, guy? He was able to do it. I want to be able to fly away in a helicopter. Obviously, that's not it. Um, but really, my reasons for making this announcement today is probably largely the same as Tom's reasons, or Seth Everman's, or Captain Sparkles, or Papa Meats, or Stampy Longheads. Like, there's a lot of these Bro, videos that are coming out. Who are these people that he's mentioning? There is no way these are real people. Captain Sparkles and Papa Long John? Probably what? largely the same as Tom's Reasons or Seth Everman's or Captain Sparkles or Papa Meats or Stampy Longheads. Like Stampy Longhead? Okay, I know Papa Meat. That's me Kane. Me Kane is quitting. Okay, I know I know Meat Canyon. It's white people. Stampy was my literal father. 
My boyfriend watched Captain Sparkles. He is a Minecraft guy. Captain Sparkles is a legend, you fucking asshole. I don't know who these people are. I feel like... <laughs> I feel like if you're not aware of these content creators, like it seems like he made it up. You know what I mean? Like, I, I guess you can't know what I mean because you know who these guys are, but like from where I'm standing, it literally sounds like he just made up a sequence of words like captain Sparklehead. Oh dude, what the heck? There's a lot of these videos that are coming out these days, and there's going to be a lot more happening throughout this year. Steph and I have known this video would be coming for the last three years. We weren't sure it was necessarily going to be today. We didn't know exactly when it would fall, but we knew it was going to happen eventually. That's why over the last couple of years, we've been staffing up so much. That's why we partnered with a larger company to help run the channels. That's why we've been spending so much time outside of this box training up the team to make the best videos that they can because we knew that we couldn't do this forever we knew that honestly we didn't want to do this forever for as much as i love you and i love overthinking things and i love theorizing i don't love late nights i don't love the fact that steph and i this is captain sparkle's most viral video <laughs> This has 156 million views. I mean, it's like, I'm not going to make fun of this person or you guys because, like, obviously this is for children. Like, if I was a guy that looked like this, I've started making videos like that, I'd be like, yeah, I have to quit. Like, I have to quit this. Like, it makes sense. He's just, like, stuck making kids bop with Minecraft. Like, yeah, that's, like, 11 years ago. I mean, this is an adult with a adult hairline. You know what I mean? Like he is an adult. I respect you're simultaneously too young and too old for this. Like, I don't even know. You were like 12 and most of them started lol. That's what I mean. Like I, I mean, 11, 12 years ago, I had, I guess I just skipped it. Like, I, I just skibbity toileted this. I stuck my gad out for the Rizzler, and I totally missed all of this. Sonny's jacked as fuck. I mean, yeah, respect. Respect. God damn, dude. He looks like Austin Show. He has a home gym, I think. So you didn't watch anything on YouTube? No. You were like 20 when this started popping off. Yeah, I think I was just like very, I think I was simultaneously too old, but also not old enough to like have a child and then know about it. You know what I mean? But I also didn't grow up in America. So I think that's the other thing as well. He's a dirty capitalist that owns a dozen Lamborghinis for show. Brother, I don't care. He's a YouTube content creator that makes Coldplay parodies. Like, 
Yeah, go ahead, dude. Have the revolutionary people's proletarian republic seize his Lamborghinis and then chop them up, I think. Like, what? <coughs> yeah, this guy has betrayed the revolution by making Minecraft parody Coldplay songs. If you didn't watch this, you never really played Minecraft? Yeah, well, I didn't play Minecraft. That's the thing. I never played Minecraft. I think you were too old for the YouTube parody era. It was really cr uh, catered to 12-year-olds like Tabuskis and Smosh or Cringe AF now to look back on. Yeah, I, I did not... I did not know about any of this stuff, but I'm not, I'm not yucking it. I'm not yucking the yum. You know what I mean? One of the few YouTubers who wasn't in the all right, actual good person. Yeah. Especially if that's the case, he seems like a normal, nice guy. Respect. If you were a YouTuber during that era, you either retire from YouTube early or lived it long enough to become the villain. Yeah. It was kids content for a subset of Zoomers. Don't know why chatters are acting like they don't get it. This was my childhood and I'm 10 years younger than you. Yeah. Um, what is this? I'm mining. I'm mining. I'm mining. I'm mining. I mean, I remember the 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 Playboy Cardi mining song. That was pretty funny. But that was like recent. This is what the Hasidic people were playing when digging those tunnels. Stop. I'm mining. Mom's so icy, wonder why they kill me. I'm just mining in water. I just fell in a hole. Now I'm crying. Every server. I go on, yeah, it's inspiring. Minecraft, 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 Minecraft. I'm just mining. I no, this is Boogie with a hoodie, but I'm talking about uh, uh, the 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 parody that I remember is like from a couple years ago, which was a Playboy Cardi, uh, Playboy Cardi song. I think it was like, wasn't it Cardi? The Cardi Minecraft one was oh this one I think. Yeah, this is the one. I mean, this was actually fire. Uh, yeah. When me and you get hit, yeah. diamond armor on my dick. Watch out, cause I got that stick. I'ma hit that fucking lick. Throw your diamonds in a pit. Watch that zombie yeah. throw a fit. Fuck with me on loaded clip. Diamonds on my Like, that, that was actually sick. That was. What? No. Anyway, um, oh, fell in lava is the one I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah, these are fire. This was you and Captain Sparkles was popping. Yeah, well that. Sure makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, I was in fucking college, dude. Yeah, no shit. No wonder there are Hasanabi haters. Man, I'm not 
I'm not yucking anybody's yum, man. I'm just trying to understand it and associate with it. And, and like, I don't know. I just like, this is something that I, this is something that I never uh, understood. This is something that I was never a part of. Right. So personally, like I I'm trying to make sense of it by looking at something that is like more relevant to me because it, it's something that I did see recently. So that's the difference. That's what I'm doing. You met Tommy in it and Tubbo, so you might have interacted or walked past Captain Sparkles. Captain is definitely a huge inspiration for both of them and most Minecrafters today. Um... Anyway, I just... I've been work first for over a decade where I'm sitting down at dinner with my best friend and we're talking about business logistics or we're talking about animatronic toes. I miss the days where I could just sit down on the couch. Animatronic toes? What couch with her and play video games and it's not for content. Yeah, it's oh. like, dude, I sit down at dinner with my family and I'm running the top of the hour ad break in my, in my mind. You know what I mean? I'm like, at the top of the hour, there's a three minute ad break. If you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe. For $5 or for free with the Twitch Prime, you can avoid the top of the hour ad breaks or by getting gifted a sub if you're lucky. Here's a three minute ad break now. Like, that's what I'm saying when it's like 9 p.m. and I'm having dinner with Marat and I'm just serving him a top of the hour ad break. I'm just straight up to his face serving that. You are sick. Seek help. <laughs> or I'm playing a game and I'm not thinking about what theories are going to come out of that. I miss it. So that's, that's a big reason. That was, that was a big one right there. Uh, but also just the internet's changing. My life has changed in the last 13 years. I, I mentioned Dolly before. He's the coolest little dude. And he's getting older by the minute. And I watch him. And he has so much fun. And he has so much. Oh, yeah. Matt paid me to view about how big Jeez. Luigi's well, dick might be. No way. Okay, this is. And going back, way back to the earliest days of this show. To a time when I had much more questionable taste in episode topics. To a time six years ago when I jokingly promised to make up for the boobs episode with a video like this. And yet, here we are. 2018 and a legitimate topic being discussed online is Luigi's short bulge. It's true. If you hadn't heard, in mid-March, Nintendo released promotional images for Mario Tennis Aces. Specifically. To be honest, like, I don't really, I don't really know anything about the game theories either, aside from like, well, that's just a theory, a game theory. My introduction to Matt Pat was like, specifically when he dissed me. Uh, and then also specifically when he dissed Eddie Bareback by putting him in the thumbo when it's like, when he's basically making fun of the same exact concept that Eddie Bareback was making fun of. But then literally put Eddie Bareback in the thumbnail as though Eddie Bareback was doing the same thing that everyone else was doing. But then to be fair, he also put himself in the thumbo, which is a criticism of the YouTube content. He didn't like diss me that hard. I forget what he said. I don't even remember what it was. Bygones be bygones. Who cares? Um... Don't trust Rambu. Game theory lies of founder Rambu generation lost. Game theory, there's no place like home. Welcome home. These are all these like games that you guys ask me to play. And then Ray makes me play on stream because like they're they're scary kids games. Right? I feel like he does a lot of theories on that. What is it? FNAF? Oh, he used the empty chair meme in a video about React content during the peak of React Gate. That was it. Yep, that's it. That was, he did that. Yeah, he did that to me. But that was just a theory. Anyway, well, he's retiring, so who won? I mean, he won, bro. What do you mean? He's at 18 million subscribers and stuff. Smarter than I was 
when I was his age. He also probably knows the FNAF lore better than I do, which is a problem that I should probably address at some point. But honestly, I want to be able to spend more time with him. Another sad fact of the matter is, is I'm getting older. I'm 37 now. The other day, I actually had to Google my own age. And you know that when you have to- That's crazy that he's 37 years old and he looks like a baby, dude. Yo, money keeps you young, son. It looks like he's in a vat. Like, he's like perma-stuck as like a 28-year-old, it seems. Which I assume is when he like reached peak wealth. Or not start, peak like, wealth, but like when he actually reached like... No, he looks so old. Guys. I am 32, about to be 33. He looks younger than me. What are you talking about? I have gray hairs on my beard. This man has five years on me. We are so old, so old people like us look young. It's hard. We can get through this, BB. Exactly. You look like 40 or some. Wait, no, I don't. I don't look like I'm 40. Shut up. Like doing math in your head to calculate how old you are, you are over the hill, my friends. Though to be fair, to my credit, I think I'm like the only 37 year old out there who has an unironic appreciation of skibbity toilet. Then again, maybe that's the problem, right? <laughs> like maybe that's not a good thing. And honestly, because this is all about us being honest, there is a bit of a selfish side to this. When you think about it, there's only really two ways to step away from a YouTube channel. You either just decide the day that you stop uploading. Or you get like, canceled. I'm done. Or you just keep uploading videos from now until the heat death of the universe. And you watch. You keep uploading videos until you get canceled. <laughs> as your relevance slowly dies or your passion slowly dies. And for me and <laughs> my journey. Dude, I love no matter what happens, I'll be there for you chatter you are old and fat no matter what happens there's got to be a chatter in, who's in like dude you're old you're fat you're desperately near death by the way make no mistake i'm only saying that specifically to get you so that hopefully i don't have to think about my own condition <laughs> my own situation i always wanted to go out on a high note and when you stop and look at the last year this has been the best year in the theorist lifespan ever like no joke it is our highest view year uh it is the year where we launched style theory and immediately put our foothold in a brand new space and that took off and now we're one of the top style and fashion channels on youtube and that kind of completes the trifecta of hey we now have a top channel in four different verticals that are completely different and no other youtuber really has ever been able to do it to that scale that's amazing this is also this the year never experienced twink death okay he still looks, he, lo he still looks hot. He looks young. He looks hot. If he never said he was 37, I would have never thought that. I mean, the only thing that gives away how old he might be is that like, he has a very distinct style of like millennial humor. Like he's giving awesome sauce. If that makes sense. Like the only thing about him that says like, he might actually be older in the way he presents himself is that, is that he's just got like a very, like, he looks like he built the genre of millennial humor. Like, he was there when the foundations were being placed. He's like the Noam Chomsky of, like, what Noam Chomsky is to language and, like, slurs. He was there when the tomes were being written. Matt Pat was for millennial humor. Where I was able to meet you guys at our Broadway show. I was able to play at the PGA and show that, hey, YouTubers aren't particularly good at golf, but they can make your event relevant for, like, a couple of minutes. It was also the year. Yes, he did say, he did say send tweet in the beginning. That I got to host the Streamy Awards and it wasn't cringe. I mean, to be, to be fair, the Streamy Awards are always a little bit cringe, but uh, it, was, it was the right amount of cringe. When I pull up videos of all my favorite creators and I watch them and all of a sudden I start hearing people. He is literally a pillar of YouTube. He's one of the reasons you have good connections with your YouTube rep. First of all, I don't know why you said I have good connections with my YouTube rep. Like that was a given. Like I, do, like, I have a good connection. 
people just casually dropping, that's just a theory. It's just a theory, a game theory. Now, this is just a theory, people. I mean, even I know that, and I don't even watch, I don't, I've watched like one and a half video of his, and even I know that. So, like, he is an institution. At the end of the day, it's just a game theory. That's just a theory. A free birds theory. Also a lot of lore, so if you're a big theory head, proceed at your own risk. I Sorry. did not know about this theory. Or That's a theory. Okay. That right there, that is incredible. That's the note that I want to leave on. And that's how you just know it's the right time. All of those reasons coming together, saying, hey, this is the moment. And that's hard to say. He pioneered the idea of theories the fuck? No, like, but the, that's just a theory. A game theory is like his signature. Let's not act like that's not the case. Okay, come on. I don't know why Chad is like so ready to stab Caesar over here. Like you're trying to, you're trying to get a, you're trying to get a stab in. Okay. You are not a part. You are not Brutus. You are not him. You are now trying to sneak in a little stabby stab to be like, maybe I can have my own uh, little Spanish villa uh, on the side here. Okay. No. Don't act like you were there when, when they were planning this, okay? You were not there. Don't try to get a stab in. Because change is scary. Change is hard. But sometimes the right decision isn't the easy decision. The, the easy decision would just be to carry on doing this and do FNAF part 332. But that wouldn't be the right decision. I think the best way to explain it is... Chad is doing the cringe is a crime punishable by death bullying bit. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he, this guy is like definitely important in YouTube history, which is such a weird thing to say. Cause like I was there when YouTube was invented, you know, I feel like, I mean, how long has this guy been around? I, I just, I don't know about his specific type of content, even though like his impact is obviously so significant that even I know the memes, right. To a certain degree. But I suspect that, like, if he's been doing this for 13 years, yeah, it breaks your brain. It literally breaks your brain. Uh, it, even if you're doing YouTube, which is a type of content that definitely is not as, like, aggro and doesn't take as much of a toll on your body and your soul and your consciousness and your mind in the same way that Twitch streaming does. So, you know, I think all things considered, looking great for 37. You don't know who Captain Sparkles? How was you there at the beginning? I mean, I was, as in like, I was beyond an adolescent when YouTube was first invented. That's what I meant. Like. I'm not familiar with like the YouTube lore masters and whatnot, but. Or I'm not familiar with like the OG YouTubers because I just wasn't really into YouTube like that. I still am not into YouTube like that. Is with a video game analogy. Feels appropriate, right? Whoa, it's game theory. Ha! Did it. Check the game part of it off. But the way I like to think about it is earthbound. I think I've made it. My friend Tony and his wife, every frame of painting, quit while they were ahead too. They had the biggest Patreon at the time. They just want to change. I loved Devin Art. I've watched all of his videos on stream, and you know I've talked about this. You've been in here long enough. You've probably seen me talk about this. I love every frame of painting. I think it was one of the better YouTube channels. Pretty clear over the years that that is, without question, my favorite game of all time. Sansa's Nest, all that. You're all familiar with that. But what you might not be familiar with at this point is how the game ends. At the end of Earthbound, after you save the world, everything opens up to you. You can revisit every single location that you've been to. You can talk to every NPC that you met on your journey. And it's this incredible moment as a gamer. You see just how many lives. Spoilers, bro. He spoiled Earthbound. Guess I can't play it. He spoiled it. Lives have been impacted thanks to your journey. And then after spending as much time as you want talking to all those people, you end up back home. You go back to where it all began where you were just a kid waking up in bed and starting your adventure. And even though your mom's there and your dog's there and your weird telephone dad's there, it feels different somehow. Like, sure, this is still a place of love and acceptance and comfort and security, but you just don't quite fit anymore. Because you just traveled the world. You made all these new friends. You are different. You grew up. And your relationship to this place grows up. It evolves. In case you couldn't tell, 
I'm Ness, which uh, I guess would also mean that I'm also Sans. <laughs> but I was also Ness in the FNAF movie, which just opens up all sorts of weird canon. Slap a thumbnail on that one. So anyway, there you have it. That is why I'm leaving. I hope you can understand. But that obviously begs the question of like, what happens to the channels? Well, for the next 10 weeks, we're gonna have ourselves a big old going away party. If Unus Anus taught us anything, it, it taught us that you probably shouldn't use urine uh, for a personal sauna. One of the goats of YouTube, 07, Lee, Amy, Santi, Tom, I don't know any of this stuff. Like this is, I, I will never, God, I feel so, when I see stuff like this, I just, I feel so out of touch with like the environment that I'm supposedly a part of where it's like, I, I don't even know what the hell Ludwig is saying. Did he just make that up? I don't know what this is. But if Unis Anas taught us two things, one was uh, to not soak in your own urine, but two was to appreciate the time that you have left. So that's why over the next 10 weeks, we're gonna have a bunch of theories that are gonna be a lot of fun, revisiting old favorites, uh, getting some closure on things. We're gonna see some familiar faces, a lot of awesome stuff. Although to be fair, I think it's nine weeks. And I think we counted this one. He as gave. One. That was stupid of us. That my friends is how you wind up getting Wario being 10 feet tall. Math he gave the Pope Undertale? Matt Pat was invited to the Vatican as a part of the World Summit on the Internet and how it brings people together. Informed that he should present Pope Francis with a gift, Matt Pat chose Undertale, the indie role-playing hit by Toby Fox that launched last year. That's insane. Bro, he made the Pope gay. Matt Pat is the man who is responsible for the death of the Catholic Church. He's the one who made the Pope gay, dude. That's crazy. Yes, in my head canon, the Pope absolutely played Undertale and found out that you're not supposed to kill any of the characters and was like, oh my God, oh my God, uh, even though I'm an Argentina. I actually have to pick it like this because that is how what happens when you are the Pope. And then he was like, oh, Maron. <laughs> I should have saved the gays. <laughs> and the trans women. That's crazy. The Pope started 2022 by blasting a song from the hit RPG Undertale. This year just started and we already have the insanity of Megalovania being performed in front of the Pope. This is Argentinian erasure. No, dude. I mean, he's he lives in the Vatican. Every Pope becomes Italian, okay? That's just how it works. You didn't watch Una's Anna's? It was a beautiful set of videos that lasted for a year where Markiplier and Ethan did random shit every day. They deleted the channel after the year. Yeah, I have no idea what that is. I also don't know why they did that. Why did they do random stuff every day? Guys, I, that's another thing. Like, I, I have watched zero Markiplier. I, I just know him as, like, the hot voice guy. Medical rigor. Should have double checked the numbers. So I have nine theories left on each of the channels, but we're gonna call them Matt Pat's final ten because that just sounds better. At which point, then on March 9th, we're gonna have that big going away celebration. Una's honest changed my life. Matt Pat's final theory, and I just dust away. I stand astride my music man, and I just whip and nay nay off into the distance. But then something special happens. Do the channels go away with me? No, actually, I've always thought that anyone can be a theorist, right? If you are passionate about a topic and you love to overthink it and over-research it, then congratulations, you're a theorist. And that could range from, hey, I have family recipes that I'm constantly looking to refine, to, hey, I wanna create the perfect fantasy sports team. Because here's the thing, sports bros, at the end of the day, if you are in the statistics and numbers and doing calculations to see if your team won or lost, you're just playing a glorified Dungeons and Dragons game. I hate to break it to you, you're one of us, my friends. And, and sure, game theory is a format that I created. It's a show with this very excitable host who makes a lot of cringy dad jokes and says the word lore a lot. But at the end of the day, 
it's more than just the host. It is a show. It is no, Devin, a format. It's okay. And I'm not going to In a broader every sense, it is a state guy. of mind. It's a way of thinking and approaching the world around you. It's more than just the host. And when you think about it, not a lot of YouTube channels function that way. We're special in that regard. Like, you're not going to be able to get another Markiplier stepping into the Markiplier channel. And you're never going to be able to recreate Jenna Marbles. And, and to be honest, you're never going to get another MatPat either. But you can have another game theorist. You can have another film theorist or food theorist or style. You were unfortunately never there during the Skeptiplier arg of the internet. What's that? He saw the bromosexual guards and had to come to a Jesus moment. What is a Skeptiplier? He had a show back when Disney was pushing into gaming entertainment. What is a Skeptiplier? Jack Septic Eye plus Markiplier. Shipping Mark and Jack Septic Eye. Is that like a Gaylor thing? None of these words are in the Quran. Yeah. Kaya has met Jack Septic Eye. This is true. Before me. Uh, you're 100% familiar with this topic, aren't you? Hassan Stash? It got very out of hand. It was a Tumblr thing. The end of Una's Honest was like a funeral stream and then the clock wound down to zero. The surreal experience of watching all the videos delete while you were watching the stream on their channel until they finally clicked delete on the channel and the stream went down. Wow, that's kind of sick. One septiplier Google search will give you 1,000 kissing gifts. If that tells you, okay, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm hitting the Google search. Oh my God, what the hell is this? Oh my God. Oh my God, what the hell is this? Oh my God, I should have never, sometimes it's okay to leave certain, uh, leave certain toothpaste in the fucking, in the toothpaste, okay? Leave the paste inside of the can, the tube, whatever. I'm, I'm losing, I'm losing words. I forgot words. Oh God. Oh, no, that was, wow, that was not good. I've seen enough. I'm taking the glasses off. What are kids doing, man? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay, Una's Honest. Yeah, I got it. I got it. It was one year. It's about embracing death, the death of content. You've been septiplied? Oh, my God. Those kids are in their 20s now? Yeah, dude. It's just like... Stop acting like that's somehow the most insane thing you've ever seen. You watch anime? No, that's definitely more insane than the anime I watch, for sure. My man, there are yaoi art of your RP characters. I don't know if this is outside of your wheelhouse. Dude, I know. That stuff is weird as hell, too. The final stream had a coffin and everything. Theorist. I think in a lot of ways, we almost function kind of like the Doctor Who of YouTube, where as one host fades away, a new one kind of respawns in their place. And they're able to put their own unique spin and flavor on the format and make it their unique thing. You have eras of the different theorist channels. And so, you know, my era is fading away and someone new is coming in. Maybe this is the David Tennant to Matt Smith transition, right? That was a good, solid series of episodes right there. So who then is going to be taking over the channels? Well, I don't know if you... I feel like he's speaking in a different language, dog. I'm trying to understand. <sighs> Why'd you even go down this rabbit hole? You should have just stayed with the damn rabbis of the tunnels, lol. I mean, dude, this is another tunnel. If you want to be 
if you want to keep it 100, you know, this is like a, a this is another tunnel. We are in the shul right now, and I'm slowly breaking the wooden walls of the shul with a hammer to uncover a secret tunnel, which leads to the the other, uh, what was it called? The Like, it's it's the Chabat, but then it goes into the, the other house, the holy house. So that's that's kind of what we're doing right now. There are tunnels inside of shuls. <laughs> In the Matpat, this is the Matpat tunnel. Terror, tunnel of terror. If you've noticed this, but fewer and fewer of the words that I'm saying in any given episode are actually mine. If you go down to the credits, you can actually see in the description that there are certain names that are appearing more and more frequently. Like, yeah, I'm listed on every single one as the writer because I touch every single script, I polish it in my voice. But in all honesty, the bulk of what I'm saying is coming from someone else. It's their research. It's their work. Why should they have to filter their creativity through my voice? I've always envisioned these channels as a place where we could spotlight all sorts of creators. I, I mean, it even goes back to the original URL of this channel, right? It isn't game theory. It was always the game theorists because this was a place where you could find a lot of like-minded creators all with a passion for gaming and education. That's why we had the partner shows like Gaijin Goomba with Culture Shock or Drake with Smash History or Ryder with A Brief History or Austin with The Science and Lee with Breakdown. They were all here because we all had a similar goal to educate people through the lens of gaming. And then YouTube pivoted and then made it so that way doing a channel in that style doesn't really work anymore. But we still tried to keep that ethos alive by making sure that we're regularly covering small indie projects. Stuff like Only Cans, like Mandela Catalog, like Oh Whoa, O-W-O, see, I learned. But if we're doing that for all these other creators, why aren't we doing it for the creators on our own staff? Babe, wake up, they announced MatPat DLC, try not the cry challenge, impossible. There's a brand new game theory on Fox News. You need to react Taylor to this right Swift, away. A Pentagon asset. That's what I'm talking about, dude. Put this in my veins, dude. Put this in a pipe and smoke it. This is my crack cocaine. Now, that's just a theory, a Jesse Waters game theory, okay? This is the reason why I don't know enough about Matt Pat. And why he's leaving the internet or like Captain Sparkles or any of these other like goaded legendary content creators that I'm unfamiliar with is because I spent a good chunk of my life basically mainlining the most unhinged, dumbass, nonsensical, reactionary politics. This is my cutting edge. Okay, this is what gives me edge against... My, my interlocutors, okay? This is what gives me the edge I need as a political commentator who can do this kind of thing in real time. That's probably what it is. That's it. This kind of shit. Did you see Scooter Braun talking to Noah Tishby? I think No Human Alive is dumber than him. He said to talk to the kids and anyone who asked. They had a music festival of peace so close to Gaza. It was down because of the kids. Blah, 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 blah. I don't care. I don't care about Scooter Braun. And I don't want to watch Noah Tishby or whatever at all. Yeah. Don't know who Matt Pat is, but you know Judge Janine's entire scholarly legal work? Yes. He was popping off on YouTube when you were trading blows with a blonde chick while on TYT. Yeah. How have you been so deep in the politics hole and remain normal? I wouldn't say I'm normal. I would, however, say. I would, however, say that I'm, I guess, more normal than those who cover politics online for the most part. And that is because, I don't know, I just had like a normal development and a healthy interest. Uh, as a political commentator, why aren't you covering the equator be instead of some YouTuber? I feel like it's irresponsible of me to not do a little bit of reading on the equator. The Ecuador, sorry, not equator, uh, Ecuador, and and uh, and and you know, I keep calling it the equator, okay, and then get back into it instead of just like what reacting to Twitter videos of violence of like uh, a bunch of people, uh, you know, breaking into a television studio with guns and and, and trading shots with the police. Is that what you want me to cover? It's like, I don't know. I don't, I need to, I need to do a little bit of reading. I need to, and no, I don't mean Wikipedia. I mean, like, make a better assessment instead of covering it haphazardly in real time 
without any sort of understanding. I know a lot of people come in here specifically and say, Hassan, you cover breaking news. I thought you didn't cover breaking news, blah, blah, blah. When I'm, when I'm talking about stuff, I usually develop an understanding before I, I broach the subject matter. Oftentimes, most of the things I talk about are things that are ongoing anyway. There are things that, I, that, are, there are things that I've covered before. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah. Ecuador is a land of contrast. There you go. That's it. You only cover breaking news when you already have know the background info and what's going on in U.S. politics or Israel-Palestine? Exactly. Um, I don't know everything. Uh, specifically, I don't know... Uh, I don't know enough about what's going on in Ecuador. I don't know. So I don't know what you want me to say about it. I, I don't... It seems like a bunch of people escaped prison and turned around and and on a cursory glance they they escaped they broke out of prison and then like bombs exploded in different parts of the country and they took over a news station that's it also look at this so very quickly people found out that he just kind of ripped this it's an After Effects Panther template, I think. Free After Effects intro template. My man went in and got the free After Effects intro template. Furious Panther logo intro template. No text included. I mean, dude, this is... There is no worse broke boy behavior than this, okay? This is literally the most broke boy behavior, which I assume because this is Elon Musk, there's like... Time to write another chapter, buddy. The king has spoken. It's actually not a bad joke from Ludwig. But... God damn, he's suffering, dude. Oh, my God. Holy moly, he's not doing all right. There is no way. Did he think no one was going to find out, or is he just that shameless? I mean, dude... It doesn't matter. Look, see, this is why it doesn't matter. Amazing graphic. Even this guy, who's a dick writer of his and shameless, kind of recognizes that this is bunk, but then leans into it like, oh, he did this on purpose. PlayStation 1 video game company intro vibes. Fire. Excellent zeet, my fellow Sigma. Exactly. Cope. Yes, I'm coping. He's the goat. And I'm the giraffe. Isn't it just a troll? What? I don't even know what he's doing no more, man. I don't know. Speaking of people not doing all right, conservatives are losing their fucking minds on Twitter right now. Breaking, James Madison High School in New York City will be shutting down in order to provide shelter to the illegals. Approximately 1.9K illegals from F Floyd Bennett Field will temporarily be located to the school. You might ask, what happens to the students? They will be forced to attend virtual classes. Illegals over your children in New York City. So... 
So where is the article for this? No article, just a blurry go one Google Maps image, please, and one blurry photo of I what I suspect is the high school. By a guy whose username is I meme, therefore I am chief memer, mother, and oh. Immigration, sometimes not so good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you don't want to mess with. God, family, country, parody at times. Anyway, uh, I wanted to cover this, but it's on Bloomberg Tech, and I can't get over the Bloomberg. I can't bypass Bloomberg Tech's incredible paywall. Some 2,000 migrants evacuated from Floyd Bennett Field's shelter due to high wind concerns. They're going to be relocated to the Floyd Bennett Field, uh, James Madison High School in Midwood. As soon as we're dismissed at the regular time, one teacher told CBS2 staff they received an email Tuesday morning saying that migrants were set to arrive at 5 p.m. and placed inside the school's gym. At 6.30 a.m., they sent an email just a storm coming in and migrants will be coming to the site to take important stuff home. New York's uh, Emergency Management Commissioner Zach Iskall told the evacuation about 500 families are being staggered. Tuesday, as migrants return to Floyd Bennett Field throughout the evening. Okay, what is what are they supposed to do? Like, let them die? I don't understand. It's like, okay, yeah, they're using... They're using the school as it, what schools oftentimes are used for. Like a like a storm shelter. Yeah. They're using it as an emergency shelter. What is the problem? Oh, anyway, the highest wind gusts up to 70 miles per hour. Really close to JFK, Jamaica Bay, and along the coast. They're expected to be closer to Creedmoor, where the Randalls are. Placing asylum seekers in Floyd Bennett Field despite the known significant storm risk highlights the mismanagement and waste money that is all too present in City Hall's approach to shelter and services for asylum seekers. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a byproduct of, of people using real human beings as a pawn in their political theater. Disgusting. It's gross. And I think the federal government should step in. I've been saying this from the jump. That's it. Um, those people complaining are doing so from the shelter? No, no. Um, the crazy winds, I mean, it's a perfect storm. Crazy winds are, are um, creating... A dangerous environment, it seems, for immigrants that were shipped from an area where they're supposed to, uh, from an area where they were supposed to be processed, okay, in a literal storm and uh, uh, in, in a storm situation. They're being placed in emergency shelter. It's perfectly normal. It's so dumb. They're making it seem like school's out forever. They're, they're just like reappropriating the school to be a shelter for undocumented migrants. Anyway. Great stuff. Twitch laying off 35% of his workforce in the latest round of staff cuts. Video game streaming giant Twitch will reduce his workforce by 35% in a move that will see around 500 workers lose their jobs. The move follows two rounds of layoffs in 2023 that cut around 400 positions. All told, the layoffs will see close to 1,000 employees lose their jobs in less than a year. Bloomberg's report attributes layoffs to concerns over losses as well as the departure of several top executives. Twitch announced in December that it would be shutting down its office in Korea in February. Twitch has come to dominate the streaming space since launching back in 2011, but it has continued to struggle with costs. In a post announcing the closure in Korea, CEO Dan Clancy described operating in that country as prohibitively expensive. Bloomberg reports that Twitch remains unprofitable. 
Elsewhere, the games industry continues to be impacted by layoffs. Just yesterday, Unity Software announced that it was laying off 25% of its staff amid a company reset. Massive layoffs in 2023 tempered what was otherwise a banner year for game releases. Yeah. Yeah, revenue growth is, is out of control for everybody. Cake will purchase Twitch, lol. Yeah, totally. Amazon is going to look at Twitch and go, why do we own this soon? I mean, that happens. Your boy is toast, okay? And your boy is me. So who knows? Just go to YouTube. I mean, most likely. <laughs> Rumble arc. Rumble is, <laughs> speaking of Rumble, Rumble is part of an active and ongoing SEC investigation. The SEC confirmed to Wired that the financial regulator has launched an investigation involving Rumble, a free speech video platform. The nature of the probe remains unknown. So, nope. politically correct youtuber hassan coming no if i go to youtube i have to be like a liberal like a racist liberal that's the that's the way to go going to youtube going to youtube would imply that i have to be like super racist that's what i have to do speaking of which by the way um what? New mogul mail? This Twitch streamer lied about being black? That seems crazy. Uh, we'll cover that in a second. I did want to cover another layoff, or a self-imposed layoff, rather. Uh, uh, not quiet quitting, loudly quitting. Mehdi Hassan bids farewell to MSNBC. There's not really anything to, like, cover from uh, the his last remaining, uh, I mean, his last uh, uh, episode. But the Mehdi Hassan show uh, was, was canceled on Peacock. And they said they were going to, like, uh, put him in a different position, in a different time slot. Uh, do I believe, do I believe personally that, uh, that this is, the reason for this is because of his uh, uh, Israel, like, his anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian commentary? Absolutely. Without a doubt. Okay? Without a doubt. That's right. I'll say it. Can't do it, baby. Can't do it. One of the only places where you are at least like to a certain degree allowed and able to do this uh, vociferously and speak truth to power and uh, openly say that, uh, you know, Israel is, is uh, engaging in acts of genocide is like independent news outlets. Democracy Now! Uh, here, like very few, very few places operate like this. It's the truth. And the unfortunate reality is, and Al Jazeera, obviously, um, Majority Report is another good place as well. The The unfortunate uh, reality is that you just can't really, you know, you can't really go ham. You can't really go hard. Every time I look at this tab, you're playing an ad. Can we get another? Uh, no. Maybe in a little bit. Um, But, yeah, it's kind of funny that you're complaining about that while I'm literally talking about, like, a, a, a uh, Muslim anchor commentator having to leave because he got demoted. It sucks overall because uh, I think Matthew Hassan, I mean, he, he played, I mean, he played his role well. He interviewed a lot of people. He was very good at, at ripping into people, you know? Thirty five percent is equal to less than half the one K Andes, which gave the opportunity to any random shooter to make your own success. The unfortunate reality is that one K Andes is one K. Bro, you didn't even understand. Thirty five percent staff layoffs has nothing to do with one K Andes and Twitch streamers. This is staff. They're taking out staff. They're laying off staff. Not only did you, you know, misunderstand what was going on, but then you also additionally speculated about like people who have one K viewership. As though that is not an impressive feat in and of itself. It is. 
okay? Not because the 1K Andes are 1K because their efforts show in their content, and it certainly doesn't mean that someone like myself put significantly more effort in my content or anything like that. The idea that, like, you know, if you try really hard on Twitch, like, you will inevitably become super successful, which, by the way, 1K Andes are super successful, let's be real, um, is ridiculous, okay? The top content creators on this platform don't necessarily put, like, a tremendous amount more work uh, or, or time into what they're doing. There's plenty of content creators who don't do that at all. Um, you've been on this platform since, what, 2011? That's wild. You created your account on 2011. You should know that. Anyway. I was watching the Amy Goodman and Ryan Grimm Belmarsh Tribunal and half of those investigative journals have interacted with you or even visited the stream either live on Discord. Just want to say how dope that is. Thanks. Yeah, hell yeah, dude. I try to do my best here. But, um... Yeah, I think people hustle a lot, but most people forget how much luck plays a role in all of this. Luck plays a like a tremendous role. We all love this. Okay? That's it. And many people forget that. Meritocracy is a lie. Don't forget. This video will crack you up. Luck isn't always needed, though. No, luck is a... You cannot outwork probability, in my opinion, okay? I don't believe that. I think probability plays a big role in everyone's lives, which is why I consistently advocate to, at the very least, create a base level of equality in material conditions and then allow people to thrive uh, beyond that. You know, have people's needs met. This reality should not stop you from working hard. I've never stopped working hard in my entire life. But of course, luck played a big role, okay? There were people who were luckier than me on top of that. And there were people who probably worked uh, uh, harder than me and never reached the same level of success. Okay. Just, uh, I mean, what is it? Success is what luck equals hard work or something. It's like a bit of a cliche, but I mean, there is some truth to it. Success is hard work meets opportunity. Yes. 100% concentrated power of will. Yes. That too. Um, anyway. 10% luck. 20% skill. 100% concentrated power of will. Yeah. And a 100% reason to remember the name. Hmm. Yeah. Knees weak, arms are heavy. There's vomit on a sweater already. Mom spaghetti. Mom spaghetti. He's nervous. <sighs> anyway. So, what was I going to say? I'm forgetting what I was going to say. I'm skipping the farmer's protest. I don't really care. Um, do you lie to your fans and discourage the competition? <laughs> yes. My, my five-hit play is that I don't want people to compete, so I just lie to them and I tell them, like, dude, you're not, you're not going to make it. Don't try. Even though I do tell you that you should work hard and you should try. Um. What is this? 
Did you see the New Zealand MPs Haka? No. But I saw people were being real racist. I mean, I didn't watch the full thing. I saw like a clip of it. New Zealand MP, MP performs Haka in powerful maiden speech. Resurfaced video shows a New Zealand MP made a powerful speech in Maori language for a first appearance in Parliament. Research video shows. Yes, miss. New Zealand in the chat, that is not our accent. I mean, this is cool. I don't know why people get so mad about this kind of thing. Maori is called Tirio. How? What? What did he say? How do you like so much self awareness? monkey girl. Oh my god. <laughs> Least racist Turkish guy in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking idiot, dude. Why did you read that? I don't know. You guys added him. I wanted to see what, what it was about. Um Yes, the Turkish guy called her a monkey girl. So he got banned immediately because he's a racist. Um, the first chat was calling me a donkey, but that's like more like a, not like a, like a negative way. He was like, no, but not a chick. It just means like he's being familiar with me. You know what I mean? Um, okay. Let's do, uh, oh, this was fucking cringe take. But <laughs> it's, like, so odd that people, Lil Nas X is, like, <laughs> Lil Nas X is, is making fun of Jesus, I guess, or something. And everyone is, like, mad. Join phase, produce your takes, and and your rage hit the hit the, you know Muslims would have had his head by dawn. Yo, phase clan, I ain't gonna ever say what I'm thinking. Just wondering, will y'all terminate my phase contract if I do? First of all, doubt it. What is this? Christianity needs to start standing on business. It's just like, is your age like a hardcore Christian? I don't think so. Uh, it's just like, where is this coming from? You know what I mean? Like, what? Why why does it have to turn into like well Muslims won't let this kind of thing happen? Like okay. We need another Reddit atheism boom. No, we already have it. That's like the most pe that's peak Reddit atheism to be like see Christians are letting this kind of criticism go by. Muslims would never let it happen. Except like, you know, Esau, Jesus is a a prophet under Islam as well. Then you get mad at Reddit atheists. I do get mad at Reddit atheists. Because, like, the thing is, yes, dude, yes. Uh, Islam has more stringent rules about, like, what you can and can't make fun of. Because it's, like, still considered inappropriate. And people get mad about it. And it's like, guess what, dude? If America didn't, and the Western world didn't do its very best to leave the Muslim world in rubble, okay, they probably wouldn't get so goddamn mad. They would have had their own version of like, I guess like a like a lighter reformation or something. Okay, I mean look at look at Turkey. Like, 
not that Turkey wasn't uh, uh, meddled with, but Turkey was largely a collaborator, of a, a Western collaborator, and therefore was allowed to be as like uh, as as uh, as as invested in laicite and secularism in the most aggressive way for a very long time, and therefore it's not the same level of like anger associated with like defending Islam. You know, and that even that is changing now. So there's that too. <sighs> Did I miss the Hassan take on the tunnel story? Dude, I covered it for like three hours. Americans will have that we don't give a shit air of superiority and start threatening you the moment you don't clap for the troops. Taboos vary per culture, but Americans can't take it. Yeah. Lil Nas X literally got exposed for being an Islamophobe. Yeah, it's like kind of funny that he's saying about that about Lil Nas X. As well, because like, didn't he? Wasn't he like a Nikki Stan who had like a lot of anti-Islam uh, uh, tweets and stuff on the Nikki Stan account back in the day? That is like a little bit of tea that I know about Lil Nas X. Oh. To be fair, he probably was a little baby at the time. More so wild that he like uh, was a little baby with Islamophobic tendencies, but. I know Twitter hates me right now, but I want y'all to know I'm literally about to go to college for biblical studies in the fall and then everything is a troll. Anyway, I'm a student again. Let's go. Liberty University. That's funny. Um, yeah, I don't know why people get so touchy-feely about it. I, I, I understand why Muslims do about certain aspects of religion. But like, isn't that the whole point? Isn't that that's isn't that what's so great about um, like the Western understanding of Christianity? Like, doesn't this imply that what the Muslim world is doing is bad when they get like aggressively angry about uh, you know criticisms of Islam or whatever, and and uh, making jokes about uh, Prophet Muhammad, which <laughs> hasn't really stopped white people from. Uh, engaging in that kind of thing before. So, like, why why are you simultaneously criticizing that while also saying, like, and we should do it too. We shouldn't allow that to happen for Christianity. Wait, but was your rage that made this about Muslims? Yes. He had a hit tweet being like, try that about Muslims and you'll see what happens. And like that kind of thing, I don't really understand because it's like, what, what, what did Muslims do? Why you got to bring Muslims into this? Why can't Christians handle this amongst themselves? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's just always weird. Atheist chatters, be quiet, please. Yeah. But I don't really know. Like, we know you're an agent of religion. Yes, famously, I'm a big, uh, big time religious guy. Um, ironic because, like, agent is Muslim, isn't he? I, agent is, pretty sure agent is Muslim. Like, some of the AMP boys are. Anyway. Not Asian is Muslim. Agent. 
agent. Why am I discussing AMP with the whitest community on Twitch? I don't know, but. You're a clericalist and love big religion. Yeah, Agent Zero Zero. Agent made two videos about you too. Wait, Agent did? Two? Anyway. Uh, Anti-Semites are also out in full force at the tunnel store. I've seen IG comments filled with section people saying Kanye was right in top like comments being Nazi shit. Even saw some, even saw some in other Twitch chats. Yeah. Agent got in on the house of Nabi drama. What? Three years later was agent even around when I was getting, uh, destroyed for, uh, for purchasing a house or the crime of purchasing a house. Anyway, Blaze, uh, FaZe Clan is halal, brother. Apex will show him the way. Yeah, no, there's a lot of Muslims in FaZe, so I don't know why he's saying that, but then, uh, but whatever. Asian has been around longer than you. That's probably, you're right. The disgraceful teens who dug underneath a well-respected synagogue did so on their own after being explicitly told no. Enemy of the tunnel, real tunnel heads. Let's get this terrible woman away from our system of holes. Oh, my God. Gen Z was taught nothing is more important than their feelings, and now they're emboldened to act entitled and spoiled with zero regard or respect for others. We keep seeing this time and time again in all of our institutions. We must fix the, fix the broken education system. The future of our country depends on it. That's so funny. I'm glad that Shia Rachik found the real, the real villains. Yeah. Gen Z. That, that's who's responsible for the tunnels. First of all, they should be celebrated for their phenomenal tunnel-making skills. Okay? Yeah, she said, woke snowflake culture to the Hasidic tunnels. If there's one Gen Z group that is, you know, probably not similar to the rest of the Gen Z it is the most insulated Hasidic community uh, Zoomers, okay? Like, what are you talking about? Then it's an abject failure. Uh, the, the entire ultra-Orthodox project is a fucking failure if you're literally pointing to the ultra-Orthodox Zoomers and how they've been tarnished by woke culture, okay? Then why are they... Not a, like, why are they not participating in the regular public schooling system then? Okay. That's crazy. If anything, if you want the Hasidic Zoomers to stop, you know, making tunnels or whatever the fuck, then let them play video games and shit. Give them Grand Theft Auto 5. You bet your ass they're not, they're not doing no tunnels ever again. Uh, yeah, Chabotniks do not use TikTok. <laughs> she knows that. But she, well, that's not true. She's ultra, she's orthodox too, but she's Chabot, but uh, it's not as, it's not as like uh, aggro. Like her community is not as aggro and as insular as like the community in New York. So those guys are even more uh, orthodox than she is. A few of them do law. Like she, she's from a, she is literally from a less insulated uh, community. She's from Brooklyn though. No man. She's literally from my neck of the woods. 100%. She's in New York. Chabad. She was, she was a landlord here. No, she, 
No, she now lives in Los Angeles, I'm pretty sure. No, not New Jersey, man. No, Los Angeles. I live, I live, uh, like, I live around a bunch of uh, uh, different Orthodox communities. No, look it up, Asana. I promise you she's originally from the New York Hasid community. Yeah, but she's in L.A. now. She's like a she's like a Ben Shapiro type. There's lots of there's lots of Orthodox communities in in Southern California in Los Angeles specifically that are way more integrated. There are way more integrated into uh, the the rest of uh, the communities there than than like the New York Orthodox scene specifically. But even in the New York Orthodox scene, you saw like the uh, there's like Crown Heights, which is different, right? Lakewood is different. Anyway. Wait, sorry, I'm being confusing. I'm saying she's originally from the Brooklyn Orthodox community that isn't as insular. Um, all right, let's do the, I think it was a Matt Lieb joke, but like, you know, Jews in America building tunnels, uh, Palestinians in, in Gaza building tunnels. There, uh, he was like, we're truly, we're truly cousins. <laughs> He's right. Everybody loves tunnels, man. It's a, it's a united value. It's a principle that unites us all. Hassan is an anti-Semite. Are you talking about the Jewish tunnels, Orthodox Jewish doomsday bunkers? Hassan is an anti-Semite. <laughs> okay, man, sure. Putting the cartels to shame? Yep. All right, let's watch MAGA Mail. This video is true. It's crazy, but I've looked into it. It is all true. There's a streamer and a YouTuber who lied for years to his viewers and other creator friends about being black. Why? Well, that's what I'm here to find out in this video. But first, let's talk about how... Because DEI, brother, woke culture, affirmative action, blah, blah, blah. This even was found out in the first place, how this story dropped. And it all started a couple of days ago with this tweet. Zenby, the name of the creator, is not black. He just profited off of pretending to be and lied to people for years. Happy New Year. I don't understand. How do you profit off of being black? Like, what was... Dude, there's nothing more white than just, like, fake being black. It's crazy. It is peak... It's, it's peak whiteness. It's just, like, so... It, it is such a weird thing. I don't understand it. The Rachel Dolezal phenomena of just, like... I don't know. Also, how did he do it? Did you blackface? Like what? New Year. This was later substantiated by a huge creator, Boomer NA. He's a Minecraft Bed Wars YouTuber and streamer who blew up during the pandemic and streamed a lot with this creator, Zenby. He said Zenby lied about his race, lied to you all, myself included. He manipulated people into thinking he's someone uh, he was someone he's not. He fabricated his age and spread pictures of himself that weren't him. He's basically a compulsive liar. He not only lied about his age, by the way, he also lied about being Muslim. <laughs> Why? Again, we'll get there in a little moment. Now, how does he know for sure that he's not black? Okay, this is... I don't understand it. Like, pick a struggle, dog. What's happening? Like, what? Like, what? what is going on? Well, he was just like... How, how are these things... How are these things beneficial? Like... <laughs> what the fuck? Black... Well, he says it in his own. This is some real George Santos shit, dude. <laughs> what the fuck is he doing? Oh my god. Okay, okay, okay. Listen. 
Don't tell him to pick any more struggles. Okay, fair. Didn't video d game donkey do the same thing? I was so sad. Video game donkey did didn't say he was black. People just thought he was. I don't know why. It's like saying you're a leftist grifter for money. Yeah, exactly. But I am. That's why I serve you the top of the hour ad breaks at the top of every hour. Here's the three-minute ad break now. Yeah, I don't know why people assumed he was black. Words right here. Like, I, I FaceTimed him, and I, like, saw him, and he wasn't black. I talked to Boomer about this for a while, and, and the story is crazy. Uh, but let's first do a little bit of context here. If you don't know, Minecraft Bed Wars is a huge section of YouTube. It blew up during the pandemic. You probably know Techno, the, the biggest creator to come from that sector. And Zenby, before it all blew up, was just somebody who grinded out Bed Wars, along with Boomer and a lot of other names that you might know. Purple, whoever. And he was able to get into that niche with creators, who at that point were just gamers. Get in with him enough that he played with him. They thought he was black because he used... He used to flagrantly use the N-word. This is the actual reason. Oh, my God. What? On stream. And Boomer told me that they would play together when Boomer was at 100 concurrent viewers all the way to 10,000 throughout the pandemic. And, and that would be the main bread and butter. Going live together, playing Bed Wars. You know, it's, it's a good-ass game. AFK! Okay. okay yeah, I got it. 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 No yeah. shot. That wasn't me. Yeah. And I watch a lot of the VODs, just skimming through, and Zemi's a funny guy. I can see why other creators would want to collab with him, and viewers, if uh, they saw him on somebody else's stream, would gravitate towards him. And, and this led to a good amount of success. He was invited to compete in Twitch Rivals, a huge event with a bunch of other big creators. Uh, he even was featured in some huge Minecraft YouTube videos, like Purpled's Proximity Bed Wars video. Right. Yo, shit! Oh my god! I got jump scared! Yo, Zen! Yo, Zen! Yo! Videos with millions of views. You get the idea. Now, what did this bring him? A good amount of success. At his peak in late 2021, he was averaging around 500 viewers. For context, I went full-time with Twitch and YouTube, around 150 viewers. He also got, I think, about 30,000 YouTube subs in that time. So, yeah, again, very successful. Now, during all of this, he was presenting himself as a black dude. This was his profile picture and banner for Twitter. This was the skin he would use on Minecraft, and bear in mind, he wasn't black. So it brings us back to the question, why do this? And, and I actually just, I looked up every Minecraft YouTuber, and this is the thumbnail that came up, but, but yes, why? Why? And after talking to Boomer a bit, they had met when, when like, Boomer was, like, I don't know, like, a 19-year-old, like, 2020, and, and Zenby at this time said he was 17, except that was a lie. It was later revealed he was actually around, like, 15 years old so he was like a kid a teen and he instantly just started lying kind of like teens do sometimes i mean let's be real teenagers lie teenagers lie people lie all people lie but i lied a lot more when i was a teenager i had a little less you know empathy in the back of my head so we could write this off as somebody just lying to fit in with a group and be liked maybe it would be cooler if he was to be black and muslim maybe that would make him a little more different than other people uh and then he just had to keep digging the hole because everybody blew up they went from just people who liked playing bed wars to people who liked playing bed wars in front of ten thousand people at once i mean that's a big jump and where along that ride do you stop and say hey <laughs> how did he become muslim did he say the shahada because if he did then like that's valid that's valid you don't know maybe he prays five times a day dog you don't know that did he say the Shahada or not? I'm not black. You know, that's that's a hard thing to do. And so we could say this is just a cold cut case of a kid who lied and had to keep digging the hole to stay in the lie. But I think it's a little more nefarious. And I've pulled a couple of tweets of Zen throughout the years that kind of illustrate this. That was the first one. Happy Juneteenth, everyone. I personally have been celebrating Juneteenth every year for a minute now. But... <laughs> No. This is how you know the Minecraft community is so white. Okay. Actually, that's not even the case. I mean, this guy is like, why is this a bigger story? I mean, it's a weird story, but it's not like, 
this guy had like a massive following at all. But like, but this is like this dude would have gotten cl- dude. This dude would have gotten clowned on faster than half of those like Twitter impression farmers, um, who are all white kids that I literally thought were all black. Like, what was that? What was that tweet that it was like? There was a tweet that was like searching uh, for the N word in like a lot of the um, a lot of the Twitter impression farmers, and they always say motherfuckers instead, like MFs instead, as a substitute. God, I'm so I'm so caught up with all the young boy uh, the young boy Twitter lore. It's not even funny. And it's like all of those like daily loud type guys are like a lot of them are white. But anyway, yeah, Daily Loud is literally owned by two white men. Um, but uh, but this is like, I mean, this is like pretty obvious, you know, this tweet in and of itself is like, like, no, what the fuck? Family, and it truly brings us together. Don't forget that I care about y'all a shitload and stay safe on Juneteenth. A fucking lie. <laughs> Gets a little worse. <laughs> the Fiat Had- Kong never called me a motherfucker. <laughs> what the fuck? Yo, that was really good. I don't know if you came up with that off the top dome or if you just stole that from like the replies of Twitter or something. That was actually fire. <laughs> I know what the joke is. Why are you? Re- why are you? I love. I love Chatters being like it's a Muhammad Ali reference. Oh yeah, is it, dude? That was a good, that was a good joke. I hope it was not stolen and you came up with that on your own right now because that was fire. I had to hop on the awesome TWT selfie day and he posted a picture of somebody here and then put his Minecraft avatar on it. This is just a random black guy that he put his Minecraft head on. It's not him. It's a random person. And when pressed by friends, he would just send random pictures of a black guy, not even necessarily the same dude. And by the way, he would also, and this has been substantiated by Boomer, just say the N-word. <laughs> he would just he would just say it as if he was a black dude, using it in casual colloquial ways. But he wasn't. But he it was all a lie. So I think maybe, maybe it did. Maybe it did start as a lie. All right? And and, and maybe Sean, I respect that. Okay, dude. he did have some intentions to write that lie but i think he was riding the success the clout the coattail what clout like what success the minecraft community is so insanely white like i'm sorry this is like a very yo this is literally the whitest perspective to have on this matter straight up okay this is literally the whitest perspective to have the notion That being black in these profoundly white spaces is going to give you a leg up is literally just, it's only a thing that white people believe, okay? What do I mean by this? What is the leg up in this situation? Being able to freely say the N-word. If you were to give the opportunity to black people in America unconditionally, You can't say the N-word anymore, but literally you are going to have the same amenities as a white person. No one would say the N-word again, okay? That's not a benefit. Like, it's a benefit as a joke, right? Like, sure, whatever, it's the one thing, but, like, it's not a real thing. There is no genuine... I I guess, like, that is the most white thing, is to, to, to fetishize black people to that degree. 
Hassan, as a black person, I'm going to say you're straight up wrong on this front. You think that being a black content creator in a predominantly white field gives you like a, like a legitimate advantage? I, I don't think so. I don't think it does at all. I think any kind of marginalization is a disadvantage. Any kind of marginalization immediately gives you a disadvantage. Yeah, they think black people are cool. My white ex-boyfriend told me he wished he was black because black people are so cool. I mean, this is, yes, this part is true. Like, this is definitely a thing. But overall, that is something that you can only maintain if you aren't personally black, I feel like, because... Because you, you're, not, you're not black. So you haven't experienced, in my opinion, probably the negative consequences of, of being black in a white supremacist society in an overwhelmingly white space. Like a lot of people, I think, look at... A lot of people, I think, look at the, the likes of maybe even like Kai or AMP and their successes and think that that is not an anomaly, but is actually the, the real, like that's how it works. That's a, that's a track record for success. And that's just wrong. Like Kai and others have been able to overcome a lot more of the, the, uh, the, the negative sides of, of being black in predominantly white spaces. Does that make sense? I don't know. I don't think like... <sighs> and even with all that success, people are still going to be racist uh, as fuck to them. That's the other thing. Yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like since the Minecraft market is so crowded, maybe targeting a specific audience seems like something that content creator might go for, but at the same time, Skip was just 15 years old. Yeah, I think he was just a like, young... That's the other thing. Tales of, of, of the success of this persona that he portrayed online that people liked. And it was in a way attached to a, 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 a fabrication being black, being Muslim, whatever. I mean, uh, talking to Boomer, he would also lie about celebrating Ramadan. Just, just complain yeah, it's more so like voice this. calls about how he couldn't eat when he. Black Twitch streamer says he got a thousand more viewers when he changed the avatar to a cartoon white man. A Twitch streamer changed the avatar. Dak or just relaxed kid is black and theorized that pretending to be a white meant higher viewers. This is what white feels like to have privilege on Twitch. Like, I, I mean, this is a one off, obviously. This is a one off. But overall, I think that. Um, overall, I, I do think that like, it's not an accident that in the top content creators on this platform, the overwhelming majority of top content creators on this platform, the top 100 are white men for the most part, right? Like that didn't happen because like <laughs> white men are excellent at being Twitch streamers. It happened because that's what the audience is, and that's what the that's usually what people uh, see and and I guess push up to the top. Yeah, even applying it to you, no, exactly. A lot of my success, or at least early momentum, came from being a white person who was able to articulate BLM to a white audience. There were plenty of black people talking about it, but people feel more comfortable hearing from people who look and sound like them. That's just the facts. Yes, one hundred percent. I mean, we have black content creators in here. I mean, they could speak on it. I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to make Sean the CEO of Black people right now in the chat and put him on the spot. But I feel like that is, um, yeah. I mean, it's 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 definitely it's it's definitely, I think, harder. And I don't think that's a that's a um that's a controversial take to make. Sean is gone suspiciously after saying it's based that the, that the dude was saying the N word, he left. 
Um, but yeah. I did run the top of the hour. I break a six. Was eating. And then at other times he'd be caught in lies. He'd be like, oh yeah, I eat pork sometimes. Even though he was apparently Muslim. He'd just be like, oh, it wasn't a big deal. Because it, because it was all fake. It was all fabrications. Now, this eventually came out because some of his lies, maybe little less obvious ones, got caught. Like he said, he would go to Minecraft meetups. And, and then Boomer, who was like the closest confidant and creator friend of Zembi, got a little suspicious. So he asked the people at the meetups, hey, do you ever do you ever see the Zenby guy? No. That's weird. And then he would confront Zenby. And then he'd be like, oh, yeah, I lied about that. And then more lies came out. Until eventually, they uh, got a tip that he might be lying about something as big as his race. They confronted him on a call, got him to do a FaceTime, and yeah, it was revealed that is the case. Now, he actually stopped making content about a year ago. Perhaps because the guilt caught up to, uh, up to him. Or perhaps because he couldn't keep the lie going anymore. Uh, and he has pretty much been gone from the entire internet since then. His YouTube channel is deleted. His Twitter is deleted. The only thing that's left is his Twitch. But I doubt he will be going live anytime soon. Now, this video isn't to 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 send a witch hunt to find him. I, I don't want that to be the, the result of this. Okay? But, but I do want it to be uh, a little bit of a lesson. Like, people were talking about Ariana Grande and Kylie Jenner, and I think, like, a lot of you missed the point of why black people get so mad at that, like, black fishing. Because that's the entire point is when white people adopt the aesthetics of a black person, then it's all of a sudden magically considered cool when natural hair is considered something that you can't wear as school if you're, like, a regular old black kid, okay? That's the whole point, is that... White people are fascinated with black culture and even black people to a degree that is like, I would say, sometimes unhealthy and, and fetishizing. But when it comes down to it, it's it's not about like black people being viewed as people, but simply a commodity to be consumed. Black culture is, of course, basically carrying American culture. I could say this as a Turkish person growing up in Turkey, fascinated with American culture. I was fascinated with black culture, just like everybody else, right? All the best athletes in the NBA, like uh, the, the music, like the, everything, the movies, all of that is, 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 is black culture for the most part, right? So that's part of the reason why so many, I mean, I wore a fucking Nelly Band-Aid to school in Turkey under my eye, chat, in Turkey. Nobody fucking knew anything. Okay, nobody knew what the fuck Nelly was in Turkey, but I was like, I thought it was cool. Like, it's hot in here. You know what I mean? I wore Echo pants with the dragon coming from my butthole down to my goddamn ankles. Okay, Echo Unlimited. I did that. Did you feel cool, though? No, because everyone thought I was weird because that was like so far removed. I would take this to the grave. I don't care. I mean, I'll, I'll openly say it. But the point is, the point is that, um, yes, it is like, please don't say you wore a do-rag in a backwards jersey. No, I never wore a do-rag, but only because, like, I had no access to a do-rag, I guess. Because, like, if I had access to a do-rag, I probably would have worn it 100%. I wore a durag. Oh no, I wore a durag one time on stream because uh, one of you guys sent it to me. But that's different. Um, my point is, I was growing up in Turkey, right? And uh, that was the the forward facing, cool side of American culture. Even in a country where there isn't necessarily a large black population so that's it like black culture carries american culture and a lot of um a, a lot of people in america also love black culture it's the same principle behind like you know maga shitheads listening to rap music loving rap music 
but then be becoming like uh, reactionary, reactionary little uh, Republican Party voters later down uh, in their lives. That, you know, a, a lot of the creators online are, are sometimes creators at any cost. It is an enviable job. I understand that. A lot of people want to be a YouTuber. They want to be a streamer. But they will fake everything to get there personality, aspirations, what they believe in, just to associate, attach to viewers better or maybe other creators better, right? They might seem more holistic or charitable than they actually are. They might pretend to care about causes they don't actually fucking care about. You know the people who the moment midnight strikes on, on whatever holiday have a tweet drafted up ready to go? A lot of it's just PR to fucking get where they need to fucking get so they can have their own selfish needs filled in. All right. I'm no exception to this, by the way. I like when I come uh, across well-informed and smart and nice. I don't want to come across me. Wait, what did he say? I, I wasn't even listening. Why is he saying he's calling me I, out? I don't want that to be the, the result of this. Okay. But, but I do want it to be uh, a little bit of a lesson that, you know, a, a lot of the creators online are, are sometimes creators at any cost. It is an enviable job. I understand that. A lot of people want to be a YouTuber. They want to be a streamer. But they will fake everything to get there. Personality, aspirations, what they believe in. Oh, just yeah. Just to associate, right. attach to viewers better or maybe other creators better. Right? They might seem more holistic or charitable than they actually are. They might pretend to care about causes they don't actually fucking care about. Me. You know the people who the moment midnight strikes on, on whatever holiday have a tweet drafted up ready to go? A lot of it's just PR to fucking get where they need to fucking get. So they can have their own selfish. My Juneteenth tweets pop off every year. Needs filled in. All right. I'm no exception to this, by the way. I like when I come uh, across well-informed and smart and nice. I don't want to come across mean. That's obviously. I also am a fucking human, so I don't go as far to lie about being black. I also go on camera every day so that it wouldn't work. But you get the idea. So anyway, that's it. This is a true tweet, true story. I saw this. I looked into this. The guy lied about being black. I, I don't think we'll see him on the internet anymore because of that. But but there, there's some fucking crazies out there. Thanks for watching, everybody. Sorry, Boomer had to deal with that. And, and there you go. That's your that's your drama. That's your drama of the day. Holy shit, man. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Sean, Sean uh, the question I have for you was, as the CEO of black people, as a black content creator, would you say that uh, that that being black in predominantly white spaces is not necessarily a benefit or an advantage or a boost and maybe a burden that you must overcome and um, and that there's only white people that think that that is the case. Lobic saying he's not black. Yeah, I don't know why Lobic's saying that. It's crazy. People, you talking before or after the woke movement? What woke movement, guys? There are certain concepts in American history and the Western world in general that are far, far more important than the quote-unquote woke movement. Okay. Yeah, the CEO is oddly silent in this moment. Like, I think it's mostly people, I don't know. I think it's, it's like a, I think it's a phenomena that we all loved white people, uh, believe that it's like, you know, uh, portraying yourself as black, not for a brief moment. You are correct. I'm surprised you did it though, because the association to our culture is a boost for sure. Like it's not beneficial to be black, but it is to take culture. Yeah, no, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. That's like, like the Ariana Grande phenomenon of like, yes, if you do black culture stuff, like Miley Cyrus, in order to get away from the, in order to get away from the Disney channel accusations, she started twerking, right? Started doing all this stuff. And then once she was successfully removed from the Hannah Montana, uh, the, the Hannah Montana stuff, 
Then she dropped it. And she was like, what's up, guys? I'm white again. Like, I'm white again. You know what I mean? That's it. And people do that all the time. <sighs> you know? It's like, you can take advantage of black culture and, and, uh, and, and be associated with black culture and, and um, play a role with it. But ultimately, the next three minutes of this video explains I'm that. Sprung. Firstly, it's important to note that Little Pump is not black. It's not black. He's Colombian, even though his use of a certain racial term might convince you otherwise. Bro, you said the next three minutes explains it, and it's like just Lil Pump saying the N word. <laughs> but besides that, as I stated earlier, it all felt very over the top. Like it wasn't supposed to be taken seriously, like he was playing a character. Hey, hey bro. What is that, bro? Why are you smoking swishes? What is that? I, I only smoke backwood. Carlo backwood, bitch. Carlo backwood. Carlo backwood, boy. Oh, 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 fuck that. Oh, oh, fuck On a whole lot of swag uh, shit. Uh, a whole lot of gang shit. Y'all know about this, man. There's a whole lot of gang shit going on, bro. Y'all ain't on it, bro. On fuck now. On fuck now. <laughs> Let me see that. You're going 70 miles per hour. <laughs> How long would it take you to drive 70 miles? 70, nigga? Oh, why? Why 70? Explain to the camera why 70. Because one time 70, 70. Well, who the fuck said anything about one? Where did one come from? You're going 70 <laughs> miles per hour. <laughs> oh, one hour. And you can see that through the progression of his looks. The face tats, colored dreads, prominent chains, and grills that became a signature look used by other non-black rappers were seemingly popularized by Gazi. These characteristics were, of course, used by black rappers before non-black artists parodied them. So we have a non-black person playing a character embodying stereotypes of black people while profiting off of said stereotypes. Where have I heard that before? Lil Pump is not the only person who perpetuates this archetype. One of the most accomplished characters is Daniel Hernandez, or 6 9 Daniel has been rapping since 2012 but never found true mainstream success until he donned his signature rainbow hair, rainbow grills, and extensive set of tats. And immediately we can see similarities between Gazi and Daniel both non-black Hispanics becoming famous off of being a meme before collaborating with established artists and who also frequently tend to use the n-word. Now, points to 6 9 here because I do think he is more musically talented than Lil Pump is. However, he immediately loses those points for his other controversies that we all seem to kind of just forget about. But he's hanging out with Andrew Tate now, so he's within good company. But we see the pattern, right? There's not much difference between Gazi Garcia and Daniel Hernandez, but you can definitely see the archetype forming. But there's another duo of rappers of Hispanic descent who have followed 6 9 and Lil Pump, sporting their own set of face tats, grills, chains, and colored dreads. The next generation of its archetype is, of course... Wait, what? The Island Boy? Their initial launch. The Incest Boys? They copyright claimed your video? A story to Gazi and Daniel, Alex and Frankie first exploded to popularity as, say it with me now, a meme. What? Unlike their predecessors, however, possibly due to the decline of this style of rap, the Island Boys never found the same sort of mainstream success. Even now, a little after a year after their initial launch, they are unable to capture even a fraction of their original listeners to their new music. This is in stark contrast to even Lil Pump, who was able to garner over 60 times the amount of views in the same duration, even a half decade after his original launch. So they aren't as popular as Lil Pump or 6 9 but the fact that the character that they are playing, which follows the same sort of archetype, is able to reach the level of popularity that it did is the crux of my point. And that's not even all of them. Bad Baby, Woe Vicky, Lil Tay, Rice Gum even, they all follow the same archetype. They put on a costume. They put on a costume, a face of a black person, if you will. And they jump around, they dance around, they act a fool for a little bit of clout. And white folks lap it up. But the, the worst part is that black folks do too. Oh yeah. Black folks do too. The only reason why any of these people have any sort of musical legit. Yeah, I mean, the dude, this was crazy. You 
not the biggest, I'm bigger. You just a broke little nigga. And I'm young and I'm richer. <laughs> five bands on a fit. <laughs> five bands on a fit. Put your pillow looking like a tea bag, nigga. You can't say the word, I'ma say it for him. You're not the biggest, I'm bigger. You just a broke little nigga. And I'm young and I'm richer. <laughs> five bands on a fit. <laughs> five bands on a fit. Put your pillow. I hope he, I, I mean, I hope he got the, I hope he got the bag. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's crazy. Little Mabu gets a pass speaking as a white person. <laughs> My man's name is Pierogi was taken. <laughs> uh that kid's in college too low i think his dad is like a like a record label executive or something that's what it is right there's no way that he, i mean he was hanging out with like he was hanging out with Lil dirk and stuff right i mean it was yeah no that's like a So as a New Yorker, you have to forget, uh, you have to forgive Fivio Foreign. He got CTE. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, so that's, that's it. That's, that's what's going on. Um, that is, uh, that is a, a very common phenomenon. That um, it's not advantageous to be black. It's advantageous to be white while also, you know, ripping off a lot of uh, black aesthetics. Which is why I thought, like, why would this kid get uh, the advantage and the clout? Because, like, when he's faking being black with no face cam, I guess at that point he's just, like, in that, in that situation, you're just black at that point. So I guess, like, I don't really fully understand it. Specifically in 2021, the whole Minecraft community was pushing for more POC creators since every month there was a huge new one. He was good at the game, friends with the popular creator, and black, so the mostly white community made him popular relative to the niche, I guess. He was fit, but then again, he was also 15. I don't really put too much on that. Like, that's crazy. He was just 15 years old. Tech review channel. Sometimes you want to buy a new phone and you need to know the specs. But what if you want to buy a new prison? Places where like millions of people are locked up and deprived of their freedom. YouTube you look at Mr. Who's the Boss. Anything. You go on his channel. He's reviewed the most technologically advanced prison. He'll tell you the specs of this prison maybe. and whether you should buy it. This behind me is HMP Foss Way, and it's maybe the most technologically advanced prison in the world. Is this stuff on like triple speed? No, he's doing the Mr. Beast thing where you're uh, uh, yeah. talking to idiots, but he's not screaming enough. This is a real prison, and me and the boys are gonna try to survive the next 50 hours locked up here. I think one of the cruelest things about making a video about prisons is using so many drone shots. It's like so obvious that you're not free. <laughs> it's yeah. Just like, ha -ha, ooh. But also the fact that you can do a video about prisons, but then do it in the same way. It looks like the same as every other tech review thing. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. this is a completely normal technology. Nothing going wrong here. Whoa, YouTube. This is not paid for by prisons. I'm just very, very passionate about this product. So we're actually going to go through the full prisoner's journey, understand what the potential benefit of tech in a prison actually is. Bro even wore the, the orange hoodie to blend in. And then talk to a real prisoner to see the impact it's having on their life. I'm so excited for this prisoner to say, I love this. God, this was great. This transformed my life. The chip I mean, they implanted in my brain makes it feel like I'm back at home. I'm having a great time. That's what That's actually not bad, yeah. That's a good idea. It's like those cows that wore, wore the VR. Prisneyland videos about a progressive prison in Cali. Prisneyland. 
Also, they put cows in VR. What the fuck's going on? Our headsets yeah. thought they were grazing in the field. All Turn prisoners, the they get life sentences, beat you. You feel like you're grazing in a field? Yeah. yeah. Maybe that's already happened to us. Maybe we're in prison, in this exact prison, we're gonna see footage of ourselves. So we're gonna see I would like that. You're about to see a lot of stuff you've never seen before. And that's courtesy of Dave, who's helped to design this prison from the ground up and knows why basically every single decision has been made. What we're doing is we're controlling the area by having an airlock here. This is the first point of security when you're entering and the last what? point of Wait, what? What do you breathe when you go into prison? Is it like a different pressure? Is it underwater? Yeah. What's... Yeah, they give you just enough oxygen so you don't have enough to survive, but not <laughs> enough to escape. <laughs> you stay within these striped lines. They make sure that you are who you say you are, and only one of these two doors is ever open at the same time. Now, as you can probably start to see, when From you're dealing with a prison, you have to think about security on a whole other level. From He's there. doing like the soy face in his like animations as well. It's so embarrassing. I don't like it that we live in this universe where YouTubers are the ones that are giving access to high security security prisons, not people like Lou Theroux. Or no, 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 it's a tech reviewer. So he doesn't do this kind of stuff. He just, he just no. looks at like iPhones. No, like... that's why it's so weird. <laughs> He just looks at computers. It's that typical science tech bro where you're able to detach from real meaning. Yeah, there's the no problem. like social context. It's just like the iPhone can solve this problem for you and so can this prison. You have a look in here and you see how many cameras are actually observing you. So there's one, two, three, four, five. In this prison as a whole, there are not 50 cameras or 100 cameras, but 1,700. At Sick! <laughs> Dude, how is this not dystopian? Cameras. All right, so then we go through the third stage biometric verification, fourth stage metal detectors, fifth stage of full body search, and then this is the room where every key in the entire facility is stored. This room is so high security that you can't see anything. How do they do that? What? Make a blurry room. That'd be so hard to watch. How do you know which key you're getting out if you don't even they're see all, it? They're all gonna look like a black square like this. We have to blow everything out here because the key design cannot leak. And if it does, or even if a single key is so much as misplaced, then the entire prison would be considered compromised. It would have to be entirely relocked, and that would cost about two million pounds. He's not really selling this system. It sounds like very, very fragile and insane. Yeah. You lose a key and you can cost the prison two million pounds. You lose three keys, the prison shuts down. But also, what's the point here? big AI prison, but you're still using a manual key. That sounds like sense. the AI is just a big gimmick. To well, it sounds like the, yeah, the tech companies just like took you for a ride. You still need the keys though. But it's just... gonna be more expensive when you lose them than yeah. just like replacing all the locks. Come on through. What's the beeping? Telling me this door's open and I'm not allowed to open that door until I've locked this door. So, when you open this door, that alarm starts beeping. That alarm won't stop beeping till that door is locked because there's a sensor on the inside. You can't open that Bro, door. Bro, blur the locks, what? Like, why can't you show the the lock? This isn't new technology. They have the same system at Taronga Zoo. That's, I was exactly going to say Taronga Zoo. Yeah, to stop the pigeons from getting out. You'll start to notice one interesting thing with all of these security measures, that it's very much not what you see in the movies, like seven separate lines of bodyguards, but instead seven very varied security steps, some technological, some using physical keys. I pitch you my idea for mm. a perfect prison. You have a pit, the walls are sloped, 45 degrees. Every single day you have a man that comes around and just pours oil on the side. Hot? No, not hot. Oh, okay. Just, just oil. oil. So then you try to run out. That's you can't. Okay. You keep sliding back down. That's perfect. It'd be great. And then all the prisoners will kind of oil wrestle at the bottom. Oh, like Turkish, Turkish guys. And they're all Turkish. Yeah. In there as well. Perfect prison. That sounds, it's cheaper than these. They might get sunburned. Is the only issue. What the it's fuck? sunscreen. Oh, on the sides. On the sides. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what it is. Slippery sunscreen. It's perfect. So once we get into the prison, it's more the general use area, the 3.6 meter fences. Presumably, no one's going to be able to jump something even half that height to a certain height on the fence as well. You've got this sheeting. And also, these are not designed with fingers getting through. No, they're right. anti-climb fences. Anti-climb fences. I Philosophy. love the, the the writing they put up. It's also funny because this guy's like quite English. So like some of the phrases he uses are so like proper. It looks yeah. so weird doing in the Americanized like, this is uh, quite a jolly good prison. Like, <laughs> and also on all the bolts, we have to reduce them to a certain distance so they can't be used as ladders to get up as well. That's the type of thing we have to look up. It's like the editor knew he, that Mr. Beast hot does stuff like that and yeah. words pop up. So he's like, oh, any words. I have to do it. So this is a 5.2 meter anti-climb fence. Yeah, try it, bro. <sighs> I'm not in the best shape I've been. That would be such so a fun video to... attempting to... to break out of prison. Break out of prison, yeah. Well, what the fun video would be would be attempting to get into prison. You do a crime 
time for your video. And then you get out as and then part you get of the same video. Yeah, part two. And then it's the double jeopardy. You can't go to prison you, twice you can't for the same YouTube video. Exactly. So, we're going to start at the brand new visitor centre. We'll get to test what happens if you take drugs into the prison. Experience being locked in an actual prison cell where the inmates live. Try out the high-tech workshops. Explore the what? secret beating heart of the jail. Control centre. Oh, and then... yeah, we thought the same thing there. The secret beating heart. Oh, this is a lot nicer than I was expecting it to be. If you have a look up at the cameras that are in this place. Are you locking up children? This is a toddler's <laughs> high-tech prison. Not that high-tech so far. What have you yeah. showed me? You showed me cameras. Cameras. We got a camera there. I mean, the airlock was kind of cool, but why? It's What's the pressure difference? No, like, no, no, no. They just mean the airlock is in like, this is sealed and this is sealed at the same time, so there's no airflow. So they're it's not, not they're... like it's not like if I close the door to the bathroom. That's, yeah. I'm not, I'm in an airlock. Yeah, you're in an airlock. Yeah. It's not like a spaceship airlock where you like lock, lock, all the air gets sucked yeah, down. Yeah, okay. The prisoners don't go <laughs> and expand. So what he's saying is it's a room. No, he's saying there's two doors. So you've got a HP computer here, and I'm assuming it's highly regulated what people can actually access on this. Absolutely. Well, it's well lit and it feels very soundproof. So at least you can have the reassurance that the conversation you're having is private. What do you in... mean it's private? Assuming that you're in a prison, you can say whatever you want to the person you're talking to. Man, like he's trying to chuck in points, but like, it's actually very ethical. It's good prison. for the prisoner's privacy. That's business. why there's 2,000 cameras yeah. all the time. <laughs> if, for example, you were clear to have a visit with two people, so your mother and father, if then a child walked in the background, it would shut down. Wow. And it's using what? AI to make sure that only the people who are meant to be on the call are on the call. Yeah. What? That's so dumb. What's the child got to do with it? You saying a third person walked in and oh, said yeah. they only to two people. You got to tell the prison guards every single person who's going to appear on a video call. And then you're like, sorry, you've, you've wasted your chance to talk to the outside world this month. Sick, man. That seems great. I really, I really like how revolutionary and new this is. Your sister. If you know anything about prisoners' rights, um, the phone service that they use, the phone services that they use in at least American prisons is so bad. It is actually a crime in and of itself, in my opinion. <laughs> I feel like this literally is a, yeah, someone in the chat said, new torture techniques. It's like, oh yeah, did you forget to disclose that your newborn child is going to be in there in the call? Oops, boop, AI shut it off. I had a baby and you didn't tell us. Bye-bye. <laughs> Technology is absolutely brilliant, but also some things you can't replace. It's a great thing to say on a technology channel. Uh, and I'm going to show you that with the dogs. Yes, he said dogs. And we're about to see why. I you... love that his face is always exact. He's a completely expressionless man. But whenever they zoom in and try to be like, oh, I'm scared now, or like, oh, I'm, I'm sarcastic now, it's just him going, <laughs> yes, he said dogs. Okay, now the active drug dog. So what is it looking for? <laughs> oh, illegal. <laughs> That's not what I was expecting. <laughs> Bro, that's the drug dog. <laughs> Bro, that's cute as hell, dude. Dude, dude, dude. Goofy ass fucking dog. Look at yes, this. Yes, he said dogs. Okay, now the active. Dog. <laughs> that's so funny. What? What? <laughs> Bro, that's like. Are you? I feel like there should be rules on who gets to be drug sniffing dogs. You know what I mean? <laughs> little guy, little guy with his tail wagging. Dog. So what is it looking for? <laughs> what oh, he's illegal substances that prison are not allowed. Oh, we found something. Good lad, Beth. Beth. Good boy. So hypothetically, that dog could be trained to find my iPhone. Yes. And then the fourth and final. This dog, no one's allowed to interact with them. You're not allowed to get within eight foot of them. No one asked for anyone. Because this is the most dangerous dog. This is the most force that what? can be inflicted. Right. So just to be clear, this dog can inflict the most force that can be inflicted, and I should be eight feet away. What kind of what kind of statements are you already? Bro, bro, that's not a dog, bro. They're talking about the dog like it's Godzilla or something. They're like, dude. You don't want to be here. When we unleash this force, it's going to destroy you. Yeah, but what is the most force that can be inflicted, actually? No, you're I mean, an engineer. Surely there's something out there stronger than this dog. You know, I think he's saying compared to that other tiny mouse-sized dog that we saw. That's not what he said. He said the most force that can yeah, be Yeah, out of the four categories of dogs. Oh, okay. I thought it was just, ever. this is the strongest thing in the universe. Is there any... No, he's saying that it's the strongest force they can legally apply... I think to prisoners. That's what it me that's what they're saying. Like so it's it's just like one step below just shooting them with a gun with lethal bullets, right? Isn't that what he's saying? Any tech involved in this? 
this process or is it very much like manual human no it's the strongest dog okay it's the strongest dog ever okay got it no that's it's the it's the equivalent of a nuke this dog okay this dog literally will stand top of the hour ad breaks like it's nothing doesn't even care just tanks it you don't even know the Beretta 50 cal of dogs. Here's the three-minute ad break now. You can't withstand the top of the hour break unless you subscribe, chat. For $5 or for free with a Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account where you get one free Prime subscription a month. Beretta 50 cal. Okay, shut up, nerd. Okay, here's the three-minute ad break now. And, and dog. Yeah. Very much human. Yeah, what are you classic. saying? Yes, very human. Well, it's not. It's not tech. What so you are what, a person. What, what are you? What kind of phony? I you? think you are very human because you're not iPhone 10. It's quite hard to think straight when there's an attack dog directly locking eyes with you. Are they quick trainers? <laughs> <laughs> How quickly can you get over that? Dude, the mind of a prison warden is so permanently warped. By the way, he's just like, ah, oh, yeah. Let me. Uh, Oh, your train is quick <laughs> because I will release this attack dog that we that we just explained is the most forceful, awful thing that you can experience. We will release this thing at you <laughs> for a meme, for a goof, you know. Fence, Aaron. <laughs> there should be a rule that YouTube isn't allowed to go anywhere. We shouldn't be allowed to visit anything or say anything in public with anyone because YouTube has always built up this big audience, get 10 million people watching them, think they're the best. They go go into the real world and deal with something with a real job. Yeah. And they just look terrified. Everywhere. Terrified of every situation. Yeah. It's funny because like this guy's making a joke about killing him. It's like great. Everyone loves it. And this guy's just standing <laughs> yeah. like, I hope the editor can fix this. This man should not be allowed anywhere. Oh, well, he should be <laughs> Like, that's the solution. So your plan is usually to take the dog out, let it bark a few times, dissolve the situation. We don't go out with the intention of setting a dog on someone. Absolutely yep. not. But there's one more part to this whole incident response. It's if something breaks out, that's something. Do they keep humans in there or what's what's in there? Monsters. Something. Monsters. <laughs> what did he just admit to us? Oh my God. That's why it's so high tech because there's just things in there. Love it, the the Nephilim, bro. The Nephilim. That's... We found out. No, SCP facility? Yeah, no, it's the, it's the ice giants. They're keeping them in there. But whatever's in there is just... Who knows just what the fuck that is. Yeah. There's also a drone. The drone is going to be thrown up into the air, scope the area from above to make sure the situation is what we think it is. So you're using a DJI. Yes. DJI Mavic. Mavic 3T. And what's the reason you've gone for this one? What is different about the Enterprise Edition? We've got thermal cameras on this for obviously the night incidents. With this system now, because DJI is very pliable with the system we use. Is this a sponsorship? Is this, like the prison uses it, but why is he, why are we getting the rundown of this machine? Yeah. It's I mean, so... I don't think it is. Bro, I think it, it feels like this guy is helping plot out a prison escape, like unintentionally. Like, I'm not even kidding. This, this low key, this low key, this YouTuber is actually super based. Okay, he has a homie in there. He has a homie in there that he's trying to get out. So he's just basically, you know, exploring the uh, the security theater and exposing the flaws. <laughs> It's he's a tech bro, and this is all he knows is accidentally doing sponsorships for everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, but he, they probably don't even pay him anything. <laughs> he's probably just obsessed with stupid products. We can use this collaboration with our dog teams for searching for a prisoner if they've escaped. So we'd be the air support looking ahead of the staff, and then we could guide them in and locate them into anything we find. In a way, it's actually kind of reassuring for the consumer that even in an industry where it's so, so important to have the absolute best, that they're still using consumer oh grade here, in a God. sense. The <laughs> That's the best takeaway. That's a I'm so glad that I have a military grade fucking drone oh. here. You know, I mean, like, I'm just a consumer, but if I wanted to run like a maximum security prison and like maybe imprison a bunch of my friends or children of yeah. other people's kids or anything it's good to know that i have the option everybody's reception of a prison is bars isn't it and you can see the barless windows and when you say barless windows you mean i guess glass. no metal bars yeah it's glass we build to technical standards and the technical standard for this is they have to be attack resistance for 90 minutes we did testing on these and we used the national resources to do it it's like one of your tests is that really how you test stuff just have a random guy like uh, come on surely that's not like a standard how do they do it they just get a guy just a guy I can like jim that. break into this that so what happens if it's 91 minutes dude 
it's like I guess it's it's built off of like response time. But like, bro, catch him on the ninety first minute and it's Jover. Okay, they broke it. That's that's the national standard. Well, I think that's a if great it's, standard. If it's safe against Jim. The ballless window is not about preventing the air coming in. It's about not preventing that view, which then refocuses the brain, really. So where we have put bars and where we believe there's a need for bars, we've put the bars horizontally, and that's because they look like blinds rather than bars. That's a specific decision you I made. I love that for every them. single, like, nice thing they're doing is just tricks. There's nothing good about this. It's well, I mean, the reason why you don't normally, you're not supposed to put horizontal bars is because you can climb on them. I don't know if they thought about that. Like, I mean, look, say what you want about prisons, like whether they're obsolete or not is one thing. But having said that, you know, there is a reason why they, they built this exact science a while ago, right? Like when, <laughs> because... Horizontal bars turn into ladders. Okay? They turn into ladders for uh, killing yourself on or climbing on top of. Just saying. <laughs> anyway. It's just like, we're still doing exactly the same thing. It's just kind of, the feng shui is better yeah. in this prison than the it's, other one. It's horizontal sadness, not vertical sadness. Yeah. Is there a reason this is held open right now? Yeah, because you're not allowed to see the workings of the lock. A door is either locked or it's in what we call a lockback. Why we're not using biometrics for this? You'd have to look at the expense of them. What happens if they fail? I mean, that's just something against the whole prison. Yeah, why? Because, is... like, the actual safest thing is not to use any of this crap. Of course. What if there's a power outage and the generator fails? <laughs> this is, like, the whole video is a joke. And he's just promoting a prison for no reason. <laughs> and then just before the cells, there is a recreational area. Are they free to use this at all times? No. So what is the purpose of that room? Just a teasing room? They get to walk in between it. Maybe one day I'll play table tennis. Let's go see a cell. I wasn't really sure what to expect here. There's a phone here. Who can they call with this? So it could be family members, any individual they can put in. We risk assess them and we vet who they're allowed to call. One of the big questions this prisoner is trying to answer is, how do you keep someone away from from normal society for many years but not let them forget how that society works and okay first of all god my brain is so broken then uh, my brain is so broken with what i know about american prisons that like when i see that immediately i'm like god damn dude like immediately when you go to a relatively reactionary european country Okay, even then they got like pretty basic amenities that allow you to remain human. American prisons, on the other hand, completely remove you of your humanity, like completely. The entire point is like you are no longer a, a human being. You're a number. You're you're something less than an animal. Right. You are subjected to like ritualistic torture and humiliation that even, uh, like, you know, white people would hate if you did that to animals, basically. And so a common theme here is there are plenty of opportunities to learn, to grow, to improve, to keep in touch with your family. So he didn't show us any of this. He showed no. us a single phone. He showed us a ping pong table as well. That they're not allowed to use. Yeah. So a lot of the equipment is obviously very inexpensive, very simple keyboard and mouse. But I guess the idea is function without waste. I love the tech guy. Uh, the tech guy reviewing the... the <laughs> The fucking keyboard and mouse is like, well, you know, this is not very good. <laughs> Come point, it says. <laughs> cash. You've got the glass, which is the strength of glass, and you've got a polycarbonate. You've got the glass, which is the strength of glass. <laughs> we had to a lock, and that's the way they get the 90-minute attack resistance. Okay, so I am in the cell alone. This is what it would be like. If he does a Mr. Beast crying thing. I spent 20 minutes in a cell and I miss my mom. Just thinking about it has me like tearing up. I just hope he starts masturbating immediately. That's the cells. Now for the workshops where the prisoners would go to skill up. And the idea is the prison has contacted a whole load of partner companies who work in the local area so that they can actually have employment ready for them when they get out the prison. We're about sounds to see great, but it's probably just free labor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah, nice to have great. a job after. Yeah. If you have to go through all this, it's nice to be able to live a normal life after. This is sick. You get to learn how to use a digger. This is basically a full recreation of the inside of a cat oh. digger. So 
It's made by the actual company. You've got a seat, you've got all the controls, you've got a Meta Quest headset, and then three 40-inch or so screens. Imagine that's yeah. your skill, is looking at a screen and being like, yeah, 36 inch screen right there. <laughs> Give me another one. That's all okay, you want. Okay, this is to like the one good part of the prison chat. Come on. Actually, this isn't even the one good part of the prison. This is like low key not that bad of a prison. Obviously, it's not, it's no Norwegian prison paradise, but that absolutely is a good thing. Like learning, learning valuable skills that you can, like, that, that offer you job training. For when you are free is is literally a a really important part of it's a really important part of of lowering recidivism rates well he's saying the size of a screen but also like what's the point of the headset if you have screens what's the point of screens if you have a headset <laughs> like i don't really understand this is maybe, tech guys maybe, are obsessed with the product no i think it's maybe some of the prisoners are old and if you put a vr headset on they're gonna be like or they're gonna also, that's like still very different than um, abusing them and and uh, making them engage in slavery. Like in American prisons, they just make them do route tasks, like uh, menial labor, and and build like s desks for schools and and license plates and stuff like that. That's like very different than. Very different than like actually learning a skill. They are abusing them, dog. Please, no. That is that literally is is a good thing. Job training. And they're like, I don't want to make it. This is waking up from the matrix. I've actually been a construction worker this whole time. <laughs> yeah, this one's real. Yeah, it feels like the real deal. There's even like resistance on these joysticks. So this is basically like they've taken the entire internals and electronics of a real cat digger, gutted them, and stuck them in this room in, with a screen in front. I there love we go. this man. It's just amazing putting him in this fucked up place and have him like inspect all like the dumbest bits. So it's like going to Auschwitz and being like, the grating they used on like <laughs> on the sewer system is fantastic. The architecture here, real postmodernism. Yeah. And very Why efficient. did you choose this part of Poland? Is it because of the foliage in uh, in autumn? <laughs> it's, it's such a funny thing to do, just like hyper focused on pretty much the most boring part of a prison, like. How, where do you put your keys? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it really feels like I'm in. Like the seat's vibrating, I'm feeling the engine. This guy's having a great time with the vibrations this. in the seat. That's phenomenal. It's got all the physics that you would experience in a real uh, machine. You tell that to a priest. Yes, bro, that is literally the whole point. That's the it's a training module. You are learning how to use a cat digger. I understand your analysis, but what is this? Why'd you send me this link? I don't know why you're sending me this. This is the longest. No, there's never been outside. Stop bragging, bro. <laughs> we're done. We're done with the reading portion of the broadcast. This is what physics are like outside the prison? <laughs> in the real world. In the real Not world. this prison physics you got. Yeah, everything's flying around. <laughs> well, once you get past that prison airlock, and the physics just go. Oh. So yeah, this is not a toy. This is an actually licensed simulator. Oh, he's he's justifying why he likes it so much. No, it's not a toy. It's actually a big boy thing. Mm -hmm. I like it, but I like it because it's important. Okay, time to head to the very heart of the operation. How is it that we have an electronic lock when we're already inside a six-step wait, 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 wait. He wait, wait, wait. told us he was going to interview a prisoner. Do you think that's going to happen in the next two minutes? I think it's going to be a quick us? interview. <laughs> what is he going to ask? What's your name, Paul? What's your and favorite? There we go. What's your favorite iPhone? I think he's doing it because he's treating this like a tech review. Yeah, and he's yeah. kind of reviewing like, oh, in the first generation we had this yeah. and this and this, and like no mention of what? human beings, human beings, or why people are in prison, that's or just, whether this is guys. good. There's no way he's going to do it. This is no time left. He's I reckon really it's going to be this man dressed up. Just dressed up in a great dress. <laughs> and I really love the warden. And now that's done, let's find out how all this stuff has played into the experiences of someone actually serving their sentence here. He's our prisoner. Oh, we got him. The Bro, what? He's got drip, dude. 
Big Boy's wearing, uh, what's that brand? Wait, what's Stone Island? What the Last hell? Last minute. Where are you roughly in your sentence? Well, I've got four years left and I've done the uh, best part of two years. And how are you feeling about this place as a whole? It's not what I imagined. It's, a, it's far better than what I imagined. I've done English in education. The education department was great. And when you say you've done English, so is someone here like teaching it? Yeah, someone's teaching English, yes. And that's an actual qualification that you can yeah. take. What language did you speak before? I don't want to know. Some fucking murderous language. My man's badged up what a hoodlum. He's got a stone island, yeah? What's this crime? What you fucking do? It's a crime against fashion. What about contact with the outside world? Do you feel like you're able to keep in touch? Yeah. Ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got email a prisoner. Family, friends can email How me. How could you email a hostage and think they're giving you information that is in any way genuine? Yeah, it's so funny. The prisoner's been like, fucking go talk to this Mr. Who's the Boss and tell him the prison's <laughs> <Yeah>. great. <laughs> right to be a prisoner, be like, finally my chance to talk shit about the prison. Can't. They're gonna use that, the dog that has the most force in the universe. <laughs> they're gonna send it right on you. One of the things I imagine would be quite difficult is being completely without a phone, without the internet. If you think of something, you can't go, oh, I'll just Google it. Yeah. It's completely taken away from your son. So that that is hard. The hard part about being in prison is not being able to Yeah. The, he's like, yeah, me and my mates, we get into trouble sometimes. We're fighting. I'm like, Liverpool won the championship in 09. And then we don't have Google. So we fight it out. <laughs> I love to Google. Your accent is shit. Shut up. The Google. <laughs> he's such a beautiful man. He should. Why is he locked up? He sounds like a fucking history teacher. He's a history teacher. He's hot. He misses Google. <laughs> <laughs> so I should be so mean. It's awful. He misses Google. <laughs> it is so nice. It's the best. I think 09 was Chelsea, lad. See, I don't have Google. What's the largest cat in the world? Siberian tiger. Oh, yeah. You don't need Google. No, but I don't know if that's true. Oh, right, that's right, what right. I'm saying. So it's been years since you've actually been able to Google something. It's been almost two years, yeah. <laughs> <You're all about laughs> <that. laughs> They're still talking about Google. What is happening? He literally is just like, I don't even miss anything. I just miss Googling shit, dude. I don't even miss my family. <laughs> just no Google. It's been almost two years since I Googled. <laughs> Fuck it, this man. I think oh, it's... I missed that fucking sweet noise. What is the biggest cat in the world? Well, I need to Two know. years. Hey, Paul. What? That is annoying. No, I think it's also just funny because he realizes he's obviously talking to a tech review guy, so he's trying to speak his language. I haven't Googled in a while. I've seen a lot of things here that I didn't expect to, and I've learned a lot more than I expected to. So I hope you felt the same, and uh, catch you in the next one. What is the point of that man? It's you could have just placed a stationary camera in there and I would have learned exactly the same amount. Probably a lot more. Probably more. Well, so why didn't he ask, what you, what'd you do, Bob? Yeah. Would you, who'd you kill? And what language were you speaking? <laughs> yeah. You know, if I was a prisoner mm -hmm. and I had access to the internet, what I would be watching? What? Can you guess? Porn. Boy Boy. Boy I'm Boy. Yes. Out. Not I Did a Thing. Not Mr. Who's the Boss. Specifically Boy Boy. 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 Yeah. On Patreon. For $5 a month, you get another video. And that's really cheap. $5 for a video. That, that's like 10 hours sewing wallets on an assembly line in a prison. <laughs> that's worth it. That is worth it. The video's like half an hour long. And it's, I think it's better than the education systems they have in prison as well. You learn so much from us. <laughs> Just $5 a month. Come on, let's go. Seven percent equity stake in exchange for six hundred thousand dollars. That means that company's like eight million dollars. That was nice. That was wonderful. Mr. Boys, dude. Mr. Boys. Azan throw an accent out. Don't be upstage. No, I, I already. I'm already out. I'm already out of all accents. Uh, China when? Oh, dude, I want to go. I also want to go to Australia, Australia too. They lower the restrictions for China travel visa. Okay.
That's a great video. YouTubers will promote everything by friend of the show, boy, boy. Come to Melbourne. Did you watch the new unusual memes already? No, I did not. I gotta pee, I'll be back. The thought was amazing, but look at that tray. It will not get through the door. I left this here for like a day or two, and it's stuck. I can't move. <risos> Sofre pra cortar um queijo coalho E o outro aqui derrubando a porra da minha cerveja You know what they must Kai had to pee and poop. Two minutes and 36 seconds. That's actually pretty fast. God damn. I peed, she peed, and poop. That's actually wild. I think I got it. No. Grandma going to see, but he always I got some steak chalupas. You want one? Jim! Jim! Hey, you want a you want steak chalupa? Ah! 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 
Okay, this one is real heavy on d people running into walls and shit. <laughs> we want more cat. We want more cats doing dumb shit and getting hit and stuff. Yeah, there we go. Ah, that's what I'm talking about. Yep. Четыре, пять нахуй, пять смесителей, пять лампочек, пять бойлеров. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> My boyfriend by cleaning his car while he's at work. Wait, what? Look no. how dirty it was. So what's the ruling? What did he say? What did he say? He told me I had a small dong. <laughs> God damn! My name is Lisa, and this is my first drink of wine this evening. My name is Lisa, and it's my last drink. God damn. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yo, that's weird. Gross, dude. Oh, what the hell? No, no, no. Average, average cat person, kitten cat Aubrey, kind of hot, not going to lie. That's Amor, isn't that Amaran's mod? Wait, really? But there is no but after that. You have a problem with that? What? The, the breakfast sandwich? No. What's with you and Voilent will towards kittens today? What's with you and Voilent will towards kittens today? What is this? Come take my hand, this world we'll take together through the storm. I'm not afraid. 
to take a stand. Everybody, come take my hand. This world together, all through the storm. Everybody, come take my hand. This world will rock together. <laughs> Someone is just say bards be like, yeah. Together. He's casting a spell with his. He just doesn't have his loot. Detroit to town, a little bit of Radiohead. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Dirty cop right there. Go ahead, pull your gun and put a bullet through my head. I don't think he deserves to be executed for being that bad at singing. You know what I mean? I'm not afraid. <laughs> I love that. I love that he just uh, he's like still he's quietly he's like I'm not afraid. Call King County DEA, the head chief. He's the one that's gonna track all those sexual girls that were trafficked right there on that plane that are going to club. You want me to name the club? Deja vu. Everybody, there's girls from that plane going to club Deja vu to dance. That are being trafficked from around the world. Hashtag taken. <laughs> he said hashtag taken. Bro, you can't possibly you can't pop off with a hashtag in public like that, man. Dude, I feel like I, I feel like every person that's struck with like a little bit of mental illness. You know, anybody that's having an episode insta hits the there's being there's sex trafficking happening all around us. Like immediately. I'm not afraid to take a stand. Everybody just fucking dabbed him up appreciate his range on you listen to music you definitely don't want to make eye contact with this guy it's, it's like what cutie said about mormon singing that jesus song when they get scared yeah his jesus song is i'm not afraid This is what happens when you give boomers a crumb of cloud. I think it's not a crumb of cloud, but rather a lag of lithium. What? Thoughts on this? I am not gay. I have relationships with women. Sex with men. And I got news for you. I mean, you gay. <laughs> what the fuck? Yo, that was so stupid. This is such a good episode. You know the episode? Inside a North Korean commuter train? Wait, what? They play jams? Wait. Are, are people pushing this? Does he have more Korea stuff? Wait, why can't I play this? 
What the hell? Give me the career shit. Wait, what happened? I, I want to know. Wait, does he have more? Is this supposed to be a negative? No, it's not. I don't think he's... What, why? I know everyone is like immediately conditioned to thinking anything and everything that, about places where I've pooped my pants. This is like what a chatter would put, put forward. What is this music? <laughs> this is some like Sam Fisher. We need you to retrieve the Declaration of Independence ass music, dude. Splinter Cell. Okay, listen. Oh, here, let's watch this. Things I learned in North Korea. Okay, I want to know more about the North Korea shit. Wait, did they take... Wait, what? The sound is off. That sucks. This is communism in its purest form. In North Korea, citizens do not pay any rent. The government pays for the full cost of their homes... But in return, there's no freedom to choose that home. A home is assigned to you based on your profession and how important that profession is to the state. With the most important professions being considered, scientists, teachers, and politicians, North Koreans also do not have freedom to choose their own careers. The government runs schools, make the decision... Make the decision of what career you will have based on your school performance... The students get to write down their top five preferred careers, which the government will then take into consideration, but ultimately has the final say if you will be a construction worker or a scientist. Okay. Look up, I love all the people asking how in the comments. Like, they can't just book a trip there themselves. Man, it's not that easy to go to North Korea. Come on, dog. Like, as an American citizen, I think a lot of people forget how easy it is for you to travel all around the world. But it's not necessarily that easy for many people with different passports to travel all around the world. What is this? This page has super informative stuff. Wait, what? I thought you were about to defend North Korea for a second there. Also, it's still hard. You have to go to, I think you have to go through China. There's no, first of all, you, there's no direct flights to North Korea chatters. Like, you think you could just, like, fucking hop on a plane to Pyongyang from LAX, dude? Also, as far as defending North Korea, I mean, there are defensible parts <clears throat> about the misinformation surrounding North Korea. I do think that it's um, it's banned right now for Americans. Um, Like, uh, uh, what do you call it? Like, uh, there's a lot of misinformation about North Korea. Like, people act like it's a desolate shithole where people are eating rats and poop and stuff. That part is not true. Like, especially Pyongyang, but North Korea, as far as I understand it, has developed tremendously since, like, the worst aspects of the famine in the 90s. So, overall, it's like, they're doing the most. You know? But there's, there's no pushing trains and stuff. They're doing the most with, like, very limited resources that they have. <laughs> I'm one of the first people to like 
straight up rip into Yami Park out here before it became like a massive meta to just like kind of dunk on her. Before it became like way more permissible to dunk on her, basically. I used to make fun of Yami Park, worried that people would like hear me and be like, how dare you? This this woman is like a victim of North Korea. And also you're and she's telling God's honest truth. Yeah, I've been I've been calling her a I've been calling her a grifter for a minute now. Luckily now more people are on board with uh, her grifting ways. But <laughs> isn't she a victim of back pain? Yeah. They used to have rats pull the trains because Kim Jong Un drank all the oil, but then we wanted to eat the rats and now we push the train. I'm North Korean by the way. Yeah. People will not want to admit it, but this is K pop. You think this guy has a nice apartment, like a nice government issued apartment because like he can sing good? <laughs> the thing is like, uh, yeah, a lot of people, uh, yeah, no, I, I think there's a lot of misinformation about North Korea straight up. I'll stand on that. I'll say that openly, loudly, proudly. I don't think that's a controversial thing to say. I mean, depending on which community you're saying it in. I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't want to live there. And I think we should um, no longer do an embargo. If China is any indication, they are sons and daughters of high-ranking party officials. <laughs> Hey, can you explain why Yami Park is wrong? I'm out of the loop. I don't know. Chatter, exercise like a little bit of critical thinking. I know you got it in you. You think they're eating rats and then like they're pooping out the rats and then using the manure, like using the poop for manure. And if you hide your poop from the government, the government will come and like punish eight generations of your family. Or do you think that that's uh, ridiculous? Like, Yami Park is, is just basically hardcore lying. Just send him to your 5 million hour Yami Park react video. Don't engage, bro. Yeah, I mean, there's videos that I've done. Insane to have to say it out loud. Yeah, no, people are pulling and pushing trains in North Korea. <sighs> Here, there you go. What's Yami's insane North Korean defector exposed eight months ago with 600,000 views, baby. Go watch it. How come you say Kim Jong-un, but not Park Yeon Mi? Good question. I uh, respect the dear leader, supreme leader. I think it's pretty wild that as long as you don't have like a lot of access to a foreign country and the media is very dedicated to just being like they're cannibals over there, people will believe it. Someone in the chat just said that about the um someone in the chat just said that about the Taliban and I yeah, I feel like if there was enough energy it, like right now Afghanistan is pretty inaccessible, right? I feel like if, if the media wanted to somehow, like, make 
you know, some anti-Taliban uh, media out there, like they wanted to cut something about the dangers of the Taliban, they could just very easily convince a big chunk of the Western world that the Taliban are engaging in the practice of cannibalism. And I think you would have a lot of people believe in it. This happens with Gaza and Israel too, sure. Um we we already do it. We do it with Cuba and you can kind of you can go to Cuba. It's like much easier to go to Cuba than it is to go to North Korea from where we're at. It's just like It's pretty much, I mean, people would just like eat up whatever Asking you say. Asking my North Korean guide how they feel about America. So based off of that, what would you say is the common perception of, let's say, the United States in North Korea, in uh, DPRK, I'm sorry. What perception? Yes. Up to now, we have no history of invasion. Mm -hmm. Korea, DPRK. Korea has no history of invasion. So many countries, they've invaded so many countries but we have no history of invasion. Mm -hmm. And we didn't do any harmful things to America. Even we didn't stone America up to now mm -hmm. at America. But America, they invaded our country. Still, they're in the southern part of our country. And still, they're pursuing a kind of hostile policies against our country, even sanctions against our country. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. So, what we want to say leave our country, <laughs> lift all sanctions, then we can have a kind of recovered relations. I mean, we can, the relations between America and the country will get better, better, better. Mm -hmm. How much does state propaganda do you think the North Korean people actually believe? I have no idea. But the irony is, like, we believe a shit ton of state propaganda, too. Like, the average American citizen believes a, a, a ton of garbage. We just think we're above it. I think the difference in, in a place like DPRK is that, like, their citizens are aware that the government is basically feeding them nonsense. Is there, I assume it's, like, very limited information that you get anyway. I don't know. I, I, I can't, I really, I really can't speak on DPRK. I, I do think that there's like definitely a lot of misinformation about it, but overall, um, Do North Korean citizens really believe their government's propaganda? Let's talk about it. So whenever you see videos of North Koreans, it's probably something like this. Dude, they go hard. It's always like so intense. You know what I mean? Like television, telev TV news media is so intense. It's always like the same old lady who's like, oh, like very angry. Like, I don't know if it's because like it's a language that I don't understand. So it like comes across as very, um, like the sounds are very, how do I describe it? Like there's like a lot of like hung sounds, you know what I mean? And I don't know if that's like Korean or if that's just like, if it's like a more DPRK dialect or if she's like super passionate, you know what I mean? Because, like, I know chat says that when I speak Turkish, you, you think I come across as, like, very aggro, right? Even if I'm saying something that's not very aggro. They still got the transatlantic version, accent version in Korea. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Or this. 
crying out of love for the regime. They're so regime pilled. As fervent believers, but are they really? The answer is pretty much no. Um, this quote is from a book about North Korean defectors, and the author asked one of the defectors how many people she thought were still true believers. She answered zero. And from the North Korean defectors I've talked to personally, I have heard the same thing. This hasn't always been the case, though. Um, I made this video, which goes into it in more detail, but North Koreans really used to believe in the regime and North Korean exceptionalism. That all changed during the 1990s Great Famine in North Korea, where this is what North Korean citizens were being told, that North Korea was the greatest place on Earth, that they have the greatest leaders on Earth. But this is what they were seeing in real life. Children, people starving. The famine ended up killing between 10 to 15 percent of the total population. And I want to read you guys. It's sick that we, um, yeah. It's super sick that once we, you know, eviscerated their only access to the rest of the planet, we just, like, refused to help them. <laughs> and therefore, their entire structure collapsed in its entirety. Why did anybody help them? It's a good question. guys uh, an account from this book by a man named Jun Sang. He was a college student in North Korea, and it's about how he lost his faith during the famine. But this first starts at a train station. As he waited, his attention was drawn to a group of homeless orphan children who were performing to get money for food. One boy, about seven or eight years old, sang. And I'm not going to sing for you, but these are the lyrics. It's essentially praising the North Korean leaders for being so generous in giving the North Korean people so much, which is obviously in contrast to the situation at hand. He would later credit the boy with pushing him over the edge. He now knew for sure that he didn't believe. It was an enormous moment of self-revelation, like deciding one was an atheist. At first, he thought his life would be dramatically different with his newfound clarity. In fact, it was much the same as ever before. He went through the motions of being a loyal subject. On Saturday mornings, he showed up punctually at the ideological lectures at the university, the Workers' Party secretary droning on about the legacy of Kim Il-sung, the former leader of North Korea, sounded like- Do you think lifting sanctions would make the West less safe? What? Less safe from what? Banger North Korean K-pop? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> you feel unsafe, dude? <laughs> like what? They're gonna... Oh, they, they mean like nukes. They're gonna build nukes. Yeah, we should give them less reason to want to build nukes and aim it at America. <laughs> yeah, but they make nukes. Yeah, except we're the only country that has used nukes on another country. Like, openly. Up upon a civilian population. Fuck you mean? But they make nukes. It's 2024, man. Who doesn't have nukes? Everybody's got to have them, okay? <laughs> Either nobody has them or everybody does. You feel me? I want to be a nation state. Don't even get me started. Don't even get me started on this. <sighs> What's safe from this? Distance like a once a month, <laughs> and like here it would take like one hour to go to the other place in order to take a month at least to go because there's no electricity and sometimes people have to push the train they have to push the train yeah traveling in north Korea. Um this is my favorite video Weakest train pusher in the DPRK, dude. This is what happens when you're regime pill, dog. Okay. What do you think happens when you know the Cholima? Okay. 
the Cholima, you see it from the mountaintop, and you are reinstilled with the glory of Jusha, okay? In your heart of hearts, you know, as a worker, you will thrive. You will be able to pull the motherfucking train. Anyway, I heard that song, and now I want to push a train, okay? What the flying fuck did I tune into? I can never tell when shit's serious in here. Yeah, dude, you think David Goggins is hard, dude? Oh, so who's going to carry the bows? How about who's going to push the trains, brother? He was on autopilot. He often stuck a peek at the other members of the audience. During the lecture, they jiggled their feet and sat on their hands to stay warm, but their faces were still and expressionless, as blank as mannequins at a department store window. He suddenly realized he wore the same vacant expression on his face. In fact, they all probably felt the exact same way he did about the contents of the lecture. They know. They all know. He near Yami Park exposes Hassan. Hassan's editor Hassan's editorial work camp for three weeks. Uh, so uh, if you say Hassan's big mansion is bad, then you have to iron his Gucci shirt for six months. And uh, <laughs> if you ruin one of his shirts, you have to pick up Kaya poop for one year. <sighs> <laughs> to work in Hassan's editorial work camp for three weeks. That's so good. Not as good as the top of the hour ad break, but in North Korea, there's no ad breaks. Okay, if you see an ad, that's capitalism. You're going to work camp. You're going to my work camp for, for at least three months. Here's a three minute hour right now. Okay. Straight up. Yeah. I guess it is the last three minute hour break. And you know what? In honor of the, the glorious Democratic People's Republic. What the hell is this? I can't believe they're subjecting my dear leader, okay? Eminent secretary. The supreme leader to fucking the disgusting garbo of British food, okay? That's messed up. You don't get it. It's on apartments that are assigned by your career. Unlike America, where a guy who drives an Uber can live in Malibu if he just works hard enough. I mean, there is definitely a, a real human fear of like uh, not being able to to have class mobility and things like that, even though it's fake. You know what I mean? That's for sure. Anyway, um, but yeah, we're I'm I'm gonna leave you off with something to think about. Okay, I'm gonna leave you with something with a banger for everyone else that's also regime pilled, ladies and gentlemen. I'm signing off, and I will see you tomorrow. Yee all right, everybody. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.